What famous person did you regret meeting because they were an ass? Me and my sister saw Alec Baldwin, Tina Fey, and Sama Hayek on the street when we were eating lunch. They were just coming out of a car, about to go into some building next to us. We had no idea why they were together, but in retrospect it was definitely because they were filming 30 Rock together. My sister said oh my god is that Tina Fey? And Alec Baldwin turned around and went right in her face and said don't faking say that. Don't speak to us. Why would you say something like that? You can't speak to us. Not now. But it didn't really end there. He yelled again at us outside his building, saying don't look over here. Turn around and eat your food. Fuck off. He sounded genuinely furious at us. Almost like he wanted us to yell back and start something with him. Honestly my sister was on the verge of tears, it was horribly embarrassing. Everybody knows, now, that Alec Baldwin has a history of screaming at people. But at the time we had no idea. Don't get me wrong, my sister shouldn't have yelled at Tina Fey like that, but the way Alec snapped was straight up scary, like he was about to physically hurt her. Sama Hayek and some other lady who I didn't recognize came over and apologized to us. She asked if we wanted her to go and get Tina and get her autograph, because apparently Tina felt bad too, but we said no. She then talked to us about the food we were eating, which was Mexican food, and we ended up having a brief conversation about New York's lack of quality Mexican food. She was incredibly charismatic and sweet. Met Kevin Costner and Clint Eastwood when they were filming near Austin. I was waiting tables. Costner was a jerk. Eastwood was amazing. And a caricature of himself. He's huge. Huge hands. The lines in his face are deeper than you think they are. But he was so polite and gentlemanly and gracious. Edit. Yes on a perfect world. It was actually a golf club where I was head waiter. Them being there caused quite a ruckus. I went so far as to stash them in a private dining room so they could eat in peace. Clint was very apologetic about the whole thing, profusely thanking me, etc. Kevin never even looked me in the eye. Just said, I'll have the whatever it was he asked for and that was it. Edit 2, copied from my reply to another reply. That's partly it. But he did do some stuff that waiters hate. Like shaking his glass for a refill. With attitude. Stuff like that. Especially in a situation where I gave them their own space and no competition for my service. I said this in another comment. Everyone is allowed cheaty days. But the question posed was who did I regret meeting because they were an ass. So this was my answer. Edit 3. My first awards. Thank you. I'm gonna copy paste one of my previous comments because it sort of fits. I once made a drink for Britney Spears at Starbucks, 6 or 7 years ago, and the experience left us all thinking she was an entitled diva, but with the info that's come out in the last couple years, I realize we had it all wrong. I was on bar that day and I remember glancing into the lobby and thinking, huh, that chick looks like Britney Spears, only older and skinnier. She was gorgeous, but looked drawn and thin. I thought maybe hung of her, or partied way too hard, wearing this denim miniskirt, platform heels, a fringe halter top, and smeared dark eyeliner. I reached for my next cup, and in Sharpie it said Brit Dave, and I was like, mm. So anyway I make the drink. Brittany is standing with her arms crossed tightly over her chest, looking at the floor, very standoffish. I call out the drink for Dave. She stares at it, reaches for it, then draws her hand back to her arms crossed position. Some dude picks it up and hands it to her and they leave. I catch my coworker on register and say was that. And she automatically begins recounting her experience, which was that when she said hi. What can I get for you? The bodyguard said Brit, what are you having? Though she was right in front of my coworker, she gave her order to her bodyguards. Apparently there were two, and although my coworker could hear it perfectly, the bodyguard repeated it. When coworker went to write her name on the cup, which was standard and enforced at all times at my store, bodyguard held up his hand and said, "Excuse me, do not write her name on the cup. It's Dave. My name's Dave." So that explains the crossed out name. My coworker was irritated because it was like she was invisible, had addressed Brittany directly because she was at the counter, had clearly heard the order 
had written down the exact name that you'd addressed her by, but it was like she felt she wasn't good enough to have direct contact with her, so she had to have some sort of middleman when they were two feet apart. Now that I've heard about how little advocacy Britney has over her entire life, I'm completely second guessing my initial reaction to the experience. It seems entirely plausible now that she wasn't permitted to interact with anybody during that outing. Extremely sad. Justin Timberlake. This was when I was working a drive through at a Burger King, around 2002, 2003 or so. He came up at the drive through with someone else driving, but he was sticking his head out like hey 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 at us. I didn't really recognize him, but he asked if we knew who he was, and I said no, but my coworker said yes. Then he looked at me, like you don't know, and was just really confused. My coworker said it was Justin Timberlake, and he said yeah, hello, come on man. He then sort of just had small talk, he asked us how work was, how our day was. But here's the thing, the entire time, he is leaning all the way over on the driver, who is clearly horribly uncomfortable and a bit crushed by him leaning over on him. He asked me if I was from the Middle East, and I said no, and he clearly didn't listen, and then said yeah that sucks, sorry for the whole Afghanistan thing. He then asked us if we wanted his autograph, and we said sure, and he wrote it down and gave it to us. He then said bye and left. It was all in all a really funny experience and I try not to let it influence my view of him because he was clearly on something, but he just came off a bit like a big goofy attention loving us the entire time. I'd rather go positive so this is the opposite type of story. My neighbor was a prominent music promoter. My mother always warned us to not bother him as he wasn't overly kid friendly, but his wife was very nice, and on rare occasions we would get some backstage passes to a really cool concert. I was 17, and scored one of those backstage passes to an all-day stadium, concert that included Genesis, Blondie, Elvis Costello, Robert Hazard and Flock of Seagulls, remember them, Genesis slash Elvis Costello slash Blondie slash Robert Hazard slash Flock of Seagulls. Prior to going I was warned to not get in the way so I didn't. It was held in a giant open air old football stadium that could hold close to 100k people. They had marked off the back one eighth of the bleachers as part of the backstage, so I just sat up in those empty bleachers by myself and watched all the bands play from behind. It was tons of fun and I made sure to stay out of anyone's way. While Elvis Costello was playing this short balding British guy notices me and comes over to say back quote hi. He introduces himself as Phil and started asking why I was sitting up in the stands by myself. So I explained my guest status and that I didn't want to be in anyone's way. He then has me come with him down to where all the food is and insists I eat as much as I want. When I protested cause I didn't want to get in trouble with my neighbor he told me it was alright. I could be his guest. Well I was starving and thirsty so I loaded up a plate, grabbed a bunch of soda sat and talked with him for a bit and then retreated back to my sanctuary so I wouldn't bother him anymore. 10 minutes later the guy comes back and he's with his buddy. They sit down, pull out some cold beer and are just chilling out watching the show and making polite conversation with a shy 17 year old. 5 minutes later another guy comes up sits with us pulls out beer and serves all of us then he also just starts kicking back with the most hilarious sense of humor. All three were unbelievable polite, considerate, and funny. They treated me like they had been my buddies for years and we were just hanging out together. It was a great time. The trio was Phil Collins, Chester Thompson and Tony Banks from Genesis. I know this won't come as a surprise, but Steven Seckel used to frequent a restaurant I worked at. Dude was a colossal piece of sheet. He just treated his very wonderful family like sheet, and it was obvious he was cheating on his wonderful wife with the Asian nanny. This faking moron would come into a 10 table restaurant, all 6 feet 5 inches and 300 pounds of him, wearing a gold kimono in the south, and would wonder why people were looking at him. So he made us take the entry partition down and put it around his table. He was an absolute trash human being. Also met Peyton Manning one time right after the Super Bowl he lost to the Saints, who dat. This was at a ultra high end golf course and we were not allowed to act like we recognized celebrities which was more awkward than anything. 
Anyways he walked up and ordered a beer and introduced himself, but I was already turning to get the beer as he stuck his hand out to shake my hand and tell me who he was, as if I didn't know Peyton Manning was in the grounds when I saw his forehead pull into the parking lot. So I'm say I blow off Peyton Manning for a handshake. How many of you losers can say that? Great fucking guy though. A couple of nice celebrities to counter these stories. I used to work in a theater where Matthew Broderick was doing a play. He dried his little blue Vespa to work each day and I often ended up in the elevator with him. We chatted frequently. Really nice guy. Seemed very down to earth. Worked at another theater where Kevin Bacon was doing a play. I didn't personally have a ton of interaction with him, but all of my colleagues who did have nothing but great things to say. On several occasions, he brought us all apples from his farm. Literally ran into Jude Law in London a number of years ago, or rather, he accidentally ran into me. He stopped and helped me pick up all my stuff, apologizing, and she chatted for a minute before going our separate ways. Lordy that man's handsome in person. Met Ralph Fiennes at a London stage door back when I was a drama student. I was waiting to see my theatre teacher after a show, and he'd also gone to see her, as they were going to do a show together. When they came out, I waved and said hello to my teacher. She then introduced me to Ralph Fiennes as one of her students, and said and she's quite good. Ralph smiled kindly at me, and said perhaps I'll be waiting outside the stage door for you one day then. And I just about died on the spot. Kevin Spassy. Everyone knows him as an abusive as whole now, but this was over 10 years ago, when he was in Superman Returns, the reboot with Kate Bosworth as Lois and Brandon Routh as Superman. I was working as a sound engineer as a post-production studio, and we were hired as the facility for the stars to record some post-film and dialogue. Like many places, we had a little setup for making coffees and lads and stuff. Spassy comes out on a break and starts raising a stink about how we didn't have a particular brand of vanilla syrup for the lats, and basically said he would walk out if we didn't go get some. Well, the poor receptionist was sent all the way across town to some boutique store to go get this syrup. This is LA so this means 2 plus hours in bumper to bumper traffic round trip. As soon as she makes it back, she makes the coffee for Spassy and brings it to him. We all see this because work has been at a stoppage while she gets this damn syrup. He takes one sip of the coffee and throws the cup in the trash, looks at the girl, and says I just wanted to see if I could make you do it. And on top of that he went home for the day. What? An as whole. Steve Young. Working security at a hotel and helped him get away from some fans that mobbed him. Escorted him to his room, and he spent the entire time staring at his feet. Never said a word to me the entire time. James Hetfield and Lars Ulrich. Complete assholes who mocked everyone, and treated the people they came into contact with like sheet. Debbie Gibson, another overly entitled celeb from the 80s. The entire band Rio Speedwagon had to tell them to quiet down at 2 o'clock in the morning, in a hotel, to which they basically told me to fuck off. Comedian Gallagher. He was such an oddball, refused to talk to anyone, requested a college physicist to come and have supper with him so they could talk shop, and we caught him wandering around the parking lot brushing his teeth without his shirt it was weird. On the flip side some of the best, Kirk Hammett what a genuinely nice guy he was. Jerry Rice an absolute gem of an NFL player who was nice to everybody he met at our hotel. Ralph Macchio, shy but absolutely the nicest guy ever. Alan Thicke. Generally wanted to hear what everybody had to say, and just loved talking to strangers. John Madden, Howie Long, and James Brown. In town for the Packers Super Bowl win in the 90s, and we're all down to earth guys. Oddly. Ted Nugent. I expected him to be a complete ass, but he was genuinely a nice guy. Bobcat Goldthwaite, very down to earth low key, and would carry on a conversation with anyone. And by far my favorite. The entire band definition leopard. Sat in the bar with them when they were here for a tour and they were hands down the friendliest group of rock stars I've ever met. Carrying on conversations and interested in opinions about their new album. Used to be a pro musician. My top three as holes I actually work with in some capacity. First is Sebastian Batch, singer from Skid Row slash guy on every rock theme TV show for some goddamn reason. 
Easily the biggest as whole rock music may have ever produced. I've never talked to a single person who's worked with him and had a single nice thing to say, from venue management to text to his own band members. No matter how many accommodations are made for him, he will find something not to his liking, and it will become the focal point of his entire day. One venue handler I talked to said Batch tried to punch him while he was on the road driving Batch from his hotel to the venue because he couldn't get the temperature in the van right. I've done three shows with Batch over the years and I regretted it every time. Fun fact, if you watch him sing live in recent years, whenever he hits one of his high notes, you'll see him waving his hand in this weird way. He's signaling his sound guy to kick in a heavy delay effect on his mic because he can't actually hold those notes anymore. Next is George Lynch, lead guitar in Dokken. We did a medium-sized club opening for his band Lynch Mob. It was Lynch on guitar, original singer Roni Logan, who was cool as hell, Jimmy Dander from the Bullet Boys on drums, and C. McNabb on bass, who was also an actor in Sons of Anarchy, and probably the most famous guy on that stage at that time. He was an absolute joy to work with too. George, on the other hand, who boy. Their sound check was hilarious. They rolled in, their crew set their stuff up, they asked if the PA was live, yep, they cranked everything to 11, and went into river of love so loud it was shaking ceiling material loose. The sound guy went sprinting for the board to turn everything down. George was so goddamn rude. He had this handler he only referred to as tender, and when someone spoke to him, he'd yell tender. The guy would come over, Lynch would whisper to him, and this guy would answer the question, or whatever. What really pissed me off was after the show. Obviously, Dokken and Lynch mob aren't the stars they were in the 80s and early 90s. Only maybe 10 people hung out after the show, to try and get pictures slash autographs. One of these folks happened to be a paralyzed guy in a wheelchair who had been a huge Dokken fan his whole life and just wanted to meet George for a minute. Even the venue staff and other band members were begging George to leave the dressing room and meet the guy. Nope, wouldn't do it. The rest of the band ended up coming out, giving him a bunch of free signed merch, took photos and stuff, but no George. Then, Scene came out and told their merch chick to cut all the prices in half so they could get rid of stuff. They were basically giving away like shirts and guitar picks and stuff. Oh buddy, George heard about that, then he came out. He screamed at this poor merch girl, until she was in tears, that she was not to cut any prices and fuck anybody who said to do so. Most I've met, were cool and or normal. Here is an eclectic list, based on my years working in production in New York, and a few other non-production encounters, who Jackman, very polite and professional, as advertised, nice dude. Disgustingly handsome in person. As soon as possible Rocky, seemed nice enough, rolled with a deep crew, and smoked a lot of weed. Bill Kerr nice guy, down to earth. Not the scowling monster he presented on the sideline. Lewis Black, very friendly, not nearly as loud as you might imagine. Jake Dylan Hill, I almost ran into him, and his dog rounding a corner in Soho. He was very nice about it, very normal human interaction. Bill Clinton, I was like 8 years old, and he was in office. He was really friendly, and he complimented my sweater. Every time I reenact it, I use that little half thumbs up gesture, to emphasize the sweater compliment, though I couldn't swear that that part actually happened. Nicholas Winding Refn, not in as exactly, but stand a fish. He had my friend expense the production like $10,000 worth of antique books for a search into his next film. Janus Kamensky, slightly insane and hilariously eccentric. He called me Ginger, not my name, and he also stole my lunch, as well as bites of lunch from like six other trays. John Mayer, seemed nice enough, but it was an interview setting, so celebs tend to be on good behavior. Was cool as hell to see him sound check with the Grateful Dead though. Grateful Dead, a very chilled out group of elderly gentlemen. I mean, what else could they be, right? Joe Paterno, I know, I know, reputation severely tarnished. But I grew up worshipping the man, and he was absolutely lovely. Pete Davidson, seemed very depressed during the shoot I worked on in Vape Nonstop. I think he married Ariana Grande like a month later. Adriana Lima, the most attractive human being I've ever seen in person. She seemed nice, but I'm not sure I heard a word she said. I was distracted. 
by the most attractive human being I've ever seen in person. Robert Pattinson, very polite and professional, laid back and soft spoken. Barbara Koppel, she was kind of gruff and short, but very nice. Went out of her way to save me a hassle, which was much appreciated. Kari Fukuniga seemed extremely focused on the work and very little else. That's not a negative or anything, I just think that is his process, so he doesn't come across as warm and fussy. The people that work for him regularly seem to really like him though. Janine Garofalo, courteous, intelligent, and interesting. She's a talker, but was always compelling and well-spoken. Mark Strong nice guy, extremely striking voice and presence. He asked me to watch his back for a few minutes, and I felt like I had been given a secret mission by the king. Bill Nye, as whole. I watch him snub an entire group of little kids who made a special trip to get his autograph. Anyway, I guess that's about it. I'm sure there are others I'm forgetting. Most of these encounters were courteous and normal. Most of them also took place in professional settings as opposed to sidewalk run-ins. But generally positive experiences. Just to add some positivity to this thread, even though it'll get buried. My mom once met Robin Williams and said he was an absolute joy. She even got the pleasure of making him a cake. Edit, in case anyone is wondering why my mom got to make a cake for him is because back when the movie Patch Adams was being filmed, some of the scenes were being filmed in a house. This house just so happened to be on the street and I think either next door or across the street from where my parents and sisters lived, this was before I was born. So they got to meet him and a bunch of the other cast and crew. My mom says Robin was a great guy, gave my sisters tons of autographs and played with them and let them see the sets and all. I think my sisters were 11, 12 ish. My mom at the time made cakes, she doesn't really anymore, but having seen my mother's cakes they were always incredible. Like my mom was the go-to mom for all our friends growing up for cakes, because she'd make themed cakes and ice them and everything. She was super good at it. So, somehow or another she ended up making a cake for the cast and film crew. And there is a framed picture hanging in my house of my sisters with Robin Williams who looks to be having the time of his life. I just wished I got to meet him to lol. Edit 2.0, here's the framed picture of my sisters and him in our house. Their faces have been scribbled on for privacy purposes. I used to meet quite a few famous people as a bartender. Let's see. Mike Mills from Rem was quirky but nice. He was with a few people and they were headed to place for local music. I asked if anyone ever told him he looked like Mike Mills, and he said yeah. I waited for him to continue, but he just sat there looking at me, until I caved and said so, are you him? And he said something, like he is me, I'm he, we are one and the same. I ended up introducing him to yellow chartreuse. He'd only had the green, and we were one of the few places that carried the yellow. Amy Adams was sweet. She came in on a busy afternoon and wanted a beer to go, and I was like oh, it's so much better in a chilled pint glass and I poured one for her. I think I'd convinced her and her friend to stay for a bit and nobody seemed to realize who she was. One of our regulars started going off, rather loudly, about how her nose looked like a ski slope. I was mortified, but she'd already left. Jason Segel was super flirty, but really drunk, when he came in. He sat down and ordered a guinness with a shot of patron on the side. While I was pouring the shot he not to casually eyed my left hand and said you're engaged, huh? I responded that I was. I told him I had his drinks when he went to pay me, and he told me I was sweet. You know that part in forgetting Sarah Marshall when he's at the hotel bar and tells Mila Kunis she's very sweet when she said she liked the music on his TV show. He sounded exactly like that. He introduced himself and shook my hand, and I told him I was a fan and already knew who he was. We chatted for a short bit, and he left to meet someone. Bobby Brown, believe it or not, was hammered when he came in at like 9am, but was still super nice. He had two or three other people with him, and they'd obviously been out all night. They stayed about an hour, and tipped super well. Dennis Rodman, not surprisingly, was a total ass, he was drunk, loud, faking obnoxious and going on about shots of Georgia and all the hot chicks he faked. Cuba Gooding Jr. came in one evening on one of my off days, so I heard about it after the fact. 
he was apparently sheet faced and started some kind of fight in the bar. My coworker went around the bar to either stop it or stop him from leaving without paying and he hit her, if I remember right. It was in the news at the time. John Cusack was the most disappointing though, I used to be such a fan, but a friend of mine managed at a hotel he was staying at while shooting on location and told me he was just the worst. He berated a server one night because the restaurant didn't carry the steak sauce he preferred. It was some specialty brand and they sent an employee to go see if they could find some at a store or another restaurant but nobody carried it. He also tipped like sheet, I'm told. That's all I can remember right now, sorry. Edited to elaborate. When Smashing Pumpkins toured for Jish, their first album, I was able to get backstage at their 9.30 club performance. I was standing around like a fish out of water, but was so pumped to be in the room with these four people whose music I was currently worshipping. I loved that album. There were other groupies there too. So, while everyone was chatting and milling about, I made eye contact with Billy Corgan the lead singer slash guitarist slash songwriter and immediately asked him a question that I was dying to know the answer to. I wanted to know the lyrics to a bit of one of the songs in the album. It was like a one word repeat in the chorus of one of the songs and for the life of me, I couldn't figure out what it was. So, I leaned in and asked him what that one word is. He replied, as the artist I'm not at liberty to tell people what they can't figure out. Needless to say, I felt embarrassed and confused. However, I moved to the other side of the green room and found myself next to Jay Maiha, the rhythm guitarist. For some reason he was busying himself with restringing his guitar. This was after the show. His hands were shaking like he was the most nervous guy in the world at that time. We had this conversation. James, Siren me, I sorry. James, the lyric you wanted to know is siren. Me, oh, you heard. James just shook his head like I need to keep things on the down low and continued with his restringing. Never even looked up at me. I've also had the pleasure of meeting Primus in the same green room. This was for their Sailing the Seas of Cheese album. Again, I'm in the green room. The band is standing around with probably the usual amount of group is getting on their nerves. Amazingly enough, I had a joint on me and my friend and I smoked it with Larry Lerlan, not sure of that name spelling, the guitarist. Anyway, it's not like the smoking of the joint made us besties and naturally I got really high and was worthless for conversation, on top of my already feeling awkward being in a room of strangers, the most famous of which couldn't give two sheets about me. So, soon after the joint smoking I found myself standing next to Le Claypool. He was busy chatting up a goddess of a woman. For some reason, he turned from her and looked right at me. Upon making eye contact I thought, damn it boy, say something. Say something yes looking at you. So, I said to Le Claypool, who was still looking at me, like I had to heads. So, what kind of music do you listen to? Lair wrinkled his bro, shrugged his shoulders and said, I don't know, Grateful Dead. Then immediately turned back to the goddess. For the record, I don't think Le Claypool was an ass. I'm not sure I would have behaved any differently in his situation. I just wanted to tell that story. When I was a young teen, around 14 to 15 years old, my dad scored access to a National Hockey League game day skate of both teams that were going to face off that night in a playoff game. Basically, one team at a time, players have access to ice time to loosen up, work on some plays, etc. This was a big deal for me. There was a player on the visiting team that I was a big fan of. I was sure to pack a sharpie and one of his hockey cards just in case I got the opportunity to meet him. The game day skate begins with players taking to the ice, warming up, and genuinely looking quite relaxed. I was leaned over where the players enter the rink, a player I was there to see came off the ice and stood just below me while he took a bit of a break. I figured he came by on purpose because he could have gone to the players bench instead, but he chose to come stand right underneath where I was standing. I figured he saw me wearing his team's jersey and that he was being kind. I was shy back then, but this was an incredible opportunity I didn't want to miss. In my cracking teen voice, I nervously asked excuse me, first name, last name, can I please get your autograph? He looked up at me as annoyed af said, 
that's Mr. Last Name to you, before getting back on the ice. I spent the rest of the skate sitting in a seat, shaking and feeling terrible for asking him. My dad said something like not all players understand the worth of their fans. I stopped cheering for that player that day. Positive post. I met Robin Williams in New York City on my 18th birthday in 2011. I'm from the UK, and for my 18th birthday my parents took me to New York City. I knew that celebs often do Broadway shows, and so when I saw Robin was doing one I had to take the opportunity to meet him. When his show was finished we waited by the stage door with a bunch of other fans and I remember when the door eventually opened, and he was standing there and immediately out of my mouth flew the word Robin. And he looked directly at me, and spoke softly, and said that he'd start at one end of the barricade and work his way up, and I giddily nodded. When he got to me he was lovely, he signed my photo, and also personalized to my name when I asked, and then I think he was maybe expecting me to have more stuff for him to sign as he asked if that was it, and I then asked if I could get a selfie with him, and I have the great photo frame to this day. He was then even lovelier as he took another photo with me, but this time my mum was taking it on her digital camera, and then he also took the time to take photos with each of my parents, and also signed the playbill my dad had in his hands. Then when my dad saw that Robin had signed on a part where you couldn't see his signature very well he asked him to sign it again. I can't believe he did still ha ha, and Robin very kindly obliged again. Seemed like a good man that did a heck of a lot of good in this world. R.I.P. Robin. In the late 2000s I worked at an outdoor stadium in a decent sized midwestern city. Occasionally we'd host concerts since it filled in the non-game days and we had the largest outdoor capacity for a concert venue. I worked for the food service provider. I wore a lot of different hats since getting full time hours in sports food service is difficult unless you're a manager or can do year round events which due to weather we couldn't. Most of the time I bartended, sometimes I worked in concessions or catering. On non-event days I'd do whatever was asked of me just to get some hours. Clean a cooler, help set up a private event, assist the unit controller with billing, I did a bit of everything. This matters because the building started booking a lot of concerts one summer, and as the official food service provider with an ironclad contract, we were bound to provide all the craft services at the time. And we started getting riders, which was new to us. All of the managers had their hands full taking care of their own departments, so the GM put me in charge of making sure we had all the rider requests taken care of. At first all goes well, most of the asks were pretty easy to get hold of. A few special requests, but as long as the promoter gets us the rider early enough, we can get the product in. That all changed when the building booked an all-day country music festival. Now we are getting 10 to 15 riders for big name acts with incredibly specific demands. The riders show up, and it's only 3 days until the show. The GM gives me his company credit card, and I scour the city for everything on the lists. I made 3 drop offs at the stadium, to unload food and beverages, because my car was full. At the end of the day I had about 75% of the list done. The next day I start calling every grocery store, specialty shop co-op in the city for the 25% of requested food that is not easily found. Then I make another shopping trip. End of day 2, I have 95% of the list accounted for, but the last 5% is stuff I've never heard of. Think something like, cousin Ida's organic, vegan, non-toxic soy based honey. We brainstorm and ask everyone if they've ever heard of the missing stuff. We are able to get a few of the tour managers on the phone and ask if we can substitute the impossible to find items for something else. We get a few okays. Fast forward to the day of the festival. I've tracked down everything except this very specific brand of tea which one artist has to have before they go on stage. Apparently it strengthens their vocal cords or some sheet. I can't find it anywhere. I've been to 30 plus stores in a 60 mile radius. The tour manager says it has to be this tea, no substitutes 2 hours before showtime, I admit defeat, because I have to go to the bar I'm running that night. I go backstage, and find the tour manager, to apologize and show him all the other teas I have, and see if any of them will be acceptable. He looks at all of them, frowning. He then wheels the little tea card service I had brought down into the dressing room as I wait outside. 
the door didn't fully close all the way, so I can hear him explaining the situation, and how I tried to find the tea and couldn't, but we did have all these other teas, and would any of them be acceptable? And that's when I heard Carrie Underwood call me, a useless piece of shit. Kevin Hart's management, he was super nice, when he talked to my mom and I, she runs a successful catering business and all the acts that come through our city she cooked for, loved her chicken, he loves to drink vodka and Red Bull in 2016, his people charge the venue for the staff to look at him, but I don't think that was him, the impractical jokers are the nicest dudes I have ever met, so fun love cracking jokes, and played cards with me, when I was 17. Mur is so nice and generous, and kept talking to my mom and even wanted to know how she cooked her eggs benedict, and was in the kitchen with her. Joe and Q just bounce of each other, and try to get Sal to gag. Mac Miller in 2012, so he wasn't as polished of an artist, and was making his frat rap at the time. Still super nice, but had some shitty friends with him. Lot of weed, was Califer came, and he was so high he couldn't even ask for more mac and cheese, when he was trying to talk to me, we laughed so hard I almost started crying it was surreal. Paul Rudd runs a candy shop near me with JDM, super nice dudes. Few of my friends work for them, and they are always so nice, family friends get invited to house parties. Liam Neeson's son played hockey with my older brother kept to himself after his wife died, but was always nice to everyone. Her sister came to watch a few games too. Their nanny was really close with my mom. Mr. Neeson watched me play Nintendogs and bought everyone coffee a few times. Just a really nice man. Other nice people, Trace Adkins, The Temptations, Jim Gaffigan, Frankie Valli, every Nler I've met, almost, to chains, Rob De Niro, Daryl Hall, at least to me, Jeffrey Dean Morgan. Louis C.K. was a condescending prick, talked down to everyone, and only ever glared at people, and murmured from distance. Mark Messier was a huge as hole, we was with Jeremy Roenick who was having a chat with my dad, and he kept trying to get Jeremy to leave, because Messier wanted to go to a different bar, because there were too many regular people. I already told a story on here, but I literally just remember Dustin Diamond, saved by the bell, attempted to steal my guitar once. He lived in my town, Fort Myers slash CAPE Coral FL, and had seen my band playing a show at a local bar. He came up to us afterwards and introduced himself, he seemed very nice, and said he'd like to hang out with us sometime, so we exchanged numbers. A couple days later. He hits us up asking if we wanna come to his apartment and hang for a little bit. My drummer and I said yeah, and I brought my bass. He told me that he played and was in a couple bands. All was going well. We smoked and listened to 12 Foot Ninja for about 3 hours. They were his favorite band. Not my thing but very interesting. He played my bass for a couple minutes and after a while asked if he could borrow it. I said no, it was literally my dream guitar I wouldn't let anybody borrow it. The hangout went on for another hour or two, when he then mentioned that he was going to New York the next day and staying for a couple of weeks. It didn't dawn on me until afterwards that he would taken my bass to New York with him, and I may never have seen it again. R.I.P. Dustin Diamond you absolute legend. I wouldn't say he was an SS, but I really regret meeting him, because it really changed my perception of him. My buddy and I went to a signing, and show for Bruce Campbell, when he released one of his books. My buddy brought an Evil Dead poster for him to sign. The event staff were like no, only books and Bruce was like no, I'll sign it, but while he did, he just beached the whole time about how people don't follow rules at these things. He just seemed annoyed at everything. A guy a few people ahead of us in line, made a chin joke, Bruce famously makes fun of his own chin, titled one of his books, If Chins Could Kill, and he rolled his eyes, and said sarcastically couldn't think of a good chin joke. I guess he could have been having a bad day, but why do a book signing, and meet and greet, when you're just going to be annoyed by everyone. I still love his stuff, but just never thought of him the same way after that. Wish I'd never met him. Edit, a lot of people assuming I didn't understand that his shtick was being sarcastic and a bit arrogant, I was there to get a book signed by him, have read his books, and seen his movies, plus endless interviews. I was prepared for sarcastic with a dash of arrogance. 
It is a funny persona he has that I too find funny. What I saw was just a guy who was pissing and moaning the whole time I was around him. I'd have paid extra to have sarcastic by the end of the visit. William Hung. Not a lot of people realize that around the time he went on American Idol to sing as intentionally bad as possible, he was also really big into the Pokemon trading card game. He used his fame to get a small gig writing articles for a fairly large website within the community talking about the meter and various decks. I learned a few things about him when he came by to watch me playing a game against one of my friends who had thrown together a new deck concept. First, Hung wouldn't stop asking my friend questions about the deck. Like, constantly. It was very distracting for us both. He was just forcing himself in the middle of our game and kept talking about things in my friend's hands where I could clearly hear because he wanted to know everything about this new deck idea. More on that later. Second, I learned that the act he put on in American Idol was entirely an act. He actually laughed about how he and this is a direct quote, got to be on national TV and all I had to do was pretend to be a retard for a couple minutes. And third, I would learn about two days later that he was a thief too. Because two days later I find on that website he wrote for that hung, had written an article about this new deck idea that had just come to him. Yup, it was my friend's deck. This was why he was so interested in it. He write a big article about how it was all his idea, and when he got called out on it later on he brushed it off with oh, I couldn't remember who did it anyway. So, fuck that guy. Ricky Gervais. I worked on a movie with him a few years ago. I work in film in the camera department and work very closely with the cast. And he wrote, directed, starred, and produced this movie. This was his baby. And for all his roles, he was barely there. When he was, he was an absolute prick to the crew, yelling and swearing at people on set. I will specify that he didn't verbally harass individual crew members, but instead demeaned us as a whole. Ricky hates seeing people eat and or chew, so gum was forbidden on set. As an aside, a typical short filming day is 12 hours, you're going on maybe 4 to 7 hours of sleep, and coffee is so important to the point where access to it is written into union contracts. Gum is very important when you have to communicate with anyone after all you've consumed in 5 hours is 4 coffees and some stale Costco pastries. Every 3 working hours we have it in our contract that we are to be fed a small meal. Ricky wouldn't let that food on set because of his neurosis, which meant that many people who are unable to leave set to eat would be unable to eat anything for up to 8 hours a day, depending on when or if we broke for lunch. He barely directed this movie. He'd leave early or come in late almost every single day and most of the time one of the other crew members, first AD or assistant director or the director of photography would end up directing the scene. During the penultimate scene of the movie, we were shooting deep in a conservation park during a torrential downpour. Huge action sequence, tons of FX, and we built a whole bloody village there. Very expensive important day, where you would imagine the director would want slash be forced to be in attendance. You know, directing the bloody movie. Anyway, the crew started work around 4.30 to 5am, with an hour drive to the location itself from the nearest city center. It takes us 2-3 to three hours to physically get the gear to set, slogging gear cases and carts that weigh hundreds of pounds through mud up to your knees, so we are all pretty eager to get this day over with. It's finally time for our cast and director to start telling us where to point the cameras, and Ricky has not made his way to set. We wait, and wait, and an hour later we hear definitively that Ricky will not come to set until it stops raining. I'll also note here that the rain did not present a continuity issue, he just didn't want to get wet. So there we all are, a hundred exhausted, hungry, pissed off film technicians standing around in this fake village in the woods with very little shelter from the rain, waiting around for Ricky to leave his nice warm trailer. It clears up enough to the point where Ricky travels to set, and we manage to get everything filmed that he specifically was in the frame for, approximate two hours. The moment they called, cut on his last on camera scene he took off and left the rest of us to shoot for 13 more hours with no director. Honestly there are so many instances from this one 8 week shoot that were so similar to this, I could keep writing all night. 
in my 10 year career he may not have been the worst actor I've worked with, that honor will always go to Vin Diesel, but just the sheer frequency of awful behavior puts him up in my top 5. The whole experience was really heartbreaking, I was such a huge fan of his. I even turned down another more lucrative movie at the time, just to get a chance to work with him. Eat a since I've gotten a few DMs about it. Top 5 Worst Star: Vin Diesel, Ricky Gervais, Cass Anver, Richard Schiff, and toss up between Amanda Seyfried and Nina Dobrev. Sorry if anyone likes these people, they were, and probably still are, all truly terrible to work with. Elton John. I was always a huge fan, I mean, who isn't, but unfortunately my opinion of him soured after what I witnessed. He booked out a whole month in a studio at the recording studios I worked at, and so I saw a lot of stuff. He was just, sort of, immature or something. He had frequent outbursts, and was very dramatic about it. But it all crescendoed for me when one day he was mad and started raging, loudly, and then I heard sheet getting smashed and broken. I ran into the place where the sound was coming from, and as I opened the door I saw him in the act of clothus lining an entire countertop as he ran along the length of it with his arm outstretched, knocking all kinds of expensive items onto the tile floor, like glass etchings and other fragile pieces of art. I quickly backed right out of the doorway I came from, and waited until the chaos subsided, before going back in again to take damage inventory, so we knew what to build a record label for. The story I heard from others was that his boyfriend at the time wasn't going to meet him for their date that day. The rest of his band was cool at though. Especially Dave, the guitar player. Bernie Taupin seemed pretty chill too. He kept to himself and didn't really interact with anyone that much, but he was polite when he did. But my favorite of all the celebrities that ever came in there was Whitney Houston. She was so funny, and nice, and charming, and she was always doing playful things like doing cartwheels in the parking lot, or making jokes about herself, and just, she felt like a down-to-earth normal person. Obvious throwaway due to where I work, the thread is filled with random jacassery, so let me add some positive things, Leonardo DiCaprio is awesome, always treats the staff fair, and I've had him as a guest in numerous places, and he was always nothing but nice. He stopped me, and recognized me in a random hotel, after I saw him 5 plus times that month, and said you look familiar, I just told him his usual. He was puzzled. Then sent him a drink, while he was having lunch, we were the only two tables in the restaurant. Got a thumbs up. Lady Gaga has been nothing but great towards the staff, her security is very protective, and the guy resembles a shaved bear, imagine Sam Fisher, just bigger and more slavic. Very professional and nice. He tipped the staff, and she was very nice. Katy Perry is awesome. Nothing but nice things to say about her. Johnny Depp is awesome. Nothing but great things to say about him. Amber Heard knows her wine and all the awful awful unfair stories about her treatment of Depp aside, she was nothing but nice to me and my staff. The guy who plays Marshall in How I Met Your Mother is about the closest I ever got to being starstruck. He is tall, so when I opened the door, and he had to duck to get in, I was momentarily starstruck, and I exclaimed Marshall. In Lily's voice, he stopped for a second and then laughed. Miller Kunis is awesome and very down to earth. The two of them as a couple might be some of my favorite guests I ever took care of. Gal Gadot is the only time I've ever been completely at a loss for any words when she asked me something. Yes, I blanked and just started at her like an absolute donkey for what felt like an eternity. Yes, she noticed, she laughed and repeated her question. I came to and answered it. Zach Braff is one of the funniest and most down to earth people I had as a guest. Super charming and awesome. Now for the jacassery stuff. 11. JLO is an absolute diva. I hope I never get her again as a guest. The less said, the better 12. BJ. Novak. Ryan from The Office. Is insufferable. I'm 100% sure he did not act for one millisecond during his stint on The Office. And is just like that usually. Brian Cranston. A former Kawaka got cast in the Broadway production of Network, and said to let them know, when I was coming to see it, they'd bring me backstage. Being a fan of Breaking Bad and Broadway, I of course take them up on the offer. It was such a surreal experience leaving the theater, and walking to the stage door, and having my name on the list. 
Anyway, I get in and have to wait for my friend who is still getting out of costume and makeup. We finally meet up and chat about the show, and he asks if I'd like to meet Brian, which of course I would. I'd even brought a copy of his memoir to sign for another friend. Brian is the biggest star in the show, so it takes a bit of time as he has other visitors. When we see him, he's still with this group and giving them a tour. So I stand patiently waiting. Tony Goldwyn and Tashiana Maslany also are around. Brian notices me holding his book, and he stops his conversation and asks, would you like me to sign that? Excuses himself to come and talk to me. I rave about the show, and ask him about the final scene, which involves a bit of magic, and he explains how it was done. I thank him for the time, ask for a selfie to which he obliges, and he thanks me for coming to see the show. Mayor and Jalau. This happened to my English teacher in middle school, when I was still there. My teacher was a massive Mayor and Jalal fan, had all of her books, and loved using her works in class. She had an opportunity to help put together an event and to do the fundraising the pay for Mayor and a few other speakers to come speak and do their thing. She was by far the biggest expense in the whole event, and was an absolute diva, was late to get speaking time forcing hundreds of people to just wait on her, requested a bunch of crazy things, and was a complete beach to everyone. She even was enough of an entitled beach that she talked cheap to my teacher and talked down to her because she was just some middle school teacher that wasn't doing sheet with her life basically. I was not a very good English student, but I was actually one of her favorite students for some reason, and would talk to her before slash after class about stuff. She told me the story and I helped her get rid of everything Mayor and Jalau that she had in the classroom. Never meet your heroes. I was 13 on July 5, 1976, traveling with my mom across the country to California in a VW minibus. We were in Butt, Montana on a hot day, and saw a crowd on the side of the road. It was my childhood hero, Evil Neville, the man who was a childhood toy that I played with, pretending to jump over the fountain at Caesar's Palace. We stopped and I made my way to the crowd. Evil Neville was grumpy and acting agitated for some reason and didn't talk with fans he was silent and angry. Everyone wanted autographs, but no one had a pen, save for me. Evil Neville reached out without asking and grabbed my pen from my hand and quickly scrawled out some autographs with his twisted, broken hands and mumbled under his breath in disgust. He handed me back my pen without giving me an autograph and without a word or even eye contact. He walked away in a half. I was so upset I was stunned into silence, starting to cry. Behind me, Peter Graves tapped me on the shoulder. He said do you want an autograph? I nodded between choking back tears. He could see that I was upset and hurt. He had one of the people with him get a piece of paper and he signed a personal autograph for me and apologized for Neville. I had grown up watching Mission Impossible and I was a huge fan of his as well and it made the whole experience instantly better. He talked with me, alone, for a few minutes. It was such intense contrast. I learned later in life that Evil Neville was generally not well liked, but that Peter Graves was a well respected man that most everyone enjoyed. I'm proud to say that I still have his autograph and the memory of my childhood ending abruptly. Back in like 2014, Edward James Almas was staying in my hotel for a local con. He sat at the bar from the time the event was over until the bar closed down every night, trying to pick up women. The women that had seen Battles to Galactica were generally at least in their 30s or 40s, but he was only interested in young women. Like early 20s. He was drunk every night, and while not outright rude, was definitely making people very uncomfortable. He wore the same leather jacket that had Battles to Galactica printed on the back and would use it as a talking point to try and pick up women who had never heard of it. On the flip side, Willie Nelson is a faking treasure. He would park his RV in the parking lot and get rooms for all of his people, but he would stay in the RV with his family. He only went inside to take showers and eat breakfast and lunch most days. While he was inside, he'd stand at the front desk and tell jokes to anyone who would listen and just generally wanted to hear how people were feeling that day. Dude comes off as completely genuine and wholesome. He also likes to get up early in the morning and ride his bike around the parking lot before people really started their day. 
so I'd be sitting in my truck waiting to go to work, and he'd cruise by on his bike with a joint hanging out of his mouth. Wow thread I can actually contribute to a disappointing. Bear Gryles was racist to staff members of color and avoided touching Pock, but hugged white folks. My friend was a huge fan and was left super sad after showing him around her country. Meanwhile the white staff members didn't notice anything cause he treated them well, just avoided touching the Pock. Bizarre experience. Jessica Alba acquired a very specific air purifier from Walmart for her hotel room. Unfortunately there's no Walmart in Boston, so the staff bought five brands from other stores. When her assistant saw, she threatened to pull out and cancel her appearance, so the staff drove for hours to the closest Walmart during rush hour to get the air purifier she absolutely needed. Jason Derulo wanted the whole floor of a hotel for his entourage, but dude this is Boston, not Dubai or Hong Kong. A whole floor of a hotel is impossible to book at the last minute in a tiny one mile radius city like Boston. Amazing celebs, Kim Kardashian was surprisingly low maintenance. Also Natalie Portman was super shy on stage, looked embarrassed when they played a clip of her as a child actor, and was super friendly during the meet and greet. The MVP goes to David Blaine. Really chill guy who hung out with us plebs the entire time, the whole after party, and beyond. Outstanding guy who broke his hand doing a gig for us. Zach Braff. Our classmate's mom was a producer within the company that produced the show and got our class a pass to get on the set of the show, Scrubs, while they were filming. Let me just say, I was 17 years old and Scrubs was actually my favorite show at the time. I was ecstatic and I knew how blessed I was. Fast forward we arrive at the hospital, old and not in use for medical stuff anymore. We walk around the set and meet some cast members and then we got to watch an unaired episode in the cafeteria. After that they told us to come into the hallway and there they were. Donald Faison and Zach Braff, the two main characters, just down the hallway from us. They asked us to be quiet and we watched them film a scene. Dreams come true, I thought. Afterwards one of the producers asked us if we wanted to meet them, and we all giggled like little girls. We started walking down the hall. When we were within earshot of both stars we saw Zach Braff darting eyes at us. He said loudly and clearly, are those faking high school students? I'll get them the fuck away from me. And before we could reach him, he let out this disgusted snobby snort, and turned around and walked away. The class literally thought he was joking and we laughed, but he literally kept walking, and we never saw him the rest of the day. It was a huge disappointment and realization that the character doesn't match the actor, teenager me still didn't know. Donald Faison caught on to our disappointment. He tried to excuse Braff by saying things like, oh he's just joking he doesn't mean it guys, you guys are awesome. He started asking us our names, what schools we are from shook all of our hands, laughing and making jokes, taking group and individual photos. It wasn't long, but he made the time and would try to remember and call us by our names when he spoke to us. He was smiling and laughing the whole time, the whole thing was so wholesome and such a great experience. I still have the picture I took with him, his big arm around my shoulder. He became one of my favorite actors that day. What a great guy. After a few moments he said he had to go work on some other things and enjoyed his time meeting us and asked if we had any last questions before he left. You should have seen him when he asked if we had any last questions. It was like he was supposed to be in a hurry, but he leaned towards us as if to imply that he would stop and answer any questions and give us all his attention in the world. I really hope that Donald Faison knows how great if a guy he is. I worked on the film back quote gladiator, have posted about it before, but was 12 days principal filming in the UK in 1999. Was excited to work with the actors Russell Crowe, Grey Day Knob. Wouldn't speak to anyone, even if they made an effort, and looked at people with disgust, would leave between scenes to go, and sit in his trailer. Also didn't seem to get on well with any of the other back quota list. For him it was just a job. Joaquin Phoenix, weird af. Maybe on drugs? Maybe staying in character? Didn't seem warm and again didn't want to interact with anyone. He seemed to upset some of the support staff. Richard Harris, R.I.P., amazing. Warm, friendly, would give everyone the time of day. 
absolute professional and could have taught the others a lot about being a good actor. It was an absolute privilege to have worked with him. Ridley Scott, great guy. Of course he had heard thousands of times about how much people had enjoyed his films, but when we started talking about actually filming, he really opened up. Had some great conversations about the cameras, shots, cinematography etc. I met Bill Nye in the mid 90s. My experience was as a 7 year old kid and not typical, I've heard he's kind of a jerk I roll. I would love to hear folks stories of him not being nice. My parents had taken our whole family out to a fancy seafood spot on the water. I got in trouble with my stepmother for staring, but eventually my parents figured out it was him. This was at the height of Bill Nye the science guy hysteria, it was mine and my dad's jam to throw on BNTSG and laugh together and enjoy the raps at the end of the show. He must have noticed us staring because he motioned at us kids and we got up and came over. He asked for each of our names and then opened a briefcase he had with him. He pulled out a large black and white photo of him from a stack inside and signed it to us kids. It was by far the coolest celebrity sighting I have ever had. We totally interrupted his dinner date for a couple minutes, but he was super cool about it. TLDR, cited Bill Nye the science guy around 1994. He had a briefcase of his own black and white headshots. Got autograph 7 year old me was stoked. My father almost punched Tony Stewart the NASCAR driver. Dad does a lot of racing promotions and works with teams and he's gotten me some awesome autographs because of it. One race at Bristol dad sees Tony walking about the garage area and with his practice professionalism asks Tony if he has a spare minute for an autograph for me. Tony barely breaks his stride and says with his practiced as whole attitude, I ain't got the faking time. I'm faking busy. My father is someone whose career depends on how he interacts with people. He did not hesitate to answer, well fuck you too buddy. A few hours later dad is wandering the garage and from above he hears hey you. Stop. He looks around and sees Tony pointing at him from atop his hauler. He hustles and descends the ladder and makes a beeline for dad. Dad knows he's about to have a fight with Tony Stewart, but Tony says, you asked for an autograph, and I was pretty rude to you and I'm sorry. Was it for your son? Talk about your roller coaster of emotions. I still have it in a folder somewhere. Denzel Washington. The hurricane was filmed in Toronto. I was a grip on set. The director made sure we all knew not to make eye contact with Denzel, because he didn't like it. Being on film sets for a decade, I already knew not to do anything that might distract an actor during an actual scene, that's just common sense. What I didn't know was what a prima donna Denzel was. Usually, between takes, no one cares where you're looking. While we were shooting the scene where he meets his lawyer in prison and there were a lot of extras that day, one of the extras was a little girl, probably about 10 to 11 years old. We shot a few takes, and then the director took the dop aside to talk about the next shots. Suddenly, Denzel starts shouting, get her the fuck out of here. I don't need this beach staring at me. I look and saw he was talking about the little girl who, apparently, had the audacity to look at him between shots. They shoot her off set, and she and her mom were in tears. I lost all respect for Denzel that day. Up until that point I really liked him as an actor, and I especially liked that he got to play Reuben Cartner. After that day, all I can think of when I see him on the screen is what a prissy little beach he is. I've been to a fair few cons and concerts. Luckily had more awesome interactions than negative. John D. Lancey, Q from Star Trek, was a bit of a dick. Short, rude, and seemed miserable to be doing autographs. Robert Picardo, Street, Voyager, was a sweetie though, met them at the same time, and didn't understand you had to pay for autographs, I was like 14, first autograph signing. Picardo let me have an autograph for free, because I had gone to an event he hosted the night before. Brent Spinner, Data, was the most wonderful actor I've met. He remembered me throughout the con we were at, and kept joking around with me, during photos, autographs, and a panel. Patrick Stewart was standoffish. When you went in for a photo, a handler stopped you and informed you that you couldn't touch him or try to have a conversation with him, and if you did, you'd be immediately removed. 
Kinda rude, but considering how many people he'd see in a day, I kinda get it. He said hello, and I thanked him after. He said you're welcome and that was it. He kept his arms crossed the whole time, and in the photo he just looks very begrudging. I don't think he even looked at me. Again, I sort of get it. He seems lovely outside of cons but who knows. Leonard Nimoy was in the same situation, but a hundred times nicer. He looked at me, thanked me for coming, had a nice big smile. During the photo he put his arm around me. Very friendly and kind point long story short I had connections to people running the con, and he was going to visit a small town about an hour outside my city. I almost got to ride in a limo with him to the town, but his agent demanded dollar sign 5k slash person. The whole thing was originally being set up for my friend's dad, I don't think Mimo knew yet I might be joining, but he wrote him a letter apologizing and saying how he didn't have a choice in it due to his contract. Will Wheaton is a peach. I adore him. He was thrilled that I've read some of his books. I hate that the fandom generally dislikes him. I found him to be quite smart and talented. His books are good. I highly recommend M. Renor Burgenoise, Otto, ST, DS9. Never met him in person, but emailed back and forth. More than happy to engage with fans and recount stories. I really wish I could've met him. Meet Loaf is an as. Went to his last tour. Stood outside with three others for an autograph. After a half hour someone came out and said he wouldn't come see us, but he'd sign stuff. She took our stuff and we waited close to two hours for stuff to be sent back out. If I had known that, I wouldn't have bothered. Leonard Cohen was a literal saint, the most kind, polite gentleman you could want to meet. I was too shocked to say anything really, but I asked him if I could get a photo with him, of course, darling, wrap me in a tight side hug, he was very small, so I was surprised he had that much strength, then signed a book for me, with love, Leonard Cohen. I regret not saying more to him, but I think he understood. I've heard people say he treated every woman he met like a queen, and I believe it. The whole interaction was so incredibly friendly. Matt Smith, so faking. Tall. Very nice, but I only had a brief interaction with him. I suspect the character he plays as the doctor isn't crazy far off from what he's like I roll. He seems pretty goofy Karen Gillan, also very sweet. Again, not a long interaction. Oddly, also very tall. Quick disclaimer slash TLDR, from what I heard Brad Pitt is awesome, but his non-famous brother is in a shat. Not really a good answer, but I met Brad Pitt's brother once, and he was an entitled jerk, made me think it ran in the family, though I've heard from multiple people who have met Brad Pitt in person that's not how he's like. Never met Brad Pitt, but his brother is a piece of work. Doug Pitt, if you ever read this, you are a great A as whole, and I'd let you burn, if the only option was to piss on you to put out the fire, and you absolutely made it no secret, that you were acting, so douche chi because your brother was who he was. Fuck you. His accomplishments aren't something you can use to act like the worst sort of Karen. Also, by the way, I got told off by overseers of the event I met you at, because I didn't exempt you from signing the liability waiver, same as everyone else, and you treated me like sheet, because I expected you to sign a form, same as everyone else. And then you treated me like extra sheet, when I tried to hand you a refund from the $100 bill you literally threw in my face. Um fear that your presence at that yearly event hardly did any better than years, where there wasn't a celebrity present. You acted like your sheet didn't stink, dropped your brother's name left and right and treated everyone who was remotely interested, including children, like they were trash for bothering you. You clearly didn't want to be there, so why the fuck were you there? Met Chris Pratt near my old college on a weekend morning. I was there for an event, and one of our friends said they saw him near the parking lot. About 12 of us run over there to see him, and he's talking with a friend. One girl kinda shyly walks over to ask if we can take pics. He quickly turns to her with his finger, held up and says wait, I'm having a very serious conversation. She walks back to us, and we all waited there kinda awkwardly for about 5 minutes. When he finished talking to his friend, he walked up to us slowly, smiled, and said sorry guys let's take some pics. He was super nice and even let every one of the girls in our group to take a selfie with him. At the end, when we were about to leave he asked why some of us were in uniforms and some weren't. 
I explained its different campus organizations and he kinda laughed saying he liked the uniforms more. My brother, without missing a beat, says then where's your uniform star lord? We all die laughing, and Chris was super cool about it, and gave my brother props. Couldn't be a nicer guy. Worst, Justin Bieber just a rude dickhead who used to snap at my fellow employees, and would dodge slash ignore fans. I gave him benefit of the doubt, but I saw him be super rude at my job twice, and then I was lucky enough to be invited to sit VIP for Adam Sandler's certified fresh live taping, and Justin Bieber screamed out to the Thanksgiving song, super loud and the crowd stared at him he just sucks. Best, Steven Tyler he loved coming into one of my old jobs, knew me by name, shared old tosities, told me an incredible Led Zeppelin story used to call me Rockerman, and always left $300. No matter what he ordered the best dude also super nice, Kevin Bacon, we talked Hollywood, pizza and how Los Angeles has changed nicest guy ever. Kate Beckinsale and Jessica Biel both almost got in my car at a hotel, and when I laughed and said I really wish I was driving you guys, they laughed and leaned in my car to laugh at the mistake. I told them I loved both of their work and they were beautiful they thanked me and were so nice. Isla Fisher, so nice and was changing shoes in my car, Uber, she saw me looking at her in the mirror sheepishly, and she said hello, it's me, super sweet and so gorgeous in person. Tegan and Sarah, so sweet and nice, told me a hilarious story. Billy Eilish, very sweet and nice exchanged funny dating stories with her, and her dad didn't know if was them until they got out of the car. J Electronica, I love hip hop, and I told him I was hyped to get him as a passenger he gave me VIP access to his show at the Troubadour and even shouted me out during his set nicest dude ever. Paul Thomas Anderson, told him as much his films meant to me, and he was super nice many more I can't remember, being from LA is a triple mayo. So I was working at a hotel in New York. Being close to a military base, we had a lot of guests for a fundraiser for veterans. I was a bellman at the time, and saw an older black merced come up to the door, so I went around to greet the driver, and I sheet you not it was John Stewart. He had retired from the Daily Show the year before, and I had never seen him with a beard, so I looked at him, said you are John Stewart. Pointing at him, completely flabbergasted. He looked me in the eyes, pointed at himself, and said I know. He was there to pick someone up so, after stumbling through our conversation, starstruck, I practically sprinted into the hotel to find the captain that put the event together, dragged her away from her conversation by saying ma'am, you won't believe this, but Jon Stewart is outside for you. Of course as the organizer for the event, she had expected this and followed me out. I opened the door to the car and she got in. As they were pulling away I waved and said that it was really nice to meet him. He stopped his car, turned and looked at me, and said it was nice to meet you too and smiled. Drove off into the sunset. My favorite show for the longest time was The Daily Show. He was like one of my top 3 celebrity heroes in the world. He is every bit as awesome in person as he was on the show. To take that second to turn around and tell me it was nice to meet me, I'm sure meant nothing to him, but still years later means so much to me. Legend. I saw you slash Moni but 13 at a grocery store in Los Angeles yesterday. I told him how cool it was to meet him in person, but I didn't want to be a douche and bother him and ask him for photos or anything. He said, oh, like you're doing now? I was taken aback, and all I could say was ha, but he kept cutting me off and going ha, 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 and closing his hand shut in front of my face. I walked away, and continued with my shopping, and I heard him chuckle as I walked off. When I came to pay for my stuff up front I saw him trying to walk out the doors with like 15 milky ways in his hands without paying. The girl at the counter was very nice about it and professional, and was like sir, you need to pay for those first. At first he kept pretending to be tired and not hear her, but eventually turned back around and brought them to the counter. When she took one of the bars and started scanning it multiple times, he stopped her and told her to scan them each individually to prevent any electrical interference and then turned around and winked at me. I don't even think that's a word. After she scanned each bar and put them in a bag and started to say the price, he kept interrupting her by yawning really loudly. 
Not my experience but my mom's. My mom was the server captain at a university catering service in the WNY area. Eric Abadu was in town. My mom was super excited at first, because this was the early 90s, my mom, my older sister, and my cousins were huge fans, it was a big deal. Well, Eric had demanded all of the servers were black, which was fine, my mom understood, but my mom being the only server captain, she had to be there, my mom's white. She said any time she walked by Eric, she would scoff at my mom and complain about some white woman ruining her small convention. It really bothered my mom. Still does to this day. My mom is probably the most professional person that was on staff that day, considering she was captain for a reason, and she did her job damn well. Not to mention, she had mixed kids at home. She gained a new understanding of what it feels like to be singled out for just being who you are, but it still doesn't make it okay. After that experience, my mom was always nervous for any celebrity experiences. She met someone she adored musically, and they turned out to be a dick. On the other hand, she met Bill Clinton during his presidency at the same catering service, and said he was just the sweetest man. She also met Henry Winkler at a different restaurant, and said the same thing. I will add, at the restaurant she met Henry Winkler at, it was owned by Jim Kelly from the Buffalo Bills. Jim Kelly was an absolute pose, and was rude to every worker there. One time an 8 year old boy was on his way to the gift shop and saw Jim Kelly sitting down in the back with his wife. Kid was starstruck. He went over to Kelly and asked for his autograph and Jim Kelly screamed at him. My mom was the server for the kid's family and was completely mortified. The family didn't and wouldn't blame her, but shortly after that she quit. She couldn't deal with him anymore lol. I worked security at a well known big box store company when they still sold a lot of CD albums and movies and such, and so we had a lot of musical and film guests. I met many artists, both single acts and bands, and actors for meet and greets with company personnel. To date I have met the following celebrity guests, Ozzy Osbourne, Bon Jovi, Disturbed, Five Finger Death Punch, Adele, KT Tunstall, Snoop Dogg, the band Perry, Naska Hall of Famer Richard Petty, Angela Bassett, Will Smith and his wife Jada Pinkett Smith, Irvin Magic Johnson, Three Doors Down, and Avenged Sevenfold. Yes I do, have photos of me, and my security team with all those mentioned if doubt me. With that said, the worst is a tie, Sir Elton John and Justin Bieber. Both with a severe superiority complex and just talk down to everyone, Elton John's own tour bus broke down, and he blamed us, Justin was just a grabber, kept grabbing my female coworkers behind, when he went in, to use the restroom. She left and I had another security officer, male, take her place. After he departed she was relieved, and then vented to me in private. She told me later on, that she was about to punch him, he grabbed her one more time. Best interaction would be a tie with Ozzy Osbourne, Disturbed, KT Tunstall, and Adele. All professional and didn't treat you like you were inferior. So I don't know if I'd say he was an asshole based solely on this interaction. Honestly, looking back on it, it's pretty funny. But anyway, Daniel Tosh performed at my college a couple times before Tosh Zero. After one of his performances, I approached him. Can't for the life of me remember what I intended to say, because just as I walked up beside him, he turned and screamed bloody murder in my face. Then, stopped screaming and turned back to whatever had been occupying his attention. I completely forgot what I intended to say, and lost the ability to speak, just kinda backed away. Point Zach Galifianakis also performed at my school, and was sitting at a table, signing autographs after the performance, this is before the hangover. I had been hanging around, chatting with friends, the line was dwindling, and I looked over at the table, where Mr. Galifianakis was signing autographs, and there were CDs or DVDs or something on it. I picked one up to look at it, and he said, you can take that, I was gonna sell them, but no one wants them. Turns out it was a DVD of a show he had on VH1. Eddie and me didn't even think to ask him to sign it. So, used to work with a woman who was studying broadcast journalism at a Bay Area college. I'm not going to name her because we a, weren't that close, b, this was 20 plus years ago, and c, she deserves her privacy, such as it is at the moment. 
Anyway, we worked at a local Mexican restaurant while we were both in college. One weekend, our hometown had a little festival of some sort going on, and we decided to go after our Saturday lunch shift, along with our friend, who was a bartender at the restaurant. We are walking around and see one of our local broadcast stations has a table, and there she is, Ana Chavez, a local anchor woman. My friend was all kinds of excited, so we go over to say hello. My friend specifically wanted to tell Anna that she helped inspire her interest in broadcast journalism as a career. We wait our turn, then my friend starts fangirling, complimenting her work, talking about how women have to work harder to be successful, and so on. This beach. Anna looks at my friend and says something, like it's just a job and it's not all that hard to do. I don't know if Anna was having a bad day or what, but she dismissed my friend completely in the rudest manner possible. We walked away in disbelief. Now, my friend was and still is incredibly beautiful, so maybe Anna felt threatened by an up and comer? Whatever the case, my friend stopped admiring her pretty quickly. Jokes on Anna, though. My friend went on to secure a weekend anchor spot on another channel, then an anchor spot, and then married an A-list actor slash director. She had her own reality show for a while, and by all accounts remains a nice, amazingly successful woman. Anna, on the other hand, quit broadcast TV after being stalked. Hands down, Tiger. I worked costuming on a music video with Tiger and Wiz Khalifa, and had the unfortunate pleasure of needing to be in the trailer with Tiger for an extended period of time. We were putting a prosthetic piece on him with an lead that was going to sit uncomfortably close to his eye and we needed to get his feedback on his comfort level. Instead, he refused to even acknowledge we were in the room. While I wired the rig into the piece point my boss left a bunch of important stuff back at the studio so what we were doing to compensate had the potential to be dangerous, but asking him for any feedback just resulted in him looking up from his phone, giving me a hard stare, and then looking back down at his phone. Worst part, he immediately got up and started screwing up our work the second his jewelry guy showed up with a tackle box full of gaudy gold necklaces. Like, Mathurfica, you're the one that wanted to look like the Terminator. Plus, he was dating a very underage Kylie Jenner at the time so fuck that guy. Wiz was cool as hell though. This is just one of those crazy coincidence stories, but it ended up being my favorite celebrity experience by far. I'm just now starting out as a first time feature writer slash director, so you probably haven't seen any of my previous work, and my movie gets picked up by Sony for development. This is early February 2020, right before the pandemic really hit by the way. I have a role in the movie that I specifically wrote for Henry Winkler. The guy has been a hero of mine forever, and I literally pictured him saying each line as I wrote it. Unfortunately my producers and the casting director said we could never get him for our budget level, especially considering that he had just won an Emmy on Barry. I'm even friends with his niece and asked her to reach out on my behalf, but she said that he unfortunately doesn't take any unsolicited offers, which I totally understand. He's Henry Winkler, and he doesn't need my little indie film role. Anyway so I'm flying out to LA for a few days to do our first casting session in the night before my wife says you should bump your ticket to first class, so I do because why would I turn down first class when my wife gives me permission? I'm getting on the plane and I'm in the last row of first class. I have the only seat on my side of the aisle and across the aisle are two seats and they are occupied by none other than Henry Winkler and his darling wife. Needless to say my heart instantly goes into Kentucky Dubray mode. I'm thinking no way this can't be a coincidence. I'm literally on my way to cast the movie and my dream cast member is sitting right next to me. I text my producers. They say go for it. You have nothing to lose. But what do I do? I do absolutely nothing. I just can't help but let him be a normal human being. After all, he is giving me the exact same courtesy. However, Halfway into the flight he drops his phone, and it stumbles onto my side of the aisle. I pick it up, and hand it to him, and he returns me the most genuine gentle eye to eye response, thank you so much, kind sir. More than anything I left the plane feeling like it was a gift from above going into making my first movie. Confirmation that I was on the right path, and that it was all going to fall into place the way it was meant to be. 
and that's exactly what happened. And yes, we got to make the movie last summer by taking lots of safety precautions and had zero COVID cases on set. Andrew Brian Yesky. You may know him as Lethal Face in a few of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remakes, but a fingers from Hudson Hawk the big dumb guy, Latimer, the steroidal lineman from the program, or as Crow from Firefly the henchman Mal kicks into his ship's engine. He's a big guy and obviously someone you wouldn't want to fack with and a member of Zack Wilde's BLS biker crew in LA. I faked with him. I faked with him hard because he was an asshole and he deserved it. I was volunteer working for a horror con in Kansas City a few years ago, and I worked at a local live music venue. I booked a show for the con's owner who had a band and he flew in Brian Yesky as a guest star for the show for a meet and greet. I went to the airport to pick him up along with two women who were friends of mine and offered to drive a bigger and nicer vehicle than I had, so I let him come along. Immediately upon picking him up at the airport, Brian Yesky was clearly drunk and jet lagged. As soon as he got in the car, he began making blatantly rude and sexual comments to the ladies and didn't stop when we got him to his hotel for a couple of hours of rest before we were to bring him to the venue for the show that night. He even tried pulling one of the girls into bed with him and she broke free and we left him there to go back to the venue to set things up and handle load him for the show. When I went back to the hotel for him, he was a cranky as hole to me and stayed that way for the rest of the evening, demanding I get him coke, I didn't, growling and lunging at me repeatedly, taking childish cheap shots at me all night and treated me like sheet while I basically catered to him the best I could. I told the con owner and he just blew me off acting like I should be honored. After the show, I dropped him back off at the hotel and said I'd come pick him up in the morning. He berated me again for not having the ladies there for him to fack. They didn't want to be around him after his behavior earlier that day. The next day, my girlfriend and I picked him up to take him to the airport. During the drive, he started making sexual comments about her too. I'd split you in half. She's petite. Enough was enough. I tried to be cool with the guy, but he pushed me too far. My girlfriend was driving. He was in the front passenger seat and I was sitting behind him. I told my girl to pull over on the side of the highway right then and there and said let's see you pull that off stranded on the side of a Missouri highway, Mathurfica. I'm done with your sheet. He looked back at me in anger thinking he was intimidating. He was, but I'm not a small guy either and I didn't give a fuck anymore. He said, I'll tell your boss and I'll tell your wife. We have mutual friends in LA as whole. You know Nadia G, a friend of mine who was the merch manager for Edline Chemistry at the time, yeah? And she's friends with your wife, you remember your wife? The woman you've been trying to cheat on all weekend with my friends? How about Titus H? One of the BLSLA chapter lieutenants? Yeah, you thought I was some fackin' nobody fan, didn't you? Get your ass out of my car right now, I don't give a fuck who you call. I volunteered for this, because I was a fan of yours. Finally he started acting apologetic and said he was just tired and offered me a random Saint Vitus CD he had signed. I dunno why. He's not in that band. I got out of the car, got his bag out of the trunk and tossed it on the side of the road. He got out to retrieve it and I got back in the car. He pleaded a little bit, told me not to be a bussy and that he was just kidding. I tossed his CD out the window at him and said, I don't give a fuck anymore, I can't hear this anyway, I'm deaf, and your name means sheet to me. Have a nice trip home, and tell your wife I said hello, and we left his ass on the side of I-435 about 15 minutes from the airport. The con owner was hella pissed off at me about it when he found out what happened, but by that point, I was already done with his sheet too. So I stopped volunteering for him, I booked all his bands that played at his con the last three years prior to that point, and never went back. I've met a lot of celebs over the years as a convention vendor, and hands down the worst was Chris Sarandon. I was setting up for the morning, when he came in, and started settling in, I'd seen the day, before he drank coffee and he didn't have one with him, so just to be nice, and as I was getting one myself, I grabbed him a coffee, and paused to give it to him on my way back, I also grabbed coffee for pretty much everyone else around me too including a couple other celebs. 
I stopped at his table and the following exchange happens. Me. Hi Mr. Sarandon. I'm one of the vendors here, and I noticed you don't have morning coffee. Would you like one? I have one with cream and without, and some sweetener or sugar. Whatever your preference is Chris. Do you also have $20? Me. A-H-H. Pardon? Chris. Do. You. Have. 20. Dollars. Spoken as if I was stupid. Me. Well. Yes. Why? Chris. Because that's how much it costs to talk to me for 2 minutes. You owe me $10 so far. I just stared at him for a moment and walked away without saying anything else at that point. I heard nothing but bad stories about him the entire weekend. He went out of his way to be rude to absolutely everyone unless you handed him money, at which point it was like a switch got flipped and he was utterly charming for a couple of minutes and then went back to being rude af. That was like 12 years ago and to this day at that convention people still immediately say he was the worst guest. We usually have repeat celebs every few years, they even ask to come because they have such a good time. He's never been invited back. The weirdest celeb guest we ever had was poor Corey Feldman. <laughs> William Shatner saw him at a con in 2003. He had a bouncer in front of his autograph table the whole time so nobody can interact with him, including children and the handicapped. His panel was awful and made no sense. Anytime someone asked him about Star Trek he'd dismiss them. This was a Star Trek convention point Walter Koenig at a different convention was miserable and non-interactive. Maybe he was sad nobody was at his table or was having a bad day, but he was really just blah. The Crystal Method. One of my favorite electronic acts ever. After a show in Anaheim they sat there having drinks. I walked up to them and said I was a huge fan. Had all their albums on CD and vinyl posters, etc. They just looked at me like I was an idiot. I was like alright. Walked out douches lol. Alec Empire of Atari Teenage Riot completely ignored me after a show when I said hello and handed him a CD to autograph real quick. At least Crystal Method acknowledged my existence. My stepbrother works in film and I asked him who's the worst actors he's ever worked with. He said Denzel Washington was a huge dick. Halted production for hours because they didn't have a specific drink in his trailer. He refused to come out. Also told me Millie Bobby Brown from Stranger Things was a rude entitled brat. Treated production staff like garbage. A buddy of mine was a huge Buster Rhymes fan. Was. He saw him in a bar with his entourage and approached him and said Buster you're awesome man and stuck his hand out. Buster was like hell nor n word fuck out to here. My buddy was crushed and dipped out of there furious, while Buster and his crew laughed at him. Another buddy of mine met pitcher Josh Beckett. He is a Marlins fan and Beckett was the 2003 World Series MVP. Walked up to Beckett at a bar and told him how much he loved him and wanted to shake his hand. Beckett grabs my buddy's hand shaking it furiously while sarcastically saying really bro that's awesome bro tell me more, while his entourage laughed. Buddy told him to fuck off Lmao. Never meet your heroes. Around 20 years ago my father was at a restaurant and Donald Trump and entourage was sitting at the adjacent table to him. After Trump left my dad asked the waiter about him. Waiter said that all his meals are comped and he doesn't even tip. The owner of the restaurant allows it because it's Donald Trump and his name brings people in. Okay fine. But he couldn't tip? Ashton Kutcher. Now let me be clear, this was many years ago, I have no idea if the man has matured or not as I'm no longer in the industry, but back when he was riding high on Ego in his early movie roles I was on a set with him, I was a production assistant, read bottom rung for slash laborer for basically everyone else on the crew, and he was there, walking around before a shoot. Basically everything he had to say was either insulting, offensive, or downright cruel. Of course you can't talk back to the talent that gets you fired and probably blacklisted from any gigs. Hell unless they approach you, you shouldn't be even looking at let alone talking to the talent. However Kutcher was engaging people and of course laughing things off and saying things like I'm just joking, come on or I was just trying to get a laugh, don't take it so seriously and the often news line of you aren't going to last in this industry if you can't even take a joke anytime someone would dare to look hurt by anything he said. 
Several people around me lost their position because of his actions for nothing more than looking upset and trying to just get on with their tasks and pissing him off for ignoring him. The worst one though was when he collared another PA and told them to go get him food because he didn't like the stuff on the crafty table. The PA couldn't just drop their work and tried to explain that and Kutcher's assigned assistant slash gopher was already out on another demand and he responded to that denial with basically a childlike fit. I believe the exact words included you can't talk that way to me and I didn't catch the rest as I was already dragging the PA away by the arm and pushing them out to the dock behind the grips truck in the hopes he wouldn't get fired as well. We were really damn short-handed by that point, and naturally both of us were seen by one of the director's toady little assistants, and got kicked off the set for harassing the talent. And neither of us worked for that particular production outfit ever again. In fact I never got a gig on any production taking place on a fox, owned lot again point yup, regretted that one. So as not to leave you all on a sour note, not long after I got to work a set with none other than Sir Patrick Stewart, sadly a one day gig, and only met him briefly then, and got to actually speak to him for a moment. He was being encouraging, and friendly to the crew, who were finishing a really rushed job that day, hence the one day temp gig on that set, and damn I felt appreciated. What a genuinely nice guy. It almost felt like he was watching out and took note of who was really breaking their back out there and made it a point to catch them before they left to say thanks for our hard work. Edit, in response to a question sent to me, I will try to explain a bit about why going to get food for him was a hard no for a PA. He was telling them to go get in their car, drive to a place he wanted, and bring it back, not simply stepping across the street or something. This is a big deal for a few reasons. First, that isn't your assigned task. There is zero downtime or slacking happening during setup for a shoot. Stages on studio lots are expensive. The talent's time is expensive. The crew is expensive. You get there and you are on task the entire time till you wrap and either lock up for the night if it's a multi-day or you pack up and leave that damn building stripped to the concrete floor for whoever uses it next. Second, he wasn't offering to pay for it, he expected it to be given to him. Yes PAs can turn in receipts for expenses, but we're bottom rung, if it's not an authorized expense that the person in charge of you sent you to do, good luck getting that reimbursed. And third, as a PA you don't have any kind of badge or your name specifically on a list to get back on the lot easily. You show up in the morning, drive in with a group. If you drove yourself, or you are jumping on one of the van slash trucks whatever with the production person who is giving you your orders that day, now yes, sometimes you get sent as part of your work off the lot, but in that case they usually either send you in a car that has a parking badge for the lot, or they give you one of the crew passes for the gate, or some other arrangement is made, every lot is different, but there is always some way to get back in. If you putz off on something like this with your personal vehicle though, and you can't get back in through the gate, you might as well not even bother showing back up for the rest of the job, because the second you call the crew member you report to, and ask to get them to come to the gate, and show their pass, you already got fired for wasting their time. Being a production assistant is a ruthless and unforgiving job. This is for the Aussies. John Wood, Gold Logie winner, was in Blue Healers. He was at an event, forget which one, mum and dad were big fans of the show, so I paid these crazy prices, which I saved from my part time job, since I was 17, for tickets as gifts. Dad was in remission, after battling cancer for years and he looked it. Anyway Mr. Good Guy would spent the encounter hitting on my mum with my dad, shattered, just standing there like a pork chop, completely snubbed dad, but it wasn't just dad. If you weren't a thin woman you got snubbed by this guy, one larger woman introduced herself while he was with us, and he literally put his nose in the air and turned his back on her, her face, again another person's confidence shattered by the prick. We never spoke much about it, but it was dreadful, he just destroyed the first fun day we had out, since dad never had the energy for long outings. Mum was mortified because she did not encourage such behavior, and I think it killed what little self-confidence dad had left. Luckily mum is amazing and did her mum magic to restore dad's confidence, but fuck that actor, seriously fuck him. Edit, clarified what crazy prices I paid for, tickets. 
I'll share a story where I thought a celebrity was an asshole, but I misunderstood. I went with my aunt and uncle to a con in Dallas back in 2017. My aunt is absolutely in love with Tim Curry. She idolizes him and all his roles. My boyfriend and I surprised her with a photo op for her birthday. My uncle and I chilled outside of the building while my aunt went to meet him. After a while, she comes back out, picture in hand, but she's in tears. My uncle and I look at each other, and before she can hear us, we start quietly asking each other, was he in his hole? She finally makes it to us, and she's wiping her face and we ask her if she was okay, if he was mean to her, etc. She shook her head and clarified that he was really kind, even asked for her name and told her it was a pleasure to meet her, but he was in a wheelchair and he didn't look so good. I guess he had had some health issues around that time, so she wasn't expecting to see him like that, and according to her, neither was anyone else in line. She was still over the moon that she got to meet him. She was just heartbroken at the state he was in because he didn't look well. She felt bad that he had still done the con and he wasn't just resting, so she got emotional after her photo was taken, hence the tears and our misunderstanding. She has the picture hung up and she cherishes it. 100% the one celebrity out of the 50 or so I've met that I absolutely disliked meeting was Brad Dereff from Chucky and Lord of the Rings. He was a complete asshole and didn't seem to care at all about meeting any of his fans. It was a comic con, so I could give him a little bit of leeway, but he was like who's it to, thanks, go away. And mind you, I was the only one in line and had been waiting for him to come back from break for like 20 minutes. Second worst was Kane Hodder, though I think it might have been because I was dressed up as Michael Myers. Best celebs was the entire band of Jimmy Eat World, Seen Scammell, Chris Sabat, Brett Spinner, John Rhys Davis and a few others. Chris Sabat's line was packed to meet him. He actually got sorta of forced to take a lunch break. Because he was afraid that he wouldn't get to meet everyone in line. He told them that he would take a break only if he met every single person in his line, even if the con was closed. He was by far the most amazing person to meet. John Rise was second most amazing. He grabbed a axe from a fan and started swinging it around doing Gimli lines. Absolute legend. I'm a lighting technician in live events. I work mainly in live music on festivals and touring with bands etc. I meet a lot of people. Generally they are nice to me because if they aren't their lights will look sheet. Doesn't stop some of them from being divas though, but generally I don't have to directly deal with them. I had a particular experience at a festival where the last band of the weekend were being dicks to the stage manager and generally drunk facts. Ended up climbing the front truss, the structure the lights hang off of, and the stage manager called a show stop because having band members 30 feet in the air over the audience, unsecured is a serious health and safety risk. The show didn't restart until they got down and proceeded to trash the speakers and microphone stands on stage. Jokes on them because they would have got a big bill afterwards. Later on, I was speaking with the stage manager and he said that he had been waiting to be able to do a show stop due to how annoying they were being all day. They were running late, so he cut their set list down as well. Do not piss off the stage manager. They are God. On the other hand, I toured with idols at the end of 2019, and they are really nice guys. Genuinely lovely, even when everything is running late and everyone is stressing. The kind of band that make you want to go over the top for them, just because you know they will appreciate it so much. Not as in a bad person kind of way, more just like a fool. Nikki Cox. I was in Las Vegas with my wife on a honeymoon. We were at Madame Tussaud's Wax Museum. It was just us and one other couple there. In the final exhibit, I wanted to get a picture of the two of us. This was in 2005 before selfies were easy. So I turned to the other couple, hold out my camera, and say would you mind? The dude says sure, and takes the camera and my wife and I pose. The woman he was with smiles, and comes over to us, as if she's going to pose with us, and then the dude gives a pointed a hem, and she loses her smile, realizes what's up, and backs away from us. He takes our picture, hands back the camera, I say thanks. It's at this point I realize this guy's Bobcat Goldthwait. I'm a little starstruck, 
because I'm that kind of nerd who would be starstruck by Bobcat Goldthwaite, so I don't say anything. When my wife and I get to the gift shop I say to her I think that was Bobcat Goldthwaite. Then this septuagenarian security guard pops out of nowhere and says it was indeed Bobcat Goldthwaite and the lady who was with him was his wife, Nikki Cox, who was a B-less TV actress. That's when I realized Nikki Cox thought we wanted a picture with her. It's an understandable mistake I guess, but Bobcat knew what was up right away. Within a year of that incident all four of us were divorced. I've met quite a lot of celebrities through my job, I work for a lounge at the airport, but for me the one I was the most disappointed in was Judd Leto. Met him both at my job several times, and once out of work, at a festival. I was a huge fan of his, loved his music, and really liked him as an actor. I've always remained professional at work, and never dared ask for a photo or anything of the sort. I understand that the guy's traveling, and doesn't want to be bothered. Although he was always a bit weird and off when coming through our lounge and other colleagues told me that he had been a bit rude to them, but I always made excuses for him like, hey guys give him a break, he's probably stressed about traveling or something. But one day at a famous festival, I saw him, on his own, taking pictures of the sky, I went over to him with my sister and politely asked him if I could get a picture with him, I'm a bit shy, my sister had to kinda push me to go talk to him, and she doesn't even like him lol. Well at first he straight up ignored me, I had the most awkward minute of my life standing there, after I spoke to him, waiting for a response. I almost walked away. He was still snapping pictures and stuff, then after what feels like an eternity, he kinda looked at me over his shoulder, before taking a few more pictures, and without looking at me, he said something like oh what is it? You want a picture? MMM yeah fine, and he finally put down his phone, to pose for a picture. After all of that happened I was still trying to make excuses for him, but the truth was, that he was pretty rude, and I kinda regret meeting him. Can't really listen to his music now. The whole thing left a bitter taste in my mouth. On the other hand some people that I was so happy to meet at work because they were the nicest people are David Tennant. I saw him multiple times at work and he eventually started remembering me and even called me a sweetheart once. I was over the moon lol Jard Padalecki and Jensen Ackles. They were both really nice and I think they lowkey didn't mind all of the female staff looking at them with heart eye emoji faces. Mark Shepard too was super nice, and started remembering me as well, and was super pleasant and polite. Finally there's also Depeche Mode. The whole band was so kind, super cool and everyone was extremely polite. They even gave me an autograph and a VIP pass for a show. Couldn't attend but it was the thought that counted haha. <laughs> Former Dallas Cowboy Michael Ivan. At the time, I was working a loss prevention job at a large department store. One day I saw some teenagers concealing some fake gold watches in the jewelry section of the store. When they tried to leave the store without paying, I confronted them, and they ran away. I chased after them and caught one. No criminal charges were filed, because the theft amount was less than $100, and it wasn't really worth it. His dad had to come to the store and pick him up. Dad and the family were in town from Fort Lauderdale, and was super embarrassed about the situation. Said he was going to discipline his kid properly, and seemed like a genuinely good dad to a kid that did something dumb. Fast forward to next day, dude dressed in a fancy dress coat and nice winter flat cap comes into the store. It's Michael Ivan, and he's the uncle to the kid I caught yesterday. He basically came into the store to throw his weight and celebrity around, and tried to accuse me of being racist because I caught his nephew stealing. Threatened to go to the media and essentially call us racist on TV. Total douche canoe. Amazing how different his reaction was to his brothers. One was a real parent. That was an example of responsibility and grace. And Ivan was just so arrogant and cringy. I met Brian Jacks, author of the Red Wall series, as a young child. Never read another page of his work after that. There was an event and book signing. He read the first chapter of Red Wall to us on stage, then we got in line to have one book signed. The crew said we were allowed to ask one question, if we so chose. The kid behind me in line kept bragging about how smart he is and how fast he reads all the books. When it came time, I gently placed my book down. I saw Brian Jacks rub his hand in pain. 
being the overly shy, eager to please kid that I was, I said it's okay, if your hand is hurting too much to sign my book Mr. Jax. He gave me a withering look, like I was scum. He yanked my book toward him, and while signing, without looking at me, said in the most disrespectful tone anyone has ever spoken to me in, don't you have a question to ask? I asked why, don't you ever have chipmunks in your books? Being that the characters are all animals. Maybe not the smartest question, but I didn't really have one so came up with it on the spot. He responded in the same disrespectful tone, because England doesn't have chipmunks you daft boy, pretty much hurled my book back at me. Because of the layout, we had to wait to exit in line too. The smart kid behind me made him laugh, and they made a joke about how stupid I sounded. I was crushed. Jokes on them. Don't think Mr. Jax gets to call himself drive like I do. My first job was at a tiny video rental store in a small New England tourist town. Renowned television film critic Gene Shallot lived nearby and was a regular customer. He rented exclusively vintage foreign films from our surprisingly extensive collection. The dude was super into himself and had a signature look with a Jufro, 1970s eyeglasses, and a thick, black mustache. Everyone in town knew him. But since I was the video clerk and he was the famous movie guy, I'd ask for his name every time he rented a VHS. Also, he once crashed into my mum's parked car and ambled away from the crime scene, so screw that guy. He'd grow visibly furious at me, but would play along. It was so fun to tease him, and I'm not a jerk. I treated Gene this way cause my friend worked at the small grocery across the street. And Shallow would ask her, while checking out, Hey kid, do you wanna be in the movies? With a lascivious grin. She was 14. Creep city. I knew some teenagers who accepted his invitations and went to his house. He showed them movies in his home theater, served fancy food, and came off as a lonely guy. That made me feel for him a bit. Reading this thread, for some of the accounts, you were the assholes, so it's no wonder many get jaded and want you to leave them alone. Celebrities just want to go about their lives without having to stop every 5 seconds, because some assholes shouts hey it's so and so. Can you stop whatever you're in the middle of, so I get a picture and an autograph? This attention would be fun for a few months, and get old real quick. Can't carry on a conversation, or eat a meal in peace. As a celebrity chaser, think of yourself as a pickup artist pursuing and hitting on some super hot girl at the grocery store, when she's just trying to faking buy laundry detergent. She is probably pretty faking tired of random horny dicks hitting on her in places that aren't bars or dating sites, and you're just another asshole who sees them as an object. There are appropriate times to expect pleasant encounters with celebs when there is a meet and greet, for example, or when they are the ones interacting with you, such as being a customer or attempting to talk to you. But fans bothering them going about their daily lives, then turn around and posting how nasty they are on the internet don't get much sympathy from me, and you are probably part of the reason they become standoffish and blunt. I may be late to this party, and I shared my David Cross is an asshole story above, but I have another asshole celebrity story, this one is about Vince Vaughn. A few friends and I headed to our local for a little early happy hour. This was in 1999-2000-ish. The bar had the best punk rock jukebox in the neighborhood. We always sat in the booth close to the jukebox for easy access. So we get there and put our jackets and backpacks in the booth and head over to the, the bar to order our drinks. No table service, just one bartender. There are four of us and we all had backpacks. So imagine how much stuff was in the booth, jackets, and backpacks for four people in a four person booth. We were the only people in the bar besides the bartender. The bar was empty and the 10 to 15 other booths and tables were empty. Not hard to figure out that the group of people at the bar had chosen a booth. For most people. But hey, Vince Vaughn isn't most people. Vince Vaughn and a few companions walk into the bar and sit in our booth, on top of our stuff. Now he had no way of knowing that two of us were photographing a show that night and had our cameras in our backpacks. However, a general rule of thumb is, you know, not to sit your ass on top of a backpack. General rules of thumb are not for Vince Vaughn, however. One of my friends says, hey, that's our booth, our stuff's there. Vince Vaughn rolls his eyes. 
we were not looking for confrontation in our local, so we put our drinks down on another table and start to get our stuff from underneath Vince Vaughn and his pals. One important thing to note, none of us knew it was Vince Vaughn. Personally, I barely knew who he was except for being the guy who made swingers absolutely unwatchable. But don't worry. He told us. One by one, we went over to grab our stuff from under them. My friend S went over and said hey can I grab my jacket. Yes I am Vince V-A-U-G-H-N. No autographs today. He angrily responded. She just pushed on one of the dudes and grabbed her stuff. He did a variation of this twice more. I go over to get my jacket and my backpack, which are in the back corner of the booth, on top of which is Vince Vaughn. Hey dude, can I grab my, but I can't finish my sentence. He sticks his hand in my face to shake my hand, rolls his eyes, and says yeah Vince V-A-U-G-H-N. Nice to meet you. Now please leave US alone god I can't geo anywhere in peace. I said, you're sitting on my stuff, my backpack has a camera in it, we don't know, or care who you are, we just don't want you to sit on our stuff. And I got my stuff and walked away. The end. Fuck that guy. Edited, a word and also wanted to add two musicians who I met who were the sweetest, most wonderful humans, Jeff Buckley and Elliot Smith. They were such kind people. I'm sad they are gone. Here's some feel good stuff to brighten the mood. Elon Musk, awkward at first, but after 10 minutes he loosens up and becomes really cool. Enjoyed my time with him. Jack Black, class act all the way around. Very laid back and not an in character type of entertainer. Harrison Ford, a man of few words but polite. A lot smaller than I would have thought. Point she off. Honestly? Surprisingly normal guy. Not imbalanced or what you would expect. Matthew Lawrence, another stealth nice guy. Keeps a low profile and tries hard not to be noticed when out in public. Kai McBride, hilarious, boisterous in the best way possible. All around good people. Down to earth and kind. Vanessa Hudgens, what an absolute sweetheart. Seriously. Bill Maher, definitely likes cocaine. Nice enough. Titus Welliver, great guy, actually. Another one who's way smaller than they look on TV, lol. Genuine and a consummate professional. Vince Vaughn, really cool guy, very personable and witty. Sarina Vincent, naked foreign exchange student and not another teen movie, lovely inside and out. Lots of fun to work with. Zach Braff, two interactions. First one was when he was on his own and he seemed like he was a nice guy who was just in a bad mood or stressed. Next time I saw him, he was with his, at the time, girlfriend Mandy Moore, who was also very sweet, and he was a pretty nice cordial dude. Definitely caught him on an off day first time around. Seth Green, pretty cool guy. Didn't have a huge span of time to get to know him. Steve Carroll, made him a free drink where I worked at the time. He mused about how, now that he can afford drinks he gets them for free. A plus would give free drink again. Ray Park, was getting a bite, to eat with his wife and mother-in-law. When I sat them, I knew he looked familiar. I'm a huge Star Wars nerd. It wasn't until 10 minutes, after I sat them that it clicked. So on their way out I quietly and politely asked, if he was who I thought was, and he confirmed and obliged me with a handshake and a kind word. Love you Darth Maul. Ashley Simpson. JK. They are not all gonna be good. She and her friends were insufferable. Not so much me, but my brother was a London taxi driver for nearly a decade before switching jobs. He's met countless of celebrities over the years. Both sound as fuck and right as holes. A couple come into mind. Nigella Lawson and Charles Saatchi. Before the whole throat grabbing incident the tabloid snatched up, my brother was with Comcab, and they had a personal account with them. On a few occasions he was basically their personal driver for the day ferrying them around London with the kids too for shopping. Harrods and Selfridges was a favorite and usually asked for him to wait about as they did their thing. With the meter still running, so he didn't mind one bit. He always said Charles was a decent bloke and always made conversation, but Nigella didn't so much make a peep and was a bit of sourpuss. Jamie and Louise Ridknapp. He had these two as a fair once, and Louise kept on beaching and questioning if he was sure knew where he was going. Keep in mind he had to do the knowledge which is faking not an easy task and is a human AZ when it comes his navigation. 
Then Jamie then says to my brother mate, I'm really sorry about this, turns to her and says will you shut the fuck up and let him do his job? I'm sure he knows what he's doing. Wasn't surprised one bit when they divorced in the end. Cara Delevingne, this is probably my favorite celebrity story. Brother gets a radio job, pre-booking essentially, and all he is given is an address in Mayfair in the time. No bother. Drives there, waits outside the big fuck off mansion with blue doors, and reads the paper. He said he recognized the place at the time, but couldn't think why. Then, a girl comes out with her hood up and sunglasses, comes to his sherbet dab, and confirms if he was the taxi she booked. At this point my brother twigs that it is no one other than Carla Delevingne, realizing the doors was when she got caught dropped her bag of coke on the floor. Anyway, she hops in and asks to drive her to Covent Garden. That's all. None of the crazy interactions or sweet chatting to the crowd she's famed for. She was quiet as a mouse stuck in her phone like a typical stroppy teenager. Alright, whatever, he thought. He preferred it that way. Halfway through the journey, he was driving down the main strip of the mall and noticed a few mopeds around him riding like absolute mongs. At first he just beeped them, told to move the fuck out of his way. Next thing he noticed them riding stupidly close to him alongside his cab, with cameras in hand. It was the faking paparazzi trying to get pictures of Kara on the back of his cab and riding around like lunatics trying to do so. He couldn't believe it, all the while Kara just kept her head down and said jack sheet. He was relieved after they dispersed and finally dropped her off. Oh, and she didn't tip him either. With her wealth too, eh? One of the girls I went to high school with was a 1980s television star. Very well no child actor. I got to know her a bit in school. Not really friends but friendly. She told me once that she was very insecure and shy and people often interpreted that as being stuck up or standoffish. Once, I was at a mall shopping and she came up to me and told me that some guys were following her and asked if I would shop with her. Sure enough, two guys twice her age were creepily following us around the mall. I walked up to them and asked them if they had a problem and they said they were big fans. I told them that following around a teenage girl was creepy as fuck which they agreed with once they thought about it. I've also known some other celebs and famous musicians and it's crazy how people just expect them to be on all the time. I've been eating with them in restaurants and they can barely finish a meal because people keep coming over asking for an autograph or a picture. One time I went to the movies with a minor celeb and you could hear people in the audiences that X. No, it can't be X dude, I think that's him. Lol, I remember meeting one rock star after one of his shows. I was friends with one of his relatives. We were in his dressing room and he asked if I wanted him to sign anything. I said, no, that's cool. Big fan, but I'm sure that sheet gets old for you. People always wanting sheet from you. I'm just grateful you invited me backstage. I appreciate that. His jaw hit the floor. He agreed that it's tiring when everyone always wants something. Next tour his tour manager called me and asked if I wanted tickets and backstage passes. We hung out again after the show. When they got done with that tour he and his wife invited me to dinner at their house. It was only chipotle takeout, lol, but we hung out and jeeked out over cars. Anyway, my point is that being a celebrity isn't always fun. Everyone expects something from you. You can't go shopping or for a meal without people asking you for something. People talk about you when you're right there and can hear them. If they have one bad day or even a bad moment, people start posts on Reddit to talk about what a disappointment it was to meet you. Lol. Yes, there are some jerks, but I wouldn't judge a celeb on a single encounter. You have no idea what may be going on with them in that moment when you meet them. Maybe they just signed 1000 autographs with a huge smile and you come up to them and ask for the 1001st and they are just emotionally exhausted and want to leave. Maybe they are going through a divorce. Maybe they are going through financial problems. Maybe their kid just got suspended from school that day. Maybe they just got into a huge fight with their parents. I always wonder how many people met Robin Williams during his final months, when his brain disorder was making him hallucinate, he couldn't sleep, he was suffering from depression, etc. Point and thought, wow, he was kind of a dick. He didn't even want to take a selfie with me. Yuma Thurman is a piece of garbage. 
when I was finishing up college I got a job at a cellular call center and you to being a fast typer, having actual experience in the cell phone repair industry due to a previous job, this was before smartphones and texting, and a commanding voice I rose quickly to VIP escalation, mostly really rich customers that always escalate, and a few actual VIPs who needed a more experienced CSR. There were basketball players, CEOs, politicians, all in the USA, complaining about leftover minutes not being rolled over into the next month, getting locked out of their phones, roaming charges. The more tense a situation gets the calmer I get, it's just my way. I was raised rurally by grandparents who lived through WWII, and they argued constantly, and treated me as an equal from birth, never talked down to me, so it's nearly impossible to shake me. But that beach humor faking Thurman, I hate that faking hoe. You'd think a busy movie star, this was when she was hot sheet with Pulp Fiction behind her, and lots of A-level work coming her way, would have their assistant handle her cell bill. I talked to lots of agents and publicists, but not the screechy princess. She talked a mile a minute, constantly changed the issue, lied like a bastard about discounts and credits she'd been promised by CSRs on previous calls that never happened. She would threaten, scream, talk down, scream, swore like a sailor with a broken leg, and dice her over every damn penny, then scream at her flunkies on her end of the line, insult my job, how much she imagined I made, my education, my gender, why is there no women working at your center, do you as holes hate women, I bet you beat your girlfriend, oh right, you couldn't get a woman, unless you wrapped her, a lovely person, let me tell you. I never broke, not once, I'm proud of that. And at every interview I ever had, when they ask for an example of a stressful situation I've experienced in a previous job, let me tell you I had the best story ever to relate. On the other hand one of the best calls I ever had, was with Al Gore. That guy was a class act. He called personally once, when he'd been locked out of his phone. He talked to me, like we were old friends sharing a beer, beyond personable. After I got his phone open we kept chatting for like 20 more minutes, just the nicest guy ever. Thurman can eat sheet. I regret meeting most famous people, because I seem to inevitably make an ass of myself to all of them. I try to tell Trace Bolu how integral I saw him being to Mystery Science Theater 3000, and it comes out, the show was ruined for me when you left. He, understandably, takes this as me complaining to him that he left and says oh, but I had to. In a tone that's wow, I'm super annoyed, but I don't want to be a jerk back. This haunts me. John Daniel of the Mountain Goats told me he didn't remember our previous interaction at a carcass show. Thankfully, and realistically unsurprisingly, as he approved of the incantation shirt I was wearing to one of his shows. I'm slightly less haunted by that one. I, at 17, had Stuart Braithwaite of Mogway sign a record. I found out later he thinks signing records is dumb as sheet. I try to cut myself breaks on this. I'll report back when I figure out what those breaks are. I had a super awkward interaction with the members of Coheed and Cambria, having lined up in my brain the positive things to say to Claudio that Translucid was freaking awesome as a comic reader who wasn't just gonna like what he wrote for being in a band I like to Travis. That I love the Davenport cabinet records, to Zatch that he's cool, but doesn't, a fake, have a side project type deal, and to Josh, that I dig the hell out at weird science, and that a particular track Gangster Dreams reminded me, positively of a Jeru the Damager track the bullshit. Josh is lost and confused my reference, and Travis corrects my pronunciation of Jeru. Feeling stupid there. I project my deep affinity for Thanos onto his creator, Jim Stalin, and ask something along the lines of who he felt carried the character best in his absence, or possibly who did the opposite, and immediately realize this was a douche thing to ask, caught up as I was in the frustrations I have as a random comic reader, which are entirely different from a creator with a reputation and fans and stuff. He handled it super gracefully, and said he wasn't sure, and complimented Ron Mars who had taken up the character in Silver Surfer, while Jim went off with Adam Warlock in his own book. Deep shame for eternity. Why did I think that was a good question? On the bright side, none of the directors, comic writers and artists, nor musicians I've met have been as. Clearly I'm lucking out here. 
Walter Koenig mistook me for a woman, but I was both not offended and everyone got a big laugh when he immediately pulled out his glasses. He was totally cool about even that, and I was in the crowds at a distance, and had long hair, which was a reasonable guess in this culture, there's actually some amusing stuff from another time I met them on this front. A friend of mine, let's call him Ash, because that's his name, worked as a manager at a sporting goods store in Australia. To set the table, Ash is gay, but you wouldn't know it by talking to him. Anyway, a dude walks up to him about half an hour before they were set to close and basically told him Russell Crowe would like to come in and buy a bunch of stuff M. This was at the peak of Russell's fame, so the dude asked if Ash would empty out the customers for them. Some people may not like this, but I have no beef with it really. Anyway whatever. So Rusty shops around with a few peeps and takes basically half an hour. Closing time. Because Ash would usually be leaving work at this time, his friend shows up to meet him. His friend is somebody you'd immediately know as gay. On this day, that fact was emphasized by his shirt, which read back quote I faked your boyfriend in big bold letters. Ash explains to his friend that he'll need an extra moment, so the friend takes a seat not far from the front counter. Eventually, Russell and his cronies hit the counter with their items. It was a lot. Ash started scanning everything through and quickly noticed that the Russ kept eyeballing the gay dude over on the bench, probably sitting next to a young John Mulaney. Rusty looks very uncomfortable about this dude. As Ash continues processing the items, Rusty keeps eyeballing the guy with the shirt, and he's looking more and more agitated. Ash is feeling really uncomfortable at this point, because he can feel that Russell is gonna say something. He can sense the anger bubbling up. This goes on for a good 5 minutes before Russell finally says something to Ash. And I'll remind you that RC had no idea they knew each other. He leans into closer to Ash so the other guy can't hear. Back quote can you fucking believe this guy? Ash says, what do you mean? Back quote can you believe the faking nerve? Ash stood in silent terror. Russ continues. Back quote seriously, I can't believe the nerve of this guy. I can't believe. He faked my boyfriend. Martha Stewart. I used to fly for a part 135 charter company before the pandemic. I was a first officer. Now I didn't know she had been in prison or was a close friend of Snoop. Just she made food and clothes and whatnot. I had met a couple of famous people working as a pilot. Many were kind or just kept to themselves. Either way it wasn't an issue. So I meet up with the captain, and we do our pre-flight and await her arrival. She's 45 minutes late which isn't so bad. Annoying yes, but not the longest I've seen. The captain and I are patiently waiting by the aircraft door when her chauffeur pulls up. As senior I wait for my captain to introduce himself to her, and I'm just stunned. Come on let's go, I got places to be. Were the first words out of her mouth. Walked right past the captain his outstretched hand, and into the plane. Her chauffeur is left behind to grab all her bags and hand them to so we can get them on board. Once that's finished the captain boards first and is about to give the safety briefing which by law is required for any passengers boarding an aircraft. He starts but is immediately cut off by her I don't need that crap, let's go. She was so condescending it made my blood boil. Now I'm a very forgiving person. Try to always find the good in people and give the benefit of the doubt. It was 5 maybe 10 minutes and I truly hated her. We landed and got her off the plane with no further incidents, but I was amazed at how disrespectful she was. We talked to the ground crew after we landed and apparently she's been with a few different companies and their pilots say the same thing. Some even refused to fly her because of her attitude. Strange enough she's nice as can be to a few of the ground crew. Never found out why. Unfortunately that's not the only time I flew her, and every time she was a complete beach. Other times she'd travel with what I like to call her cronies and they'd be tolerable at first then she would arrive, and they all turned. But that's a different story. To this day I can't hear her name, and not get instantly pissed. She truly is a nightmare. Mick Jagger. I was a writer for SNL in my mid-twenties. He came in to host the show. My friends were all like, is he nice? No. Or maybe he is for his version of life. Because he has a very different life. He's Mick Jagger. That's his name. 
he's played to stadiums of 20,000 people cheering for him like he's a god for 50 years. That must change you as a person. If you do that for 50 years, you're never again going to be like, um, does anyone have a laptop charger I could borrow? None of that bullshit way we all have to talk to get through life. Hi. Knock, knock. Sorry. That's how I walk into rooms. I'm 35 years old, I'm 6 feet tall. I lower myself, I go, hi. Knock, knock. I say knock, knock out loud. Mick Jagger didn't talk like that. Mick Jagger talked like this. He'd go, yes, no, yes. I pitched him a joke and he went, not funny. I mean, people say that on the internet, but never to your face, does a British billionaire in leather pants go, not funny. I spent two hours alone with Mick Jagger that week. We were writing song lyrics, it was for a fake song in a comedy sketch. And he was sitting there, and we came to one point and he goes, alright, let's all go to the picnic, let's all have a drink. Let's see, what rhymes with drink? And I said, think. And Mick Jagger said, no. And then I said, sink. And Mick Jagger said, yeah. And I was like, Matherfica, is this how you write songs? Just one word at a time with verbal abuse? Alright, back quote I can't get no happiness, no. Satisfaction? Yeah. Alright. Next sentence. Space bar. Indent. Space bar. Mick Jagger would go like this, Diet Coke. And one would appear in his hand. Now that's not nice, right? The way I was raised, you're supposed to say, may I please, have a Diet Coke, please? And then maybe you will get one. And I bet all of you were taught to say please and thank you. But if all of us could go, Diet Coke, and one would appear in our hand, we'd do it all day long. Even if you don't like Diet Coke, you'd just summon M, so you could chuck M at oncoming cars. Probably way too late, but I have a story from the opposite side that's worth sharing. I worked on a movie a few years ago with Michael Shannon. Part of my job was to pick him up and drive him to and from set every day, which meant 2 plus hours a day in a small car with a sleep deprived Michael Shannon. Other members of the production warned me to keep the car in a certain way and not do certain things while driving for fear of his wrath. He is a super intense student person in the first week or so I was driving him, he barely said a word to me, which I thought was better than the alternative. Eventually though, he broke the awkward car silence by asking me if I'd seen the previous night's baseball game. He'd noticed the Red Sox hat I wore to set sometimes. After that silence was broken we actually established a pretty good rapport on our rides and got to be buddies on set. He told me later that he's always felt incredibly awkward around new people and can't do small talk, so he had no idea what to say to me for the first few days in the car. Once we got over that hump, and he felt comfortable though, he showed himself to be a very funny, wry, intelligent and thoughtful guy. My impression of him now is almost the opposite of the prickly image most people seem to have of him still. Anyway, one day, early in the shoot, we were cruising along the highway, when a car cuts us off very dangerously out of nowhere. I managed to swerve and brake to keep us out of danger, but Shannon was furious. Traffic had slowed up ahead, so we wound up catching up to the car pretty quick, at which point. Mike leans out the window of our car and just starts tearing into this reckless driver in the most intense, hellfire and brimstone, obscenity-laden tirade I've ever heard. I saw the face of the driver in the other car, and I swear they were having an out-of-body experience. No way was Michael Shannon out of nowhere cursing their existence on this random highway, right? We lose sight of the other car, Mike leans back inside, grabs my shoulder very concerned, and asks you okay, man? That was when I knew General Zod had my back. Solid dude. Would meet again. No one will read this as I'm super late to the party, and I'll get downvoted, but here it goes. A couple of buddies did valet parking, and general bell desk work at a super fancy historical restaurant slash hotel. This discussion was had during the 2016 elections, and they said they met both Trump and Hillary Clinton during their time there. The time of their employment there was around 2000s, when we were in college. They said Trump always tipped well, was always smiling courteous to everyone, 
remembered names and their important events, how'd your exams go, but, study hard, and actually a charming and likable dude in person. They said he has quite a presence, because he's a tall, and generally a large dude, but what they saw portrayed in the media, how Trump portrayed his brand was very different than his actual person, down to the way he talks. Hillary was difficult. She'd be always yelling at her staff, as my buddies did bell desk duties for her staff, and was generally standoffish and rude to her staff, I think she was a senator at the time, going back and forth DC and New York. I have to ask them, but I think they mentioned it was a hotel that was popular with the Democratic Party and their largest donors, which Trump was an active donor of at that time, and specifically remember lots of dignitaries went to that hotel. Regardless, my friends say the perceived public image of both is very different from reality personality wise. I'm quite sure there was also an Ask Reddit thread about what I said around 2015 to 2016 time frame that discussed this, and many people who have met both, or one or the other, have expressed the same opinions. I'm retired law enforcement. When I was working patrol one night at around 0300 I see this car speeding past me doing 30 over, so I stop it, it's policy at my old agency, to order the driver out of the vehicle on the PA system for every traffic stop, PAV's MIM Supreme Court, any law enforcement can order the occupants out of a vehicle on a traffic, stop for safety reasons at any time. We just did it to everyone. The driver isn't getting out, so I get out and approach because I can see him moving around and looking like he's rummaging around under the seat. As I'm approaching I can see he is in fact reaching around under the seat and I'm not trying to get shot, so I draw my gun and start yelling commands at him to show me his hands quit reaching or I'll shoot him and get out of the car. He finally gets out and it's Aaron Hernandez, football player, indicted for murder eventually. I tell him to put his hands on the hood of his car, I pat him down, no weapons and start my traffic stop asking him why he's speeding. He can't really give me a clear answer, and I'm getting super suspicious, but my supervisor got there, and suggested I let him go, because of who he is. He's like yeah, you know me right, I play for rough, I'm like yeah, you're a football player, well I'm a deputy sheriff nice to meet you. I wrote him a criminal citation, wanted to search the car, to see what he was reaching for, but he said no, and we didn't have a canine to do a sniff, so I let him go. When he got arrested for murder years later the bad feeling I got interacting with him, like just that feeling where the hair stands up on the back of your neck made sense. Not in a story, but a pretty funny one about Wu-Tang. I was working front desk at a luxe hotel in downtown San Francisco a few years back. One night we had a large group checking in for the night who booked about 10 rooms. In a hotel we try to put groups of people close near each other as best we can, but this was a sold out night and the only rooms close together were the absolute sheetiest in the entire hotel. Not sheety like trashy, this was still a luxe hotel, but these were right next to the gym, so you would hear people lifting weights at all hours of the day and night, and it was an atrium and these rooms were near the bottom and all noises from the lobby would be echoed up and heard. Our reservationist who booked them might have been out of the loop and had them labeled as Wu Music Group. We all assumed it was some Chinese traveling music group, so we really didn't pay them any attention. To place them in better rooms beforehand, we obviously had suites and presidentials, etc. So here I'm expecting a bunch of Chinese musicians to walk in when all of a sudden RZA and the whole crew came out of the elevator, lobby was above the ground floor, and started to approach for check-in. This is when it all clicked for me oh shit this is our Chinese music group, we have them in the sheet east rooms. RZA was super nice, and we small talked for a bit. They were there staying the one night, and had a show the next day. I kept it professional, but obviously I knew who they were, and felt terrible we were about to give them the sheety strums in the hotel. One thing that stood out was the strong odor of weed which permeated the entire lobby once they stepped out of the elevator lol. RZA put all the rooms on his credit card, I handed them the keys and off they went. Didn't hear a peep from any of them the rest of the night. The next day at checkout we had to use the ozone machine and fumigate a few rooms due to the weed smell. Everyone at the hotel had a good laugh once this made the rounds. Pretty funny story and definitely a memorable one. Hope you all enjoyed. Spinal Tap. 
I was in line for a beer at the Rose Garden, now Moda Center, in Portland, looked over toward where I was to enter the arena, and, Spinal Tap was standing there. Christopher Guest, Michael McKean and Harry Shearer, just kinda hanging out, and surveying the crowd, right in front of the entrance to where my seats were. Apparently they were in town doing the Mighty Wind Tour, and playing the next day. I've seen Spinal Tap 20 times. Best in show. Guffman. All the guest troupe movies. I love. From McKean in the big picture to Shearer on The Simpsons to guest, and Shearer in male synchronized swimmers, one of my all-time favorite skits on SNL. To all their work together, I've been a massive fan of all those guys for so long. They are Spinal Tap for facts sake. So I got my beer and walked over, and just as I got there they made an oh god, here we go face. I sort of raised my hand to signal I wasn't going to take much of their time and very politely said that I appreciated their work and hope they have a great tour. McKean literally looked at the ceiling. Shearer pursed his lips and made the international low okay, pal face. And guess just stared at me blankly. So, I said okay, enjoy the game and walked in. Total letdown. The most famous people I've ever met were Idina Menzel and Kristen Chenoweth. They came and performed a couple songs from Wicked with my local symphony orchestra, and they came out into the lobby after the performance. My mom and I, an extremely awkward 12 year old at the time, went over and my mom started talking to them, and they were some of the sweetest people I've ever met. They seemed genuinely interested in the conversation, and Kristen Chenoweth gave me a hug after they both signed my program. It went missing a while ago, and since I was reintroduced to Wicked a few years ago, I've been tearing my old room apart to find it. I've met quite a few lesser known musicians, and one that particularly stands out is Carlos Zima, the lead singer of the power metal band Immortal Guardian. Pretty much, I found out too late that the concert was 21 plus, I was 19, and I was walking away when he saw me looking bummed out and walked up to me to make sure everything was okay. I explained the situation to him, and he just said come on, we'll tell them you're my cousin. He then got into a 15 minute argument with the security guards, until they finally let me in, for free, and he made sure I got a backstage pass and free merch. It remains one of the best concerts I've ever been to. As for bad ones, I don't have much, but my old CJ professor was once personally thrown off of a film set by Mel Gibson. I forgot which movie it was, maybe Lethal Weapon or something, but he was there as an extra, playing a police officer, because he actually was a cop, and wanted to give acting a try, but then Mel Gibson came out, and noticed that my prof, along with a few other extras, was taller than him, escorted them to the exit, and yelled at the crew that no one taller than him is ever to be allowed on set with him. So I'm obviously super late, but I used to work at a very nice hotel on Vegas. I met countless stars, movie, and sports. The worst however is tied between Below Really and Usher. Both were just complete faking as holes. When I saw both it wasn't about a tip or anything it was just to see them. Bill just asked, are you my bellman? And then waved me off and said I fully expect you to unpack everything and leave. I will not be tipping nor talking. So that was a killer. Usher, this dude acted like he walked on water, like he pissed wine, and he was gold, like he expected paparazzi to be waiting for him when he got out of the car. He came back later with a few chicks and just ignored fuck all, and waved everyone off and just stated fuck you all, I'm not here for you mind you, it was like 3am and there were only two of us, we just kind of shrugged and said alright, and then watched him get pickpocketed in the lobby by the women. Klo Kardashian was another that just irritated me. Her fattest ugly Neanderthal looking as was riding in one of those scooters and guarding her like two gallon bag of weed. She was so just disgusting. I watched Paris Hilton show up drunk after EDC with Afrojack and watched her hockology on the carpet. Though some great notable people were Will Smith, Henry Winkler, God he was so nice, Jason Terry, surprisingly Rush Limbaugh, Kevin James, Marcus Lateral, Chris Pontius, Party Boy, Jonah Angel, Bribing Angel, Maynard James Keenan, Tool. He actually told us which bar he was going to be at, and if we ended up there he'd buy us drinks. He actually did, and was genuinely a really nice faking guy. Katie Couric. 
I worked at a pretty high-end fine dining restaurant in Charlottesville, that, where plenty of wealthy and famous people frequented pretty regularly. Most people were extremely nice and humble. My interaction with her left a bad taste in my mouth. It was graduation weekend there, which typically gets booked months in advance, and we had reserved for her one of our nicest tables available. We were insanely busy, completely overbooked and she was incredibly rude to me and the maitre d' and proceeded to cause a hysterical scene in the middle of one of our busiest services of the entire year. She even went so far to say, do you know who I am? We ended up accommodating her because we were absolute professionals and still aim our best to appease guests, but it was a major headache. It was kind of the icing on the cake for an already stressful, high pressure weekend. I know she's a UVA grad and felt extra entitled because she was a speaker for the weekend, but still anyone trying to use their stardom like that to sway others in such a nasty way really appalls me. I know this happens all the time, just made me lose a lot of respect for her. Edit, on the contrary Bruce Springsteen was an absolute saint. He was incredibly cool yet humble, very polite and easygoing. Louis Black was one of my favorites, he was an absolute riot in the best way possible. He came in with a small posse the night before he had a gig in town. He came in right before close, but that allowed him to have the whole place to himself, which was ideal in this case. He had a perfect balance of being outrageously funny and endearing whilst also being respectful and appreciative. He even bought the Wade staff a round of special dessert wine and even went so far as to getting his server a ticket for his show the following night. He was a hoot yet such a gentleman at the same time. There's this guy, called Alberto Angela, which every single university student in Italy fetishizes. He and his father, Piero, have an incredibly long career of high quality documentaries, and let's be honest, everyone who was born before 2005 probably saw a lot of them in school on TV. Everyone thinks they're these intellectual mythological figures who can do no wrong as they're so calm and respectable. Except Alberto is a complete faking as whole. Back when I was in high school, about 6 sevenths years ago, we were called up to be his sound engineers at one of his book presentations in a great theater in Turin. Show was obviously sold out, and this guy had literal fangirls who were there hoping to get a pic or an autograph. So we show up, set up our equipment and run a few tests with the theater sound engineer, when some girl comes out of the changing room with tears in her eyes, followed by Alberto himself a little later. We never figured out what that was about, but a few seconds later we were just watching him treat his tour manager, or whatever he was, like absolute sheet. He was just straight up insulting him, before turning his attention to the theater's SE. He got handed his swan mic, and walked out on stage. Needless to say, the facade went on as, before talking about his book, he spent like 10 minutes just talking about how much he loves helping out students with their studies. Show goes on as normal, we did our job just fine, we figure out we could do a little interview for our school's radio, if it's fine by him. So we ask the manager, and he tells us he'll ask after the show. Show ends, we pack up our stuff and we see the manager talking to him. He literally just faking walks to us with the most annoyed face I've ever seen, tells all three of us be a seer, Alberto which is just a polite introduction, and storms off. I mean, I understand pestering celebrities can be annoying, and we definitely didn't want to do that, but we were literally working for him for free, and we were the same exact students he was praising just an hour before. And besides that, he still treated everyone else in the staff like sheet anyway. So yeah, fuck Alberto and Jilla and fuck the myth around him. I've gotten so many insults from other people when I tell this story because they think I'm just cheating on him because I don't like him lmao, they just can't believe that. On a side note, we've done the same thing for an incredibly controversial politician slash journalist whose gimmick is just insulting people and generally being incredibly unpleasant, Vittorio Sgarbi. He was great. Dave East. I was like 18 and found him before he was even remotely famous and thought he was sick. Helped him out with studio dollar sign maybe like dollar sign 10k worth over a year or so. Eventually my parents caught wind and freaked out on me, one time actually answering my phone when Dave called asking about more money and told him he's a scum and took advantage of me and leave me alone. Like a year later I reconnected and tried helping again a little. 
sent him maybe just like dollar sign 2k and then he kept asking for more and at the time I was realizing how dumb and sketchy it seemed and I didn't want to blow all my money on helping him and hoping if he gets famous and I had a huge help in it I'd get rich. Long story short I blew him off after he kept hitting me up like one to two years later he drops black rose and the rest is history. Now he's super famous and rich, and I've tried reaching out to him a couple times and he's never once replied back. I was 17 to 18 sending this dude tons of money to record, because I knew he was good. And I was hoping, if if paid off, I'd make a lot of money. After I told him I couldn't help anymore with dollar sign he got all pissed off, and never talked to me again. Actual true story. We talked for years I know a shit ton about the dude. Happened back in 2015 slash 16 when we last spoke. I still have his number and sheet, but I don't try to reach out. And now I refuse to listen to his music lol. Oh, I had a very negative minor celebrity meeting once, not because of them, but one of their people. I went to a retro game convention to meet James Ralph, the angry video game nerd. It was a 2 hour drive, I got there an hour early, got in line, and was pumped. They brought us into a room to wait, and I'm right there near the front by the merchandise table being staffed by one of the screen wav media guys. Justin Silverman, who are in a lot of his videos now. He would not stop beaching at me and everybody within earshot about how much they all hate going to cons like this, how it's a waste of time, they don't make enough money, and that nobody wants to do it. Not James, not Mike, not any of them, and that if they weren't obligated to do it for promotional stuff they wouldn't ever. I had to listen to this guy tell a bunch of us how much they hate, that we want them to do things like this for 15 minutes straight, before I got to walk up, get a quick autograph and a photo, then get shuffled out the door. I hate that guy, because he took something I was excited about, and spent tons of energy making sure that the most vivid part of the experience was him telling me how much they all hate everything about this. I met Jason Segel at Teddy's in Hollywood with my best friend, when we were 22, and he was much older. He barely talked, wasn't nice or funny, but texted her a lot of really creepy things afterwards, and I wouldn't let her go to his hotel. He lived in a hotel, because he seemed like a total pervert. Like he didn't have to try, because of who he was. I haven't thought he was funny ever, since I just think he's sad and depressed. I met Ellen at the Ellen show when we were in the front row. My friends and I said we love you Ellen. And she stopped stared right at us with a disgusted look and walked off. I met Chelsea Handler my friend worked for her show. She was horrible to her staff. Cussed them out during commercial breaks, and when I had her sign a book for someone else and said thank you, she wouldn't look at me. But as for nice people, the nicest ever was Ryan Gosling. I was a background actor for extra money after just moving to La on one of his movies. It was a day he wasn't even working, but his mom was in town from Canada. He brought her to set just to introduce her to the crew he introduced her and hugged the hair and Mac you played is and said so many nice things. Steve Carroll was there too he didn't speak to anyone just did his lines and paced around silently in between. Courtney Cox was so nice she bought all of the background actors for the day ice cream. Jonah Hill used to come into the ad agency I worked at because he was best friends with a cow walker. He was the nicest, so funny and treated people better than any of our clients he genuinely wanted to know how everyone's day was etc point and sent gifts to my cow walker for days etc. I met Khloe Kardashian she was really nice and normal took a pic with us at the pool and then offered to take a pic of me and my friends. She was with Lama when they were married, he seemed nice. Jason Momoa used to come into my office he was very nice always in a good mood, loud and friendly. My friend and I met Owen Wilson we asked for a photo, because she's from Texas too, embarrassing to think about now, and he said no, but how about a hug. Chris Harrison came into my office, because he was lost, he was totally rude demanding directions with his hat pulled down, and didn't say thank you, when we tried to help him. I was a receptionist at the time at an ad agency. I met James Marsden at a bar watching college football he was really nice we talked about my college team and he was friendly and seemed fun. Vanessa Hudgens used to go to a cycling class I went to she seemed really nice always sat in the front and was super enthusiastic and in shape haha. 
I do security work, a bunch of them are assholes by normal standards, but I have become desensitized to noticing it in many ways. Rarely have a problem, it's just a job. But I don't have to do the eye work with celebrities and they are down to earth. Blah blah PR thing to keep it. But the fact I care nothing about pop culture, watch many movies slash sports or even personally own a TV means I don't know who the fuck half of them are. This is off one of them ever once in a while. Easier to answer. Nicest. Karen Gillan. It's my job to stay in the shadows and pay attention. She's nice and very funny. Reminds me of my own daughter so didn't feel like work so much compared to many. And my wife and girls are hovians, so I have contractual obligations to leave work at work, but have watched some of those and enjoyed seeing her work as, as an actress as well. Great cast in general really, I think, but haven't personally served as staff for any of them other than Ms. Gillen briefly. I'm a professional so everybody gets from pointer to be safely. Then I go home. I can say it's made me even less interested in the opinions of athletes and actors. And I didn't even know I had less facts to give about their opinions before that. They are just people, we all sit on a toilet once in a while like everyone else. And I'm one of the guys that will clobber anyone trying to take a photo of it. It's just abnormal all the way round. As if you couldn't love him more, pretty much everyone who talks about River Phoenix all say he was a massive sweetheart, would spontaneously go buy hundreds of dollars in food to cook and give to homeless people, complimented the sheet out of co-star he knew, was feeling insecure by constantly telling her she was so pretty, and was going to do so well in the film, was always cracking jokes, and messing around and just getting everyone to smile. Could be a little difficult, because he could be stubborn, but never really meant any harm in it, he was a kid for most of his career, and just stood, firm in his beliefs. Wouldn't take pictures of just him with his band, a leaker's attic. I'd recommend a listen honestly. Fair warning, pretty much of River's songs are some sort of cry for help, or just really concerning though, and wanted to include the entire group, went outside and just chilled talking to people. Love talking about the Beatles and RHCP of course. Absolutely hated Hollywood, and preferred to live away from it on his family's ranch. He'd talk about his roles, if asked about it, but only if he wasn't gushing over the entire film and talking about how characters changed his perception of things, and besides that, liked to focus more on music and playing it. It was one of the reasons he and Keanu Reeves had become such close friends. Keanu considered him his only Hollywood best friend in the early 90s even, and we know Keanu doesn't really do fake Hollywood stuff. They had such a good dynamic. Everyone seems to agree he was a really down to earth and passionate guy. Was really shy about getting recognized too. Super humble. Very quiet but very willing to make it known he greatly appreciated his supporters. And of course, extremely talented too. Really a tragedy he was gone so soon. He was definitely destined for greatness. Wherever that boy is now, I hope he's finally at peace. God knows he went through enough when he was alive. Billy Corgan of Smashing Pumpkins. I was a fan way back just after the release of Jish. Went to see Nirvana in Tokyo and managed to get backstage passes. While we were talking to Nirvana after the show, Billy and James walked into the backstage dressing room. I was wearing an in-shirt and immediately Billy Corgan made fun of me for it, not sure to this day why. He was very dismissive of us and bristled at any questions we had for him despite the fact that we recognized him and told him we were fans took a snapshot with him, and he said he was going to make a cool rock star pose for me as he was being honest to me. To this day, I wish I had just stopped caring the first moment he was mean, but in my twenties and starstruck at the fact that I was backstage with Nirvana and part of the Smashing Pumpkins, I was just quiet. Before I'm asked as I have told my met someone famous story here before. Kurt was quiet, pleasant and accommodating, but very distracted. Christ was the most engaged and was really nice. Talked with us and seemed genuinely interested in having a short conversation with us. His wife, girlfriend, though, was extremely annoyed that we were taking him from her. Dave Grohl literally was the last one in the dressing room. Proceed to strip out of sweaty clothes into something dry by taking them off right there in front of us. All while continuously saying, where are the chicks? We gotta go find the girls and was out the back door to a van before we could even get to say hi to him. 
That is my story. I have never met anyone famous since, except a few politicians. Justin Bieber and Selena Gomez. I was there the day she adopted Bela. Both behaved like typical snotty teenagers, with a heavy dollop of entitlement born of fame. They were dismissive of fans who happened to be around. It was all hush hush till after. I guess I would get tired of all the people wanting my attention too, though. Can't imagine being a kid with that much celebrity status. Another interaction I regret is Mark Pellegrino, Lucifer from SBN. I met him at a comic con in my city. He didn't interact, wasn't thrilled to be there, his panel was dry, and he seemed bored. The only real emotion he showed me was I like, being the first, when he signed my AKS sweater. Even the photo I have with him, he seems bored and uninterested. Meeting someone with that much fame really takes the stars out of your eyes. On the flip side, I met Cora Nemec, who I know more from SG1 than SBN. He liked my Tory slash Earth symbol tattoo. Also met David Hayden Jones, and he was as opposite from Arthur Ketch as a man could be. Total sweetie, loved my HP cosplay. Finally, met Jim Beaver, and if there ever was a man you could call pure sunshine, it's him. He is a very warm individual, and was genuinely happy to meet every person who came to see him. He gave me a bear hug. Robin Williams. He was drunk as a skunk, and mean as hell in a Las Vegas bar. Not a cool experience, and has colored my impression of him. I do still feel bad for the way he left us, no one should ever feel the need to inflict self-harm. On the other hand, Dave Mustaine, who gets a ton of sheet for his behavior and antics, was very kind to me, and my friends, and it was a pleasure to meet him. Ran into him on his birthday at a restaurant prior to a gig Megadeth was playing. He was walking by and our table wished him happy birthday, which prompted him to stop and say hello and chat with us for about a minute. Super genuine move, when he could have just kept walking, and not even acknowledge us at all. In a separate occasion with Mustaine, I was at a signing event after a concert, that we waited an hour for after a show. When I reached the table, someone from the production crew came to speak with Dave. A security guard began to guide me away from the table, to keep the line moving, and wasn't the nicest about it. Dave gave the guard some sheet for doing that, and called me back shook my hand, apologized, and took a photo with me along with signing my record. Two separate occasions that I think blow away my expectations of him. <laughs> Kerry Mabdoljabba. One of the biggest assholes I've ever encountered. Edit to include the story. Growing up every March a group of my dad's buddies would plan a trip to take all their sons, myself included, to one of the regionals of the NCAA men's basketball tournament. When I was 11, Kareem happened to be staying in the same hotel we were in, along with the Duke team and some other members of the media. Coming back from shooting hoops at a local gym, myself and three other kids 8 to 12 years old see Kareem hanging out in the lobby while waiting to do an interview with ESPN in the hotel bar. We grab a piece of paper and a pen from the front desk and politely walk over and ask him if he would mind signing our pieces of paper. Kareem looked at us, said after that, while motioning to the cameras setting up, and went back to whatever he was doing. We waited on a couch near the bar for almost two hours, while he did his interview, and hung around laughing and joking with the reporter afterward. As he gets up to leave, and starts walking back across the room toward the elevator, the four of us approach him again with pens in hand, to get the signatures he for some reason told us to wait for. He looks down at us, shakes his head and scoffs, and walks into the elevator without saying a word. It's worth noting that later that night, we saw Bill Walton at the arena. He had five sharpies sticking out of his sock ready to go for any kid who approached him asking for an autograph. Long story short fat Karim. Not shocked he raised a kid who'd grow up to stab his 60 year old neighbor in the skull. Does Tom Clancy count? Was at my usual bookshop when one of his books came out pre-9 over 11 era. I figured oh hey, I'll swing by and meet him. I wasn't a fan of his books, but what the hell, I at least knew the name. I met quite a few authors this way. He showed up in a flight suit, aviator glasses and strutted, like he parked his jet on the roof of the building. Mixed patches from multiple branches of the military. The man had never served a day in his life. Now, this was not far from the Pentagon, so there were actual military in presence. He got called out on his mismatched patching. 
For someone who writes so much about these things, you should know this. He threw off an arrogant so what? What do you know? The man stood up. Half the audience went quiet. Apparently, he was a significantly respected marine colonel. Informed Clancy of his mistakes. Offered to help Clancy. Clancy retorted with someone shut him up. My coffee frosted over with how absolutely chilly the room got. And one single calm sentence. There is a parking lot outside, if you wish to try. Clancy screamed I don't need this from the likes of you all. And left. Yeah. So fuck him. I looked his B.O. up. He had not one day of military service. Stolen valor people would have eaten him alive. All bark, no bite. One of the nicest celebrities I've ever met was Lynn manuel Miranda. As a teenager I loved his work on In the Heights, but had never had the opportunity to meet him, because I'm from the UK. When they brought Hamilton to London I wrote him a letter about how he inspired me to get into playwriting, and on the night of the first preview I asked a security guard if I could hand it into the theatre stage door. I went to the office and asked back quote please, could you give this to Lynn for me, and then this American voice from behind me said back quote hey sure, I'll take it now if you want. I turned around and there he was, he took my letter, winked and left. The next day he tweeted me about it, it went semi-viral, and it was just so wonderful. A couple of weeks later I was at the press night for the show and Lynn was on the stairs getting bombarded by celebrities who wanted a photo with the guy himself. I wanted to leave him to it, but my pal told him that I'd written him a letter a couple of weeks ago as he went past. He immediately stopped, gave me a hug and spoke to me about being a writer for about 5 minutes. It meant the world to me, there were so many celebrities there vying for his attention, and I was the smallest, most insignificant person in the room. The most humble lovely guy. Not an as whole, but strange famous dude. I was flying with my husband from LA to Las Vegas and there was this other dude seated in our aisle as we were boarding. The guy was a tall, balding middle aged guy who was pretty filled out you know, larger dude. He saw that we would be in his row, and kept chanting little in the middle, little in the middle, meaning he wanted me to sit next to him in the middle seat and not my, larger than me, husband. I was going to sit there anyway, because plain seats suck for bigger people, but this sorta put me off. At least it would be a short flight, so whatever. The dude would flirt really heavily with the flight attendant and she seemed up for flirting back. At one point she squeezed into our row, the exit row, and sort of sat on the man's lap, and he had his hands on her hips. I was pretty uncomfortable with all this as it was also happening very near me. The flight was super short, and as we were getting up to the plane, the man noticed my husband's shirt it was a parody of a Slayer logo that said Axe Slayer. My husband isn't a fan of Saved by the Bell, but liked the shirt so bought it. The dude in the aisle saw the script on the shirt and was like, Axe later, huh? So you'll like Saved by the Bell. And it clicked. The man was Mr. Belding. He was in town to be a celebrity at a marathon or something. His behavior made a little more sense after I knew who he was. He still seemed like a weirdo though. Steven Siegel. He was an ass. A friend of mine played on one of his albums and was going to play with Siegel's band for Siegel's birthday party. That's right, Siegel had his own band play at his own birthday party. Think the Vulture on Brooklyn 99. So my friend took me and a couple other people to LA. I was the only one who was not in the music business, I wasn't expecting any real attention, but a hello would have been nice. I sat all through a rehearsal, kinda playing mom the older blues players. Running across the street getting food, making sure they were comfortable. You know, things the host should have had someone doing. When my friend tried to introduce me to him after rehearsal, Siegel didn't say a word. He glanced in my direction and walked away. He was a dick to everyone at the party also. On the flip side, jump to an hour after Siegel's party. I get back to my friend's friend's house. The boys were in a hotel. I, at the time 24F. Stayed with their friends, wasn't enough room for everyone. I get there, and they ask if I would drive them to a house party that needed a DD. I said sure. I was in a floor length velvet black dress, they told me not to change. So we get there, and it was pretty cool. Huge house, huge rottweiler in the backyard, which also had a putting green and basketball court. Took me a while to figure out whose house it was, because he was out buying a bunch burgers for everyone. 
I rounded the corner in the kitchen and literally ran into Jamie Foxx's mixing frozen odge for drinks. He was super nice. He was a great host. He introduced himself to me, made some small talk, let me play with his dog. He did have a little laugh when I tied my dress between my legs. It had slits up each side to go run with the dog. He had a kicker's home studio. This all happened in 2002. TLDR Steven Seagal equals faking ass Jamie Foxx equals faking awesome. Mine was Barry Bonds. So in Marine Corps boot camp, San Diego, back in 2003 during the last week of boot camp they'd take the whole company to catch a pard raise game. They'd honor the whole company during the seventh inning stretch. But, the six platoon on a man including myself, humble brag, got to be honored on the field. In preparation, they bring you into the the visiting team's dugout during the sixth inning and sit you at the end of the bench. The Padres were playing the Giants that day, and Bonds was a guy that sat away from his teammates at the end of the bench when not in the field. Me being the furthest onto the bench, when the inning ends he sure enough comes and sits basically right next to me. Now, being in boot camp, and with my senior drill instructor being just feet away, we were to be sat at attention until summoned. Despite that, I decided to reach my hand out to Bonds, in full military uniform, and said something to the effect of pleasure team eat a legend such as yourself. Dude didn't even look at me. Hand basically in his lap in the height of post-9-11 bootlicking, and didn't even acknowledge me. We sat in silence for the rest of the half of that inning, before we went out onto the field. Senior D berated me for it later, but that was all that came of it on that side. I had a fantastic senior D. Some performers have in their contract that there will be a doctor available. One of the best side gigs I've ever had. I would hang out backstage and occasionally see performers or their staff for medical stuff. I don't really pay attention to popular culture, so I often had no idea who people were and would mistake the main performer for the crew if they hadn't gotten all decked out yet. Katy Perry's sister was the worst person I had to deal with. She had the whole don't you know who I am thing going on. Catty was great though. Really personable and friendly one time. I ate dinner with a guy who was really interesting and I thoroughly enjoyed hanging out with him. Later at the show I saw him on stage and realized he was Elton John's drummer. I was once walking down the hall and there was a guy playing the guitar with 4 to 5 people crowded around him and they were blocking the hall. I was annoyed and was tired and kind of grumpy. I said excuse me, you guys are blocking the hall and sort of elbowed my way past them. Turned around and my wife had stopped and was talking to the guy playing the guitar. She was all googly eyed and jiggly, which is so unlike her. It was Tim McGraw I elbowed my way past. I probably owe him an apology. I really like Josh Groban. Very humble and polite. So many of them just seemed exhausted when I would see them. To see them turn on the energy when they were performing was impressive. I met M.O. Willems at a book signing that I didn't buy his book, having known nothing about his career in children's books and everything about his career in animation with the offbeats and sheep in the big city. When I mentioned that I was a fan of sheep in the big city, he mentioned that I was half of the audience who actually watched that show. I also met Ari Aster at a screening and no one noticed him because no one knew what he looked like. I didn't have much to say to him, but I had my friend text me if he had any new movie ideas after going to therapy, and he just nodded along. I don't have many stories with famous people I don't regret meeting, but here's a few that I'm glad I met. Steve Buscemi is one of the nicest people I've ever met. I've seen him three times and spoke to him twice, and each time I spoke to him, I asked him for a book recommendation. He recommended You Can't Win by Jack Black and Junkie by William S. Burroughs. I met Kyle MacLachlan at a wine tasting right before I had to catch a flight that I missed but got a new one and he signed my framed copy of the picture of Laura Palmer and the wine. I had to throw the wine out before boarding the plane. Mike Love from the Beach Boys, believe it or not, given his reputation as one of the most arrogant frontmen, was nothing but a gentleman when I met him, and he signed both my copy of Sunflower, to which he also wanted his son who was on the cover to sign it as well, and looking back with love. I met Mark Maron when he was with Lynn Shelton at screening of Sword of Trust, and we had a really powerful heart to heart and Lynn Shelton was an inspiration to me. 
Jack Lemmon was a faking dick to me when I was 18. I was at an event that my dad got me into, and it was fairly star-studded. And I saw Lemon, and was kind of in awe of him. I was a young actor, and was just getting into older movies, and I think I'd maybe just recently seen some like it hot, so I loved him. I screwed up my courage, and walked up to him and said, Mr. Lemon, I don't want to bother you, sir, but I'm a big fan and I just wanted to say hello and thank you for all your great work. In retrospect, it's hard to be too mad at him for his response. His eyes were red-rimmed, he looked tired and bored, and the woman he was with, I'm assuming his wife, seemed pissed or cold or something. Seemed like maybe they'd just had a fight. Anyway, I didn't read the room all that well. But in any case, he looked dead at my offered hand, then up at my face, and said very clearly, and in that unmistakably lemon voice and manner, fuck off, will ya, kid? Well, I faked off. Pretty crushed I was. Then I went to sit down, it was a movie premiere, and in the row in front of me was Kiefer Sutherland, and he chewed my ear off for 15 minutes about movies, theater, acting, the business, whatever. Completely ignoring his smoking hot date, by the way. In retrospect, again, I'm entirely aware that Kiefer was probably coked to the gills. He was talking at light speed, loudly and with immense confidence, that sort of cokey I can stop the sun with my words confidence, and he was still talking to me as the lights were going down, I practically had to shush him. Nevertheless, he was so nice to me. To this day, one of my best celebrity encounters immediately followed my absolute worst. I used to work as a theatre tech in a venue, where lots of comedians would use us to try material, before going out to larger arenas. Mostly nice with odd quirks, but generally people who were doing jobs like anyone else. Some exceptions. Mitchell McIntyre was an absolute dick. Root, pompous and professionally in as whole. Dom Jolly refused to go back on stage for his second half, until we removed the specials, that kept making noise. We had some disabled audience members in, but in every other situation the acts got in with it, and it was never an issue. Richard Herring was incredibly obnoxious, because we collected for our Save Our Theatre campaign at our door, something that had been knocked with his management. Absolute highlights include Alan Kerr, when he found out my parents were in, he asked their names, and came back with an autograph for them as he knew they'd driven 100 plus miles for the show. After the show he still remembered their names, and said to send them his love. Lee Evans was as sweet and as shy as you'd think, and I got quite thoroughly pissed with Miriam Margolis. Paul Sinap, lovely. John Richardson, incredibly quiet. And finally Greg Davis takes the award for being one of the loveliest, faking hilarious men I've ever met. I was the Az. So I'm a pilot. First job was a flight instructor. The first airport I worked at was a small field in Canada, and they decided to shoot a bunch of scenes for the film about Amelia Rear at their starring Richard Gere and Hilary Swank. I used to own this way over the top brown leather bomber jacket, thought I was ace McCool at the time, and since that plus my uniform was a pretty timeless look, my buddy and I decided to walk out to the middle of the field where they were shooting and see how long it took to get kicked off the set. As I suspected, we were able to walk around all day schmoozing with the extras, getting in the way of the director mid-shoot by accident, eating lunch for free at the craft service table, and generally being dumb 20 year olds. Then came my shining moment. Richard Jair had just finished a scene, and was walking towards us. My hands fumbled for my then not so smartphone to take a photo and my mind raced for the right thing to say. As he walked by, the only thing my socially awkward brain could think of was cold enough for your Richard. He looked momentarily at me in disgust, then continued past in silence. Yep. I commented on the weather in Canada. Two thumbs up for me. I later soothed my ego by having a brief but pleasant chat with Hilary Swank who was nothing short of lovely and hated her character's short blonde hair though with a burning passion. She was incredibly professional and even learned the proper start sequence to fire up the vintage by plane she was flying for the scene. I had a major pilot crush on her for that lol. Anyways, me. I was the American Samoa 100%. To this day my buddy continues to enjoy recounting the tale of my cringe-worthy brush with Stardome. Not really a famous person, but the singer of Dream Theater, James Labrie. 
I met him in 2008 and my dad, and I drove 8 hours to see them, and waited 2 hours in line, to meet them at a signing that afternoon. I was a big fan in high school, and my dad is the best. I was so excited, when it was my turn. Got some signatures, said hey to Mike Portnoy. John Petruxi asked me where my seats were, all those little interactions meant the world to me. Then I said hey to James Labry and he signed my drum skin while ignoring and not responding to my hey and slid the skin to the next guy. Not a single second of acknowledgement or eye contact. Rest of the band was great, but his robotic approach kinda bummed me out. While waiting for a friend I watched him repeat the same carelessness to the next few folks too. Every other band member was very nice and engaged though. Ironically around 2010 my own band got a little bit of fame in Canada for a quick run, and we ended up in a few situations where we were doing signings just like that one and I never forgot it. It was my reminder to try and take in every single interaction. Lastly, one of the nicest I ever met was JB Smoove, curb your enthusiasm. I ended up seated next to him at a basketball game, and he chatted me and my bandmates up. We sang the Canadian anthem at this basketball game, so we got great seats. He was so funny, we asked for a picture and he rounded up his wife and daughter. He was just like Leon, Curb, in real life. One of the best days ever for me as I'm a huge Curb fan. My first job out of high school was at a small local hardware store. Craig Biggio was a semi-regular customer there, and would come in, to buy stuff for small home fixes, etc. I think he liked coming there, because the staff never bothered him, and we always treated him like a normal person. My grandmother was a huge Astros fan, and when she found out Baguio came into the store she made me promise to get an autograph for her. Sometime later Baguio comes in, and as I was checking out I told him, hey, I'm sorry to ask, but my grandmother found out you come here, and says I have to get an autograph for her. Sorry. He was real cool about it, saying, I get it. Gotta do what grandma says. I handed him a piece of paper, he signed it, and that was that. A friend of mine worked at a local grocery store that apparently Big EO and his wife shopped at. The funniest thing was that apparently she would make him sign baseball cards to give to people who would talk to them. Someone would strike up a conversation, she'd talk with them while pulling a baseball card out of her purse and making him sign it, which he dutifully did without remark. I thought that was so funny, because apparently his wife did all the talking and he'd just stand there smiling, shake hands and sign cards, etc. Later my grandmother realized she'd misplaced her autograph, and told me to ask for another one, and I told her no. The biggest as by far would have to be on Ray Roo. He stayed at the hotel, and had a novel worth of demands. Here are just a few, he had two deluxe. Basically mini apartment, rooms just for him, another for his violin, and three more for the on-duty security. Every other room on the executive floor was to remain empty. No staff, bar the hotel manager, were to step upon that floor, so Andre didn't have to feel like he was sharing. The next floor down had every room booked also, where the rest of his crew and ensemble were packed, in like sardines on camp stretchers. Every morning he had a breakfast selection brought to the staff lift well, his assistants would collect from there, so Andre didn't need to interact with the help with 6 types of bread, 10 types of jams, plus other assorted spreads, 2 toasters, home style, it was specified, not a commercial one, a selection of fruit, another selection, sliced die to wedges, a third selection diced, such as that he could create a fruit salad, 10 types of specific cereal, already in bowls. Plus the boxes in case he wanted extra, including one cereal only available imported from the US. Plain yogurt, vanilla yogurt, fruit yogurts, a tray each of bacon, hash browns, cooked mushrooms, eggs, scrambled, fried, poached, and three each of soft, medium and hard boiled, labeled as such, plus a heap more. Basically our entire extended breakfast buffet and menu, brought up on trolley tables, for him to pick from. If he was hungry, at least once, it was returned and wasted, unto shade. When Mr. Roo entered the hotel, the only staff present should be the hotel manager. All other staff had to drop their work and basically hide, because he really didn't want to see the commoners. Oh, and that faking violin, get this. 
had a selection of classical music played from CD on repeat in its room. Buggered if I know why. To get it in the mood? There was a laundry list of flower arrangements that had to be prepared and placed in his room and others, and it was specific. So specific that the first day, when one of the flower types wasn't right, he sent his assistant down to throw a tantrum for him and throw the wrong flower arrangement in front desk's face. Couldn't even lower himself to throw his own tantrum. Lisa Langer. I used to like her a lot. She was a nation who made it big in the west so for many Asians we were proud of her. She came to my country for a musical recently, and she was obviously the star of the show. After the performance a large group waited at the stage door as always, to try to get the autograph and a picture. This is a very normal thing in the musical theater scene. We waited. And wait. And waited. The other cast members came out, and we got all the pics and autographs. An hour later she still hasn't left the theater. The crowd thinned as it was getting late. About two hours later I was the last one standing. Even I had called it quits. I hailed an Uber and was waiting for it to come. Pickup point was next to the stage door. Suddenly I heard the door slam open behind me. Lo and behold the superstar was here. I rushed to her with big smiles and very happy that I finally got to meet her. But she had a long face and pretended not to know what I was talking about when I asked for an autograph. She reacted as if I was some annoying salesperson on the streets, except it was near midnight, and it was outside the stage door, and she is probably used to this after her decades in musical theater. Then she suddenly changed her tune from pretending that she didn't know what I wanted, picture and autograph, to snapping rudely at me and saying fine, this better be quick, because there's somewhere else I want to be. I was taken aback, but still trying to keep my smile. So I asked for just a picture, and didn't dare to ask for the autograph. She then walked away promptly after the photo, and started shouting commands at another person, whom I can only assume, is her assistant or helper. The whole time I felt, like she was just rude as a person, and not that friendly sweetheart she or most celebrities try to portray. This meeting definitely left a bad taste in my mouth. I no longer respected her after this incident. Sure she has no obligations to be nice and entertain all her fans, but it's not an excuse for her to pretend to be ignorant nor rudely snap at others. You wouldn't do that to a random stranger regardless of whether you are a famous person or not. Even if you are in a hurry to elsewhere and cannot accommodate a minute to take a picture and sign an autograph, just one fan, a simple I'm sorry, I'm in a hurry to somewhere else as I'm late for my next scheduling, would be enough for fans who are usually understanding people too. They say never met your heroes. I now know why. Not going to name her, but was working at a tennis tournament a long time back, and one of my jobs was creating player passes. This was when you still took a mini Polaroid, cut it out, stuck it on a pass, and then encapsulated it. Was the day before the tournament opened, and as often happened, all the players came in around the same time, so I took their picks, and then asked them to come back in half an hour. Absolutely all of them were fine with that, and we are talking about the top men tennis players in the world at that time, guys like Sampras, Hewitt, Henman, Rafter. However, one player, who wasn't even playing in the tournament, it was a men's tournament, comes in and she demands an all areas pass. Usually that's a no no, if you're not actually playing, but given who she was, I said no problem, took her photo, and asked if she would come back in half an hour as I had a ton of player passes to do. What do you mean, don't you know who I am? Said of course I did, but that I had to prioritize the passes for the people actually playing in the tournament as some of them had warm ups and qualifiers soon, and they would need their passes to get into the locker room. Really? You're gonna keep me waiting. Why don't I tell the tournament director you want to keep me waiting? I said go ahead. So she heads to the TD, who tells her she has to wait for the exact reason I told her. She walks off in a half. Comes back to me about 15 minutes later, and says it had better be ready. Of course, it wasn't, so I made her wait. She stood there fuming and cursing, much to the amusement of one of the aforementioned male players who was there to get his pass. When it was ready, I handed her the pass and she grabbed it from my hand, and as she did dug her nails into my skin. You won't be making me wait again. Aforementioned male player was even more shocked than I was, and said I needed to inform the TD. 
Said I would, but didn't. However I have never forgotten what a nasty piece of work she was. Adolf Hitler. Now, that's from a friend. She's born in 1930 in Austria and yes, she's still alive. In 1938, Hitler annexed Austria, integrating it into the German Reich. Her mother took her as a little girl on that day, where Hitler arrived in Vienna. There are many pictures of that day, some even show her in the background. As Hitler left the car, he shaked some hands with important people, then he came across her, and she gave him a flower, that her mother prepared. He took it, shaked her hand, and said something, like you are a nice little girl. Back then, it was very special for her to meet Hitler directly, but you can think how bad it was when WW2 was over and she learned which horrible crimes he committed. I asked her many times how this felt, meeting Hitler himself, he wasn't terrifying at all, he wasn't a monster or something like that, he wasn't like a killer, he was there relaxed and easy, no wonder. Because for him, it was a great success, getting Austria for his empire there. He wasn't that mad hat a speech guy, like we see him when holding a speech. There was never anything she could have done to prevent what was coming later. A 8 year old girl standing against Hitler is something for fairy tales and movies, but not for reality. I have worked in an industry which has seen me meet over 400 celebrities over the years, some I have hung out with for dinners and drinks. I can honestly say, the ones I heard negative interactions about generally seemed kind when I met them, and I personally have not encountered anyone who has been unkind, but I have had instances when people have clearly had a long day and are tired. For example, Robert England who plays Freddy Krueger was amazing when I first meet him, but when I saw him again later the same day he didn't even look up or acknowledge my presence when signing a photo of us together, I did not take it personally, we'd both be working several hours, and from what I understand, has arthritis in his hands. I have heard a lot of stories from people I work with in the industry their experiences with particular people who were not kind such as Val Kilmer, Jack Nicholson and Charisma Carpenter, but in regards to the latter I have heard great stories about her too, and I think people need to understand that these people are humans too, and they are allowed to be human, and have human reactions and emotions, that does not necessarily mean they are bad people. I had a great time meeting Patrick Stewart, but know someone who had a seemingly negative experience, the reason being that they asked something of him that was unreasonable, and he reasonably declined, nicely. That soured their experience with him, but it was his right to say no. I've heard a lot of things about William Shatner, but I had a great experience with him. Even Adam Baldwin and Kevin Sorbo were kind in person, and I find their personal views and opinions abhorrent. We live in an age where connectivity with those we admire from afar is now as close as a press of a button. Gone are the days where you send a letter and hope for a response. You can see interactions and responses in real time on social media now. I believe there is a warped sense of entitlement behind a lot of fandoms, and they demand attention from celebrities that they are not entitled to, they do not owe you their time just because you're a fan. Take for instance Jensen Ackles and Jard Padalecki. The supernatural fandom is intense, and they have quite literally been sexually assaulted in photo booths by fans. The inappropriate grabbing and touching led to restrictions in photo booths that removed hugs, and at times even touching at all, for the literal safety of the celebrity and people getting mad about it, and blaming the celebrity, and calling them stuck up. No, blame the fans for lack boundaries, and forget these are real people too, not just characters in a show. Look at the Outlander and Castle fandoms, who would target who the main stars were dating slash married to in real life, and send those people literal death threats, because their favorite characters are not dating each other or them, so they take it as a delusional affront to their version of reality. That's not normal, if you're a fan of someone you should respect, and love the people they choose to love. When you've had Carrie Fisher getting marriage proposals and inappropriate attention from delusional fans to the point where she had to stop doing fan conventions in the USA out of safety concerns and celebrities being literally murdered and sexually assaulted by so-called fans, you can not blame any of them for keeping their guards up or having a bad day. We all have them. They are entitled to them too. Edit. I'm on my phone. There will be errors. I met a B. Trice, rapper, since he was the neighbor of a guy I was doing an ancient art deal with. 
After I got done packing up everything and loading it into my car, I said something along the lines of man your neighbors are having a hell of a party at 2pm on a Thursday. He then said that he was used to it and said he was a famous rapper. After giving him that no sheet, look he asked me if I wanted to meet him. I said yes and we went into the backyard and the guy called a be over since he was chilling with his entourage out back. He was super chill and didn't seem put out at all talking to a fan. This was before all the shooting of his girlfriend's son stuff. I also met Kid Rock while I was parking cars at an event. He pulled up in a rolled white convertible with long horns on the grill. I think it was a Pontiac maybe? But anyway I showed him where to park and he beached about it. Then told me not to touch his car since it was worth more than me. I shrugged and went back to what I was doing and he yelled about not looking at him when I, he was talking to me. I just ignored him since he was a year. Cool car though. This is gonna make me look like an as myself because the person that I have less than nice stuff to say about is revered as a saint these days. But, Carl Sagan. Story 1. A few decades ago, late 80s, I was a cadet at one of the military service academies in the US. Specifics are irrelevant to the story. Carl Sagan visited us and gave a speech. We were also excited to hear what he had to say. Except, he basically spent 80% of his speech telling us that we are nothing more than killers in training for the American war machine. Like, okay, cool, you're entitled to your opinion, but if you hate us so much then why get a gig to come here and give a speech in the first place? For the record, my own feelings on American imperialism have changed significantly since I was 18 years old, but I still have far more tact than to accept a speaker fee to talk to some military people and then proceed to sheet all over them for 45 minutes on their dime. Story 2, a couple of years after this, early 90s, I had an ex who was an undergraduate student at Cornell, where Sagan was a professor. The guy she was dating at that time was in some fraternity there. One day, he and his frat brother said, hey, maybe we should invite Professor Sagan to dinner here sometime. So they shot off a quick letter to him on fraternity letterhead. And asked if he'd like to come by Friday night for steak and a beer. He sent a letter back, tersely informing them that $10,000 was his starting rate for attending any dinner function. None of this is intended to detract from the awesome work he did as a science educator. All I'm saying is that, in person, he was arguably more of a jerk than you might believe, based on his public persona. I was an extra on a crappy romantic comedy that went to DVD, I'm not sure if it was ever in theaters. Anyway, I got to meet Jake Gyllenhaal, Jessica Biel, Catherine Keener and Paul Reubens. Jessica was a total sweetheart, as was Catherine. Paul was freaking hilarious. Had us laughing between takes. Jake, kinda a jerk. Definitely knew he was the star and could get away with anything. For one scene he had to keep busting in the doors of the Capitol Senate chamber, which was actually the SC State House. In the early 2000s South Carolina was seen as Hollywood of the East, Atlanta Georgia now holds that title. So between takes he's talking to us slash the extras about how sheety and hot as balls are P.O. Dunk status. I mean I get it, your cast and crew are from LA, but all the extras in your movie are from this area. This went on and on for hours by the way, the extras aren't permitted to speak to the talent unless spoken to it might throw them off their game. So he's not actually speaking to us more to himself just loud enough for us to hear. Point proven as one extra spoke back and was informed I wasn't talking to you. The extra was then asked to leave the set by a nearby crew member. I say it went on for hours because we had to redo the same scene over and over because dude couldn't get his lines right. Jessica nailed hers every time, lol, that happened to be the name of the movie. But Jake, ugh 13 hours on set one day for that one scene. And it wasn't cute, like you see on DVD outtakes of someone messing up a line and everyone laughing, it was mostly groaning and cursing under their breath. Maybe quit talking sheet about the filming location, where I happen to live, and focus on your job. This will get buried I'm sure but... I'm not a wrestling fan at all but I used to love it when I was a kid. One night my brothers and I camped out overnight to be first in line to meet Mick Farley Aka WWE World and Tag Team Champion at the time, Mankind. I was maybe 10 years old. After waiting 10 hours, 
he finally arrives. I ended up being third in line behind my brothers, and by that time, had several hundred people waiting in line behind us. I walk up and tell him I'm such a huge fan and all that. He's unfazed and just asks for my name so that he can sign the little poster thing they give you. The problem is that 10 year old me had a speech impediment that made it very difficult to say my own name especially when nervous. I give him my name. He says huh. I try again and am met with a what? And this time he didn't even try to hide his annoyance. Thankfully my brother catches what's going on and finally tells him. Phew. Embarrassing but I got what I came for. Right? We got home all admiring our autographs from one of our favorite wrestlers. He signs all of them too. Name. Mr. Socko. McFarley kinda funny that he includes the Socko signature. I take a closer look at mine too. Name misspelled in a ridiculous way apparently how he heard me pronounce it the first time. Mr. Socko. Socko. I immediately started to tear up. I was so sad and embarrassed. I waited 10 hours to get an autograph from my favorite wrestler, only to get a horribly embarrassing memory in the words Mr. Socko, Socko on a poster, addressed to a name that doesn't exist anywhere in the world I'm sure. Alan White, the drummer from Yes was always drunk every time I met him. Chris Squaw was always a nice guy. Tony Levin is an amazingly nice guy. Abby N. Ballou is an amazingly nice guy. Bill Bruford was super funny and amazingly open. He has a cocky sense of humor. Really love that guy. Pete Townsend was by far one of the sweetest celebrities I ever met and had an amazing memory. All of the guys from the Smithereens are nice although their bass player, Mike, is a little weird because he's shy and doesn't like people. But he will sit out front and greet guests. Pat, the lead singer was nice but always distracted. His death was too soon. David Bowie's guitarist, Reeves Gabrell was not a pleasant guy. Ron Wood was pleasant, but not social. Elliot Easton, from the cars actually screamed at me over the phone. Andy Summers just lied and said he was his own assistant. The guy who produced one of my bands, Jim Warren, was also the sound man for Peter Gabriel and Crowded House, but his main gig was being Radiohead sound man and he produced their single High and Dry. That's the longest one of my bands has worked with somebody who is famous aside from the other band that worked with Adrian Ballou. <laughs> Went to college in LA in the late 90s, worked as a parking attendant at Hollywood events, and even had a couple stars actively in school with me. Jamie Lee Curtis drove up in a drop top shouting I'm Jamie Lee Curtis, expecting me to just fling open the parking gates for her then looked incredibly deflated and slightly upset when I just blankly stared at her and said that'll be five dollars ma'am. Ten tenths would do again Paul Reiser pulled up in a murked out BMW M5, my dream car at the time. I was too focused on the car to notice him at first, then I looked up and said, hey, aren't you that famous guy? Nice car. Being a super nice and funny guy he quickly replies, well obviously not famous enough. The name's Paul and proceeds to talk about beamers with me for a few minimums. Cool guy. Shaq. I flashed him a peace sign he flashed me one back. That's it. Baron Davis, super chill and down to earth guy, would have conversations with anybody, and was always cool and funny when I'd run into him on campus. Even sat near him on a southwest flight once, jokingly asked him why, aren't you in first class, he. Jokingly responded, it's southwest, every seat is first class. Jaleel White, aka Steve Urkel, played the goofy nerd on Family Matters, but made up for it by being a conceited prick in real life who thought he was better at basketball than he really was. Folks hated to play with him in pickup games because he'd never pass the rock, just drive to the hoop with fancy doubles and unnecessary crossovers that would end in a layup or a brick. His castmates also attended the same school, but were the polar opposite of him, and made an effort to separate themselves from him. Matt Stone and Tree Parker, the creators of South Park came to a small creative media class I was in, and took questions from the entire class. South Park was just starting to really blow up, and I was fascinated by their perspective and animation workflow. Super intelligent and down to earth guys who were totally open and willing to share their knowledge and experience with us, much appreciated. Spice One, my favorite rapper of all time, 
Boarded a southwest flight to seats behind me drunk as fuck with the biggest bodyguard I'd ever seen, steadily shouting, blap, blap, biddy bye bye, we pop in bottles in this beach. I was too awestruck to say anything, as he proceeded to pop a bottle of champagne in that raggedy beach, true to his word. Bunch of other small interactions with famous folks, but it seriously made me sick of LA and the attention seeking herd mentality of it all. Crazy how some people would kill to move to LA and rub shoulders with the stars, but they're all just humans too. Personality defects and all. Roger Federer. I was in Lisbon, Portugal having dinner with my friend, let's call him Bob. When Bob notices Federer across the way, it's a pretty small establishment. Federer is there with his wife, and one other person, maybe his manager, I personally have little interest, but Bob is obsessed with tennis and a huge Federer fan. Like he's Bob's tennis god and inspiration as a player himself. Bob proceeds to fret over whether or not to ask for an autograph. I say go for it. Figuring nothing ventured nothing gained. Bob says he'll think about it. So as we finish our dinner, Bob notices that the Federer party is also finished and decides to make his move. On the way out of the restaurant, as we pass his table, he pauses and respectfully expresses his deep admiration and also for an autograph. He did it very discreetly, that is not like a stereotypical loud American. Federer thanks him for his support and says he would be happy to sign an autograph outside the restaurant when they leave. So Bob and I wait outside the restaurant. Bear in mind it's the dead of winter, quite cold and dark 15 minutes go by, Bob is stoked still, I'm freezing. I tell Bob I'm going to a bar across the way for a drink. Another 30 minutes go by as I enjoy a nice glass, or two, of port. Surprised that Bob hasn't joined me, I pay my tab and head back into the cold. Bob is still waiting, I told you, big fan. Federer is still inside the restaurant. They haven't ordered anything more, and are just chatting. At this point Bob and I are thinking likely this isn't going to work out. We agree to wait for another 15 minutes. In the end we return to the hotel. No autograph for Bob. Now, here's my thing. If Federer had said really appreciate you as a fan, no autographs tonight, Bob would have been happy, no harm done. But he basically promised to give Bob an autograph, and then didn't follow through. Pretty crap behavior in my opinion. And I think just the emotional roller coaster Bob went on from excitement to sadness really pissed me off as his friend. In the end Bob let it go, he's still a fan. But to this day I actively root against Federer anytime I know he's playing. I've had a bunch of random celebrity run-ins at airports and bars. None of them stick out in my mind as particularly negative. I guess I've been lucky. A-Rod wasn't incredibly friendly, but he still took a pick. So I guess he wasn't a total prick or anything. Here are a few of the ones that stick out as the nicest of all. Met Butch Patrick, Eddie Munster, at an airport. We were sitting on a bench together, putting our shoes back on when I recognized him, and his eyes kind of lit up when I asked him for a picture. Incredibly nice guy. Met the late, great John Dunsworth, Mr. Lahey from Trailer Park Boys, at a meet and greet thing before one of his stage shows. Spent tons of time hanging out with my boyfriend and I. Told corny jokes. He felt like an old friend. Ivan from Five Finger Death Punch came into the bar I managed. I didn't know who he was, but it was the end of the night. He was buying drinks for my staff and seemed sincerely interested in learning about their lives. His music sucks and he's abusive to women, but he was a fun guy to hang with for an hour or two and seemed to love that we had no idea who he was. Met Rowdy Roddy Piper after he did a storytelling spoken word gig at a club, and he was ridiculously sweet to me, signed a bunch of my stuff, gave me a big old hug. I'll let him keep my sharpie because he didn't remember to bring one. This is the opposite of majority of the post on here, but thought I'd share. Met Carrie Walsh Jennings at the Bozeman airport a few years back. My father and I were at the baggage claim waiting for our bags, and out of the corner of my eye I see a taller woman surrounded by a ton of kids giving out autographs, saying hello, etc. I knew instantly it was Carrie. Being an athlete I've always looked up to growing up, I thought it was really cool how nice she was to the kids. Once done saying hello to all the kids, she came up next to my father and I, and asked how we were doing. I said great. Isn't this pretty far from the beach? 
Really cool that she actually engaged the conversation. I didn't bring anything up about her time in the Olympics or her stardom. I thought that she wanted to be treated like a normal human being, which I think she enjoyed. We talked for 5 ish minutes about horseback riding and Montana in general till our bags came. Kerry was the nicest professional athlete I've ever met. I'm glad I met her childhood idol and a plus that she lived up to my high expectations. I can finally answer a question. This is one of my most embarrassing moments of my life to date. I met the band All Time Low one year on Halloween after they played in a small music venue in my city. They came into my bar for some food afterwards. Some of our servers were actively freaking out in the back. Customers were wanting pictures and autographs, and I'm like. So I'm making conversation with them, asking them how the show was, and I ask them are you like a local band? This was after their hit song Dear Mariah, Count Me In had come out, and they had a song in a Tim Burton film. I just lived under a rock, and had fallen out of the pop punk music scene, which I previously loved this is the worst part of it all. But they were super cool about it. Absolutely no rude behavior, they were just like no, our name is all time low, and I was like alright awesome, I'll check your stuff out. Great tippers. I chased the customers away from them, so they could eat in peace. I then went home, listened to their music, fell in love, and my soul momentarily left my body when I realized what a irreversible mistake I had made. TLDR, all time low are all super legit guys, very down to earth. Ten tenths would accidentally meet again, and this time not make an asshole out of myself. I met Justin Bieber when I was in 5th grade. Well, I use that term loosely. He went to my dad's jewelry store while in my city on a stop for his tour to buy some earrings, presumably for his then girlfriend, Selena Gomez. This was Halloween night, and as a kid, my mom would take my brothers and me to my dad's store to trick or treat, but in reality it was just to show off our costumes more like. Anyways, we walked in, and the store was completely empty other than my dad, Justin Bieber, the salesman working with him, who still works for us, love that guy, and Bieber's entourage. First of all, before I even got there, he called my 50 year old dad stupid for not immediately knowing. That he was Justin Bieber, he got a phone call that a very important guest was coming to his store, but Bieber was not named for security purposes. He walked in, and there was some I think that's Justin Bieber commotion around the office. So my dad goes up to him and asks Justin, and Bieber doesn't turn around. So my dad asks again, Justin? Bieber turns around, but doesn't say anything. My dad finally says you are Justin Bieber, aren't you? He retorts, you say my name, and you ask a question. I don't answer stupid questions. My dad acted very gracefully, saying well, I'm, my dad's name, and I wanted to welcome you to, the store's name. He is looking at this beautiful pair of earrings, and now we'll flash forward to when I walk in. I do not acknowledge, that he is there. Even at 10 years old, I recognize that pop stars don't want preteen girls swarming them. I go, hug my dad, and start talking to him, meanwhile wearing a costume that is supposed to be Animal from the Muppets. It was a burgundy costume outfit with a tutu with Animal's face on the chest, and, as if on cue, everybody in the entourage looks up from their phones. Bieber snatches his credit card from the salesman and starts walking out. Someone from the entourage tells my dad no pictures in a very serious tone. We all say that's fine. Meanwhile, Bieber is two feet away from my mom. She says can you at least say hello to my daughter? He kept on walking, didn't even acknowledge I was there. That night, I threw out my Justin Bieber cardboard cute out. I only went to his concert the next night because I had promised my best friend I'd take her. I've learned to like his music since, but since then, his image is forever marred to me. This past winter, while working in my dad's store for some extra money, I ask. Miriam Faithful was sweet and kind and funny. I had to drive quite a ways to her gig and was super early. She saw me sitting outside and came and talked for a while. After the concert, I was in line for the bathroom and just as I was about to walk in a stall, she came flying in and said, oh god please I have to go oh it's you. She lit up with a smile and I of course I'll let her go in front of me. Got kind of yelled at by Lemmy. 
I worked in the same building as his record company, and I was on the elevator with him several times. I didn't know who he was, just that he usually kind of smelt and always looked sort of angry. I was 19 and very shy. One day we were on the elevator just the two of us. I was sort of pressed up against the wall opposite. He said, you think I'm ugly don't you? I said back quote no I don't. Then he said back quote why, are you so far away from me over there? Are you afraid of me? I said no and just shrugged and got off as soon as the doors opened. I avoided being on the same elevator with him after that. But the biggest jerk I ever met was Norman Mailer. He was always rude and didn't give a crap what anyone thought about him. Howie Long. My sister had a crush on him back in the 80s. We hung out near the entrance to the Raiders locker room after a playoff game. He walks by, my sister starts yelling Howie 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 and running towards him. He completely ignores her, bumps into her, and sends her flying. One of the safeties for the Patriots, can't remember who, saw this and picked her up and told us to wait a minute. He disappeared and came back shortly with the Patriots pennant signed by the entire team. Pure class. Runner up is Dennis Rodman. Ran into him at Garduno's at the Palms in Vegas. My brother is a huge Rodman fan and I wanted to get his autograph. He wouldn't even acknowledge anyone, and one of this crew said it's gonna cost me $50 for him to sign anything. We went back to our meal, and later Rodman walks up and says he's ready to sign if I have the cash. I decline and he and his crew start getting all worked up that I'm refusing to pay for the privilege of getting his autograph. On the other hand, I've met Chuck Norris and his wife. They are completely awesome and very nice people. Lau Ferrigno is cool as well. Met Erin Gray at a sci-fi convention and she's just a gem. Couple negative experiences with celebrities while living in LA, where you just get really used to seeing them. I left them alone, but occasionally had some interactions with a few that I didn't initiate. More good slash neutral experiences than bad, but I had a couple negative experiences experiences. Joe Pantaleon weirdly braggy to the group near me who he was holding forth with. People he didn't seem to know, and he kept bumping into my chair without even acknowledging I existed. Andy Dick had a weird encounter in a store where he tried to drag me into a debate about whether they should let him pay by check. He was complaining that they wouldn't honor his check, but it sounded like they were just following store policy, and he was trying to drag everyone nearby into the drama. Celebrities who were nice slash friendly. Ashton Kutcher, pre-movies and punked, nice guy. Told me there was a Linens and things in the valley. I didn't realize who he was when I started talking to him about where to get towels. And then I recognized him from that 70s show. Bernie Mac shared an elevator with him in a medical office building and we spoke. I was looking down at his giant shoes and then looked up and instantly recognized him. He was super friendly. Roblo, I had just a minimal interaction with him compared to the others, but he was friendly to me. Omar Rodriguez Lopez. I met him a long ago very briefly as he was coming out of a P.F. Chung's with another man, maybe his father or another family member, and this is what happened. Me being sometimes foolish in social encounters didn't know how to break the ice so when my mom and I got closer to him, I just called out and said, hey aren't you Omar Rodriguez Lopez? Which was the best I could come up with lol. Well, he didn't respond to me. He looked very annoyed that I was talking to him, and upon sensing and seeing that I just said, Oh well nice to meet you, and walked away towards the restaurant. As we departed Oma just rolled his eyes at me, and didn't say a word to me. So, I had met one of my musical role models and he pretty much just ignored me, and didn't even try to interact with me at all despite trying my best to tell him that I really loved his music that he's made over the years, solo and with his many projects, and that I hoped he would keep making music. That's all I wanted to say, but he'll never know that. I felt bad after the encounter initially, because I thought maybe he was having a bad day. Then I remembered that many people had described him as an arrogant prick who did a bunch of drugs when he was younger and thought that was better than a lot of other people. Possibly because he came from a wealthier family or so I heard. Anyways, I know multiple people who knew him back in the day and the various band members he played with in and around El Paso and other places and he's always been known as this pretentious as whole. Which is a shame because he's the only celebrity I have ever met that has treated me poorly.
I still love his music and will forever respect him as an artist of the highest order, but I'll never forget how he treated me. The kindest celebrity I have ever met was Zoe Deschanel and also her husband Jacob Pechenik who I didn't know at the time. I met them in Austin, TX at this awesome restaurant called Sway when I was doing a road trip across the south to California. I dined so low and the waitress just happened to seat me right next to them and I was oblivious to their fame the whole time I was there. I have always liked this encounter because they started talking to me and we just had a normal conversation that was unbridled in any way, plus I didn't know I was talking to celebrities until after they left when my server asked me if we knew each other or something haha. I feel like maybe I made their night in some way by us just treating each other like equals. I'll go into more detail of that encounter if anybody wants to know, but it's not terribly exciting haha. Steven Tyler from Aerosmith. Randomly sat next to him on a plane, SF to Las Vegas, and I managed to stay cool and calm, even though I was freaking the fuck out inside the whole time. The flight attendants were all fawning over him, giving him notes on napkins plus other random sheet, and people were lingering way too long in the aisles waiting for the restroom to peer over. Never been starstruck until that moment, but I remember feeling giddy, and like I was having a panic attack at the same time. I mean I've had posters of this guy on my wall since I was a kid, but didn't want to be that guy and fangirl in his face. Even more random, but I had literally listened to their 9 lives record front to back the day before, so I waited until we landed slash exited our aisle before turning to him to say, hey just wanted to say thank you. I've been a lifelong fan and 9 lives is still one of my favorite albums to this day. He was not cool about it and actually got pretty upset. Yeah man, I'm not who you think I am. Oh, but, huh, yeah, I'm not him. I'm not who you think I am, as he kinda huffed and was clearly irritated. I was dumbstruck, but left it at that. Maybe he thought I was gonna bug him for an autograph or picture, but I didn't want that. I think even if he just nodded or gave me a silent plus weak a smile I would cherish the moment until death, but now I'm just like, what the fuck Steven Tyler? When I moved to Los Angeles in the early 2000s I did a lot of catering work. During those years I met more celebrities than I can even count and I have stories for days about that time. Most of it is positive and I have developed a certain empathy for celebrities as their life is a constant barrage of random people approaching them expecting them to act a certain way. I had my fair share of bad encounters as well as the old saying goes, you can really tell a person's character based on how they treat the help. One that sticks out in particular was a time I worked as a bartender at a pool party at some bigwig producer's house in Malibu. There was a group of all the big comedians of the time like Eddie Murphy, Jay Leno, David Spade, Mike Myers and the like. And faking Tom Arnold. I guess Tom thought he needed to impress the others by berating the various staff that was working the party including myself. Honestly it was incredibly awkward as no one was laughing at his lame attempts to be funny, but he kept pushing and pushing getting nastier and nastier with us. I almost felt sorry for him as you could tell he was so desperate for the others to accept him, but it was all at our expense. It took a lot of restraint not to bust a wine bottle across his head. Robert Plant it was 2013 or 2014, and I was attending Tales of the Cocktail in New Orleans. At around 2, colon 30 a, I get a text from an old friend to come visit the bar she managed at. This friend is gorgeous, I'm married, and there was a lot of drinking going, so I grab a wingman to accompany me to the hotel bar where she was working, you know, to make sure I don't do anything really stupid. We jump out of the taxi in front of the hotel and there is an army of dudes in black shirts hanging out front. Being bust, we don't pay them any real mind and bound up the steps into the bar. We open the door, step in, and she swings around with this huge, beautiful smile. She runs around the bar, gives us huge hugs, and escorts us to a couple bar stools. Once back behind the stick, she pours us a couple shots of high west double rye, apologizes, and excuses herself to refill the wine glasses of the three other guests in the bar. We turn to follow her, and it's Robert Plant sitting four or five bar stools down, flanked by two gorgeously statuesque blondes who were probably a quarter of his age. Watching our interaction from the time we walked in, 
he gave us a wink, a knowing grin, and raised his glass in a toast. A night I'll truly never forget. I love Nala. I worked in entertainment, art and related fields for over 25 years in New York and Hollywood. I have met over 1000 such people. And when I say, met I mean interacted with, sat next to, drove, catered to, tuned their drums or guitars, poured drinks, gave them a shoulder to cry on, changed the battery in their cell phone, found the Thai restaurant that delivers vegan food, and or served in one way or another, and so forth. I casually met countless more. Been in their homes, watched their children while they rehearsed, carried their luggage inside in the rain when the porter wasn't available, etc. I have found that many of the people I thought would be as were generally very nice and that people I had high hopes for could be an as. I also met many of them again, and they weren't the same as the first time. In short, people are people and they have good days and bad days. We are all imperfect beings, so I tried to give everyone a pass and treat them like I would want to be treated. I never asked anyone for any favors or such, one time I did, okay, it was a very special circumstance and the guy was totally cool with it, and I knew he would be, because he asked me to come hang with the band and pound back a beer during the break, even though I told him I wasn't allowed to drink on the job. One extremely huge superstar, whose manager warned me would be a beach on heels and I should watch out, because we faked up, and she was going to be super nasty. Turned out she was extremely humble and understanding and very appreciative of the treatment I gave her. Okay, I'll name her, Madonna. Madonna got bad service from us, and was okay with it, and gave me a chance to fix it. My point is that not everything you read here is going to be a true representation of the person. Many of the ones I worked with were nothing like what I imagined. Okay, I've rambled enough to get downvoted into the lower realms, lol. TLDR. I'm not going to throw anyone under the bus. I'm sure a few of them thought I was a total ass. Sorry for the second hand story, but my sister runs a couple popular urban cabins in Big Bessie A we are talking about a few grand on really big weekends. Every now and then she'll show me influencers and celebrities usually from LA that'll have a few million followers on Instagram and expect everything for free. A couple months ago she had an actress from a show called Shameless. I'm not familiar with the show, but apparently she has a pretty big role, even if I knew the name I wouldn't say, because it could potentially hurt my sister's business. Anyway she tried to book for New Year's 3 days before the new year, which is insane. She won, expected my sister to cancel the person that had booked nearly a year, in advance like it was no problem and too, wanted the whole weekend calmed, because she would be posting it on her Instagram, and gave her the whole exposure spiel. She said if she could not get it completely free the most she could pay is half price, and charging her would mean she would not posting pictures of the cabin on Instagram. The cabins my sister runs are basically booked every week, so the whole exposure BS makes her laugh, but she's constantly dealing with these sorts of people. I used to work at a day spa, and one day Bethany Frankel came in, I had no idea who she was at the time, even though Rennie had been on for many years. She walked in on her phone and just sat down on the couch in the waiting area. I assumed she was waiting for someone or there to pick up a friend already getting a service since she made absolutely no acknowledgement that I existed. This couldn't possibly be a customer wanting to get a service. After a few minutes and still talking on the phone, she finally looked at me and impatiently pointed to her hand and mouthed the word manicure and went back to her phone call. Seeing as how I'm not a mind reader, I tried to get her attention without being rude and interrupting her call. I needed questions answered. Did she have an appointment for a manicure? Did she want an appointment? Which kind of manicure? We offered numerous levels of services. When was she looking for an appointment? We were completely booked for the day. Just as she got off the phone, and before I could ask any of my necessary questions, the owner of the spa walked in, recognized her and treated her like a queen. And her entitled A$ dollar sign dollar sign never once recognized that she treated the poor front desk girl, trying to do her job, like a peon, that was there to serve her. And then I got in trouble from my boss for making a celebrity wait. Even though I did not know she was a celebrity, we did not get many of those in Denver, and I never had a chance to discuss what she wanted. I was in Melbourne at a huge bar, and saw Joe Jilgen, 
Preacher, Misfits. I had just finished rewatching Misfits and couldn't help looking over a few times before I looked up a picture of him online and was able to match his tattoos. He was dressed in a neon green sweet suit ensemble. I didn't want to annoy him, but he was cracking jokes with his friends and seemed cool and quite funny. He left the bar and I just thought cool, I saw Joe Chilgan. Turns out he went to the next bar that I did as well. I couldn't stop looking at him like a faking freak. He and his crew ended up coming over to our table and I was sure I was going to get the piss taken out of me for annoying him by staring. I was pretty bust at the time and sure I looked like a freak just slack jawed staring at him. Turns out he was coming over to, respectfully, make a pass at me on his way out of the bar. He awkwardly said, can I be really bold and give you my number and handed me a paper coaster with his number on it. I still have it and it's still one of the coolest things ever that makes me blush. Sounds like some fan fiction BS and no one believed me until I showed them pictures and the coaster. Barry Bonds. About 8 year old went to my first major league baseball game with my little league team. Pirates were a world series contender for first time in decades and I knew their entire roster and statistics by heart. Used to even listen to the games on the radio every night before cable TV packages. Our team gets seated along the left field wall and we can see Bonds very clearly. Around 6th inning in between innings, a big wind comes and one of my teammates hats gets blown off his head and falls onto the field. Barry comes out for start of inning and sees the hat. Imagine 28 years losing our minds and Bonds about to make some lifelong fans. He picks up the hat and says jokingly did one of you guys drop this? Or something like that. We are all starstruck and going crazy. So he walks over acting like he was so delighted. Then he gives the most half hooted flip of his wrist and tosses the hat in between the fence and concrete fence area basically the gutter. All of our jaws just dropped and we were so confused. Then Bonds just shrugged his shoulders and with the most disrespectful tone said whoops, oh well and walked away. Would have made lifelong fans instead ruined a bunch of kids innocence. Hall of Fame boy caught is some karma though. Just to contribute to the thread, here is a positive story for you all. When I was 5 or so, my grandmother had gotten our family backstage passes to the Alabama band. The concert was outdoors and there was a big food tent set up where people with backstage passes could sit down to eat some cheap, but delicious, BBQ. My dad, being the big dude he is, didn't want to pass up this opportunity and ended up scoping out the spread in the tent right away. My dad was maybe gone 5 minutes until he hustled back all sweaty saying that Tony Stewart was in the tent eating. Now anyone that knows my dad knows he is a huge fan of racing. Tony Stewart at that time was getting pretty well known and I loved cheering him on with my dad. Anyway, my dad was super excited and picked me up to see if he could somehow get me an autograph. When we approached Tony, his bodyguard immediately tried to dismiss us, but Tony said no way and held me for a bit so my mom could snap a photo. We ended up seeing Tony again later that night when the concert started. Instead of just saying hi, he held a conversation with my parents and even held my older sister for most of the concert so she could see the show better since my dad was already holding me. I'll never forget how awesome he was, even when my dad interrupted his meal like an annoying fangirl. My dad, being a big guy with a big appetite, decided that he wanted to chill in the tent for a while and enjoy. I work in the comics industry and have met a bunch of famous folks at cons. Off the top of my head, Noel Fielding was lovely, hilarious, and kind. Joked around with everyone and paid as much attention to fans as he could. Cassandra Peterson, Elvira, is basically the goth Dolly Parton. I tabled close to her at a con and she brought me coffee and a cookie before we'd even said hello. She was incredibly gracious with her fans and treated the con staff like family. Chris Hemsworth slammed into me by accident in a green room and I almost had an orgasm. Not only is he the most attractive human I've ever seen, but he was beyond embarrassed. He said, I was being a dick and looking at my phone instead of where I was walking, my fault you okay? I think I made a thatched face and shrieked like a hyena, I can't remember. But he was equally kind to the con staff and made people feel very at ease, except me because I'm horny garbage. Jard Leto was disgusting. 
I was at the same party as he was, and I overheard him call a catering person a racial slur. He also grabbed two to three different girls as they were walking by, and then pretended like it wasn't him. His handler walked him out after one of the girls went to security. Unlikely to surprise anyone, but Rob Zombie was an immense chode. I was in a green room with him, his people, and the people I about to be on a panel with. One of the people on my panel asked me to sign her copy of my book. As I was signing, Rob Zombie says just wait until someone who isn't a friend asks for your autograph, then you'll know you've made it. I looked him right in the eyes and said, the devil's rejects sucked, Ellie Roth is a gutter pig. He aggressively hit on one of my friends to the point where they were scared to leave the party because they thought he'd follow. He grabbed their purse and dug through it, trying to find their hotel key. My friend is non-binary and Ellie kept turning to his buddy and saying you believe how hot she is? When my friend corrected him about their pronoun, Ellie said you've got big tigs, so you're a girl to me. I wished I cold set him on fire. Burt Ward, he's the 1966 to 1968 live action TV show Robin. I went to the Dallas Comic Convention in 2015 to see Stan Lee in person. This had always been a bucket list thing of mine to do as a kid, so I went for him specifically. However, I brought my brother-in-law with who is awesome and on the spectrum. He wanted to see Charles Martinet, voice of Mario, and a few other people. So we go walking around looking at all the booths and vendor stalls. We saw the one for Robin from the original Batman, so we thought cool, let's go talk to this guy. So we walk up say hello and immediately he says what do you want? HMM. Okay he's grumpy he's probably upset with the lines or a sheety fan I thought. But I had like an extra $60, so I thought maybe we could get a picture or something. No. This is whole. Proceeds to open a bag of popcorn and tell my brother-in-law to go away in a really condescending tone while he ate popcorn. Which upset my brother-in-law, but he took it like a champ and said fine I will I'll go talk to Batman and walks over to Kevin Conroy's booth, voice of Batman in 90's Batman cartoon. He walked down a booth or two and turned his back to us for a minute. While he does this, I turn back to Mr. Ward and said what the fuck is your problem? And he nods his head over to the four times zigzagging row of fans lined up to meet Adam West on the other side. Like I said before he literally wild up to this guy's booth, so he was super jealous and pissed. I turned back to him and said maybe if you weren't such an asshole to your fans who have actually seen the show you're in maybe you'd have people in your faking line. At this point my brother-in-law had walked back over and said he wanted to get some food and a drink, so we did that. Thankfully, when we walked back out of the food area we saw the Ecto-1 and Ernie Hudson in full Ghostbusters jumpsuit and proton pack, and he said hi and actually talked to us for a few minutes. He was there promoting the new Ghostbusters movie, so that and meeting Stanley and Charles Martinet was the best part of that trip, but let it be known Bert Ward is a gigantic as whole. Tennis player by Ankara Drescu, she's extremely entitled and rude, wasn't charged for services, made us stay 2 hours past closing, and tip the person serving her less than they would've actually made, if Bianca was charged for the services at a regular cost, and then proceeded to act like a complete diva, sorry emoji's not nearly famous enough or old enough to have that kind of entitlement even being famous doesn't excuse that. Oh and part of the agreement of not charging her was that she would post it on her social media accounts and it would be huge exposure for us. We tagged her online and she didn't even repost it as was agreed with her agent. Best part is we got no added business or followers from name dropping her in our story. Lesson learned. It was definitely not worth the hoops she made the person serving her jump through. However I met another famous Olympic athlete. Can't remember her name for the life of me, and she was so pleasant yeah I'd never know she'd competed in and won the Olympics. But I suppose maybe, if she was a pose, I would remembered her name lol. The difference between a person and a person can be astonishing. Edit for a few details and spelling. Reading this comment back, I sound like a complete shat. To clarify, I usually would go out of my way to give someone above and beyond excellent service and treat everyone equally without any expectations. It was her agent who kept name dropping and had really pushed us to book her for free because of the added benefits for us. I met the girl from Westworld. 
I worked at a gay bar in Raleigh, and I was the only girl that worked there, so it was a lot of fun haha <laughs> but that aside. She asked if I'd come smoke a cig with her, and we hung out, and talked for a few minimum then I went back to check it. Her family's from Raleigh, and it was the day before Christmas so like no one but her, and her crew of 5 people were there. Have picture proof. About 5 years ago, she had the pixie cut, and looked very plain Jane, and had a trench coat on. I had zero idea who she was, so I guess she thought that was cool. All the gay guy were freaking out that she asked me to come hang. Really cool chick. Still can't remember her name. Then Kid Rock was actually really cool to lol. Jeffree Star believe it or not was nice to me as well at 13. Vans warped to Charlotte, North Carolina, 2013 probably. Daddy E vanity and the tall skinny guy we th him were ducks, so my little brother saw them later about to walk to the back, and he hauled as, and stole his cooler's pirate hat off his head, and we all ran away. Still have it, and wear it to raves. Didn't meet Ronnie Raddick personally, but he waved at me, and winked while I was on shoulders of some dude. Not the best selection of famous people, but hey it's what I got haha. <laughs> When I was a kid, my grandfather took me to my first hockey game at MSG in the late 90s, when Gretzky had made his way to the Rangers. He knew a few of the security folks, and after the game we got to go backstage with the other VIPs for an autograph signing. After about 10 minutes of waiting, we get to a point where I can see him sitting on a chair signing and chatting with everyone as line slowly shrank towards him. I remember a little girl absolutely fawning over getting to meet him. She was so nervous she dropped the things she wanted him to autograph, then she stepped on them. For some reason, this set him off. Well that was really fucking stupid, wasn't it? He stood up, proclaimed he was out to here and left the girl absolutely destroyed to the point where she couldn't even cry. I can still recall this memory vividly, and I still get upset for her. He walked away, didn't come back to finish the signings. And a few other players I honestly don't remember the names of came out of the locker room to do some more signings a few moments later. I understand this isn't very characteristic of him, but it was the first time I was ever excited to meet a role model of any kind, and it's always stuck with me, and really made me not give a fuck about celebrities, athletes, etc. from that point forward. <laughs> Michael Owen, I'm not a football fan at all, and had no idea who he was. To me it looked like a bunch of guys standing in a pub chatting, and I wanted to get to the bar so gave them an excuse me chaps, and he piped up with I'm not signing fack all, so I replied confused sorry what? Have I missed something? So he explained that he'd done loads of signings already, and he just wanted a drink with his mates, which is fair enough, except I didn't want an autograph I wanted a pint. I explained that I didn't know who he was, so he was safe from me pestering him, which I expected he'd take in good jest, not at all. He started shouting at me to put your faking phone in your pocket, don't faking film me told him to calm down, and said I had my phone, to pay for my pint which had just landed on the bar, and he says well take your drink and fuck off then. The landlord of the pub happened to be behind the bar, and shouted over is this bloke bothering you? To which Michael Owen replies yes mate and the landlord says not you, him, is Michael Owen bothering you, which was the first time I found out who he was. I even still apologized to him, and said something like sorry mate, no idea who you are if I'm honest, just genuinely wanted to squeeze up to the bar, and get a drink as I slinked away, and he. Late to the party here, but may as well add my comment. In a flight attendant for a major airline, and I was working a relator London flight I want to say about 18 months ago. Anyway, I was working in coach and we were informed that Bianca and a back quote small entourage were traveling on the aircraft, some of them in first class and some of them in business. Obviously being in coach I didn't have much to do with them for the majority of the flight, but I knew that Bianca herself was being perfectly pleasant keeping herself to herself, but being polite and respectful. However her bodyguards were being the issue. They had expected to be upgraded into first class, as soon as they got on, they were all in business, and caused a massive issue, when a colleague asked them to switch their phone off. Apparently this one guy instead carried the conversation on with loudspeaker, and pretended he couldn't hear anyone. 
Luckily the onboard manager was a 30 year senior doesn't take any sheet kind of person and managed to tap the hang up button as he was holding the phone out in front of him. So straight away he's not a fan of us. Later on in the flight, we obviously split up to go on our break and part of my duty is to head on up into first to cover for the two crew members up there who are about to go on break. It's a red eye, so I creep through the cabin and reach the curtain separating business from first. There's a huge dude dressed all in black, arms crossed wearing sunglasses, in a dark cabin at night. He couldn't have looked more like a stereotypical bodyguard if he tried. I go up to him and was about to ask him if he needed anything but he started talking first, show me your ID. I genuinely thought he was joking, so I played along with it and used my fake laugh, reserved for passengers who think they're funny. I said something along the lines of if you need a drink, my colleagues are in the galley behind me, however I do just need to get past and into the next cabin. He just looked at me and said no one is getting past me until I verify who they are. I pieced together who this guy was and instead of causing a scene I decided to just go back into the business class galley, call forward to the guys in the first class galley and explain what was going on. Long story short we had to get the captain involved, I was witness to the conversation where he told the bodyguard that he was threatening the safety of this flight and that if he continued, he would have the police meet the aircraft in London and would ask for them to be arrested. The bodyguard responded by saying that he would take everything you own off of the captain. In the end we had to wake up Beyonce and ask her to stand her thug down before he started causing real issues. She was really apologetic and polite about the whole thing but it just struck a nerve with the whole crew. The captain had radioed ahead about what was happening and he requested police to meet the aircraft anyway. Once we arrived on stand, the door opened and we saw two police officers and about 15 people from my airline's management. Special VIP guest services, PR people, pilot management, flight attendant management, the works. The main offending bodyguard was taken to one side for questioning, but was allowed to carry on his way. He actually got held up at the border for a few hours and the entourage left without him. Anyone that had interaction with Bianca or the bodyguards were taken to one side and we were almost told off at how we handled it, that we cold caused a major PR issue for the company, and that we mustn't say anything to anyone about this. Left a sour taste in my mouth. On the upside I've carried Gordon Ramsay to Vegas, Len Goodman, from LA, David Cameron, to Aberdeen, Charlie Borman, who and McGregor, both to Nairobi, Sharon and Ozzy Osbourne, to LA, Mumford, and Sons, to Austin, and Harry Styles, to Las Vegas, and they've all been lovely. Beyonce has been my only negative celebrity experience in my time as a flight attendant. I went to the bar in the Soho Hotel in London with my friends for a drink after work a few years ago. There were not many places to sit, but we spied that one end of a long table in the corner was unoccupied and sat down. At the other end of the table were a couple of kids and an older lady who seemed out of place in the bar, but I didn't think much of it. After a few minutes, a guy asked to squeeze past, so I got up to let him through. I was deep in conversation and didn't look at the guy properly, but after he sat down my friend whispered that it was Kiefer Sutherland. I looked up and he was sitting at the table presumably with his kids and a nanny. He was the only one drinking. They sat quietly and he drank while I read something my friend had written on her laptop and we talked about it. Sometime later Kiefer sidled over and started asking questions about what we were doing etc. Point, and we got into quite a funny chat. Neither she nor I acknowledged that we recognized him. I think because I always imagined that not being treated normally must be annoying for famous people and tbh. If anything I would be more fanboys about Donald Sutherland personally. We ended up sharing a few rounds of cocktails and bantering for 2 or 3 hours. He was pretty drunk from the start, but by the end he was smashed and becoming more and more incoherent. As time went by, I think he really wanted us to notice who he was as he was dropping increasingly obvious hints. For example, he would say stuff like sorry, I didn't catch that. I hear a lot of gunshots in my line of work and it has damaged my hearing. It had become a kind of game though, to find ways to steer around his hints and we managed to get through the entire encounter without acknowledging his fame. At the end, we thanked him for the cocktails and a fun conversation and left. 
he was perfectly nice and quite a funny guy so maybe he doesn't fit the bill for being an ass, and I don't regret meeting him, but there was something sad about him being so pissed, and looking for acknowledgement from a pair of randers in a bar, while his kids sat quietly a few feet away. Han Abbey and Kyrie Irving. Through college I worked at a hotel in Newport, Rhode Island for a couple of years and the cast and crew of The Bachelorette stayed there during filming point I worked as a bellman in valet guy and was always assigned to help with these special projects. I was helping the crew load up their van with loads of luggage and filming equipment. Han Abbey popped out of the elevator with two suitcases and was clearly having a hard time with the suitcases as she was creating a scene. I jogged over and offered help with a smile and she just shouted, does it look like I need help, to that I just chuckled and moved along as the crew seemed completely unfazed. Now in regards to Kyrie, this was when he was with the Celtics as they actually would spend a week or so at our hotel ever summer, when they were training at Salvagina 99% of the players were all really cool guys, always chatted it up with me as I fit the description of a basketball player, and would be constantly transporting them to and from the hotel and downtown. Kyrie was never in sight. The only times we ever saw him, he was walking through the lobby talking extremely loud on FaceTime, as if nobody else was around. One night, he had asked the hotel restaurant to stay open later, so he could have a meal in peace. I was standing down the hallway, and heard some shouting from the restaurant. Turns out Kyrie had asked server 1 for a BLT without the B server 2 was a huge Celtics and basketball fan in general, so he ended up bringing Kyrie his dish. Server 1 didn't communicate to the kitchen to hold the B, so Server 2 brought out a complete BLT and Kyrie freaked out. I said no pork on my fork. If you ever have the chance to work at a Baoji Hotel Resort, do it. 139 point all the celebs I've met have been nice. My husband and I were dining at Bobby Flay's restaurant in Vegas in 2009 or so, when Chuck Little walked by. My, probably drunk. Husband shot up from the table and caught up to him and asked for a picture and Chuck was very friendly about it. He's way taller than he looks on TV. We were at a restaurant in Tampa about 2010 or 2011 when Hulk Hogan and his kids came in. A very drunk me went up to them just after they were seated so as not to interrupt their actual meal. Hulk seemed a bit irritated when I asked for an autograph, but after I told him it was for my 95-year-old grandfather who has been a huge wrestling fan since the days of Paul Bosch at the Sam Houston Coliseum and had been a fan of Hoggins for his entire career, his face lit up and he gladly signed an autograph and chatted for a bit about his wrestling experience in Houston. He said he was impressed that anyone had that much wrestling history knowledge. Since my grandpa was such a huge wrestling fan, I got tickets for a show at the summit. Joe Lestein bought the venue and turned it into a church in about the mid-90s. My grandpa was about 85 at the time, was two years into cancer remission and still really frail. The staff at the venue could tell that this rickety old man was going to struggle to get to his seat, so they pointed out a back way for handicap access. On the way down a corridor, we passed the wrestler Diesel. Kevin Nash, who seemed to think we were lost. I didn't have a camera or anything to sign, but he was very friendly and shook our hands. He's an absolute giant and was as sweet as can be. My grandpa told that story to anyone who would listen until the day he died. More wrestling. Not even sure how this keeps happening. Afra of the Wild Samoans has his WXW wrestling school just a few doors down from where my husband teaches a class. I didn't realize who it was until we were selling Girl Scout cookies door to door to the whole business complex. His entire family is a class act. Their wrestling school is a brotherhood and they take in a lot of at risk youth and give them drive and purpose. The kids all call his wife, who is lovely, mom. They do so much community outreach and are a positive force in our town. Awesome people. On my birthday in 99 or 00, I was driving to class one morning and Bon Jovi was doing a live broadcast from a radio station that I knew I passed the studio for on my way to school. Of course I stopped, late for class be damned. I waited outside for them to come out, and Richie Sambora was first. He was obviously drunk, at 8am, reeked of body odor and booze, but was the nicest guy ever, and way taller than I expected. I told him it was my birthday, and he crushed me in a huge hay. Happy birthday. Hug. 
Best birthday hug ever. I met Russell Westbrook in an elevator once. I remember it clearly. His agency in LA was in the same building as my work, so I walked into the elevator one day and was taken aback by the size of the other human being in there. I remember thinking to myself, Jesus, this man has a hole as honey baked ham for each shoulder. Plus, looks like he could palm my whole face. Who is this? Then it dawned on me. Russell Westbrook. I had 30 seconds left in this elevator with one of the greatest basketball players of our time, so I couldn't screw this up. Say something cool, I thought, sweating profusely. Then I opened my mouth. Hey. You're Russell Westbrook. I had screamed it. His eyes widened. Absorbing the essence of my awkwardness, he calmly said, Yo. You wanna take a selfie? Of course, I agreed. I had just bought the original Google Pixel, and he held it out and was like, sweet phone. I use that pic for my Christmas card that year. Russell Westbrook was so chill. I was so awkward. Also, my mom worked at a Hollywood costume house for most of my young life, so she had amazing stories about celebs. Two worst as holes? Lindsay Lohan and Mary A. Carey. Nicest. Tom Hanks and Andre 3000, apparently. Ellen McLean, best known for voicing GLaDOS in the Portal games. A few years ago I was doing sound work for a small independent film. It was my first day and I hadn't met the cast yet. I was busy trying to get familiar with their recording equipment, talking to the cinematographer and director. I hear a familiar voice and realize it's Ellen McLean. Living in Seattle you meet a lot of famous and semi-famous people, so I didn't bother approaching her or trying to initiate a conversation. The scenes we shot that day were all set in a really beautiful home in Lake Forest Park. It was quiet and out of the way, but I had seen a cat roaming the property which I mentioned to the director as a possible noise problem. About two hours into shooting Ellen had to take a line three times because the cat was loudly meowing. She screamed will someone shut up that faking cat, or I'm done with this. After that Ellen's sweet veneer was gone, and the rest of that day's shooting was miserable. I had warned the director about allowing the cat to roam around, and said it would lead to some retakes, but nobody listens to the audio crew, ever. I'm late but the opposite of an ass, Matthew Santoro. This was back in middle school slash freshman year, when I had been watching his videos for years. School trip to New York, and I was waiting in the immigration line at Newark. It's a long line, so I just look around, and a couple places behind me in the next line is Matthew Santoro. Unmistakable. I freaked out. I pass through immigration and I wait for him to- When he comes out I just ask back quote hey I'm sorry to bother you are you Matthew Santoro? And he smiles, and says he is. We end up chatting all the way to baggage claim about his videos, both being Canadian, just random stuff, absolute class act. Apparently he was there for playlist live that year, and when we had to part ways he asked if I wanted a picture, and said if I was ever at an event he was at to look for him to finish our conversation. So many years ago, but 9th grade me definitely met my hero that day. Funny story actually, 2 years later I was at VidCon, and I saw him in my hotel lobby. I went up to him and asked if he remembered me from Newark. He lit up and said hey it's my name. And we chatted more throughout that weekend. What a guy. Still watch his videos to this day. Commented this earlier on someone else's post on Michael Ivan. It needs its own spotlight. I used to work at Lifetime Fitness in Plano. Once, when I wasn't working, I went for a workout, played basketball and walked into the locker room. Guess who's there late at night, walking around but naked? Yep, Mike. I will admit, he was in great shape. He was literally talking to himself, damn, good sheet Mike, good sheet. I was like what the fuck, that's Michael Ivan. Naked? I didn't say anything to him, was already kinda awkward. I just let him be. I think he was referring to his workout? I don't know. There were a few other guys in the locker room. We all were silent and avoiding eye contact lol. He played a couple pickup games of basketball with us too. He's not bad. Bit of a bull hog though. What surprised me was when I heard he actually owns his own born company. I found out years after meeting him then. 
through an interview on it I saw with a well-known Bourne star from Texas. I think she's from Texas. Basically, she was playing college softball at the time and accidentally rear-ended a luxury car driven by Michael Ivan of all people. He was pissed and demanded her insurance info. He asked if she knew who he was and she didn't, which I think pissed him off even more. However, once she got out of the car all anxious, and he saw her from the waist down, she said he changed his tune and offered her a gig in adult modeling. He ended up signing her up for some hardcore flicks later, and that's literally how Julie Cash got into Born. Hey interview is still up in it where she talks about it if you're curious. Worst experience, I managed a clothing store in a college town that got a lot of top concerts, so met some celebrities wandering in. Dave Matthews, Mary J. Blige, Darlow Zoriadon, R.I.P., and Martina McBride come to mind. Mary J. Blige came in with two very large bodyguards, and as I'm not an R&B fan, I had no idea who she was. This was around 1995 or so. She was a total beach, ignored everyone. She went to the fitting rooms and her bodyguards blockaded the entrance and would not let anyone in besides her. I kicked them out of the store and she came out to no bodyguards. She ended up buying like 20 pair of dollar sign 10 15 sunglasses before she left. Best, Dalos O'Riordan. She came in looking for vintage levy and a woman I worked with had a bunch of used levy she no longer fit in, so she went home and brought them back. Dalos was super sweet while she waited, with the only downside being her very very thick accent that was hard to understand at times. She gave my cowalker backstage passes to the concert. Dave Matthews was just some random dude I saw until someone asked me if I knew who it was. Looked like a typical college student. Lance Armstrong. So we had a festival concert for him here in Austin for like his third Tour de France victory, and I was a little kid at the time. I was waiting by the back VIP entrance trying to get a peek at him, and this lady asked me if I wanted to see him. I replied yes excitedly, and she slipped a VIP pass over my head. Well my first reaction was let's go get dad, because this was my dad's absolute hero. I mean we watched every Tour de France race like it was air to breath. And my dad was slash is an avid cyclist. Well we finally found him backstage drinking a Michelob Ultra, who he was sponsored by, and my dad asked for an autograph so excited and starstruck. When I saw how Lance acted towards my dad my fake heart sank. There's my dad telling him how him and his son watch every race and root for him, and Lance is looking like an absolute dick signing a shirt, and nodding like he doesn't give a sheet. At that moment without my dad even understanding, because he's so excited and happy, I as a 10 year old kid understood the term don't ever meet your idols. It was sad, and I felt bad for my dad, because he didn't even see what I saw. Anyways come to find out later he's jacked up on steroids lying to everyone. So in hindsight, makes sense he was a narcissistic dick on roids, I'm sure it all went to his head fact Lance Armstrong not only cheated and tricked us into being your biggest fan, but when we met you still, were a dick, as if you weren't cheating to get into your position. Hoping to see him go bankrupt or something soon. I was a barista for a couple years in the international terminal of the airport, and met several celebrities. Zooey Deschanel was pretty underwhelming. I didn't let on that I knew who she was, and she had a weird vibe like she kind of expected me to, especially after paying when I saw her name on her credit card. She hardly said 10 words, ordered something very cheap like an Americano, and didn't tip. Jay Moore was a bit of a dick. I handed back his change, something like $0.15, which he tossed in the tip jar. I looked at him and deadpanned thanks. He laughed, said I know, right? and walked away. One time an NBA team came through at around 10pm, shortly before close when there were only two of us working, and they all ordered milkshakes. At least $600 worth, made by two ass hauling people in about 15 meters, maybe $10 in tips. Hallie Joel Osmond came through several times, and was always really nice and down to earth. Never once acted like he's famous. Norman Riedus was also nice but reserved, probably because most of my coworkers were losing their damn minds, and it was like 7am. Edit, I also used to have a job cleaning houses, but I can't get specific without revealing too much personally. There were hugely famous Marvel comic artists, 
celebrity chefs and restaurateurs, and a few artists and musicians. Suffice it to say, if you think meeting celebrities can be disillusioning, imagine cleaning their houses. This will get buried, but I was a road comic, and worked with a lot of B-list, C-list folk, Bobcat Goldthwaite, insanely nice guy. If you only know him as the loud guy from the Police Academy movies, check out the film he wrote slash directed World's Greatest Dad. I did stand up and opened for him, he was honestly touched that I knew his film work and wanted to talk about it. Victoria Jackson from 80s SNL, really sweet but not the smartest, and is a Christian conservative. I opened for her and did a joke about people selectively interpreting the Bible, her audience turned on me a little, they knew her from her Fox News appearances, so they were the easily triggered type of folk, when she got up there she stuck up for me, pointed out that they were wrong to boo, and that I was, had made a good point. I worked with her the week Phil Hartman was killed, and she took it hard. Dave Cowlier, Uncle Joe I from Full House, great guy, really thoughtful. When he found out the club was charging people for special VIP tickets to do a meet and greet he was like fuck that. And he went out into the lobby to meet the regular audience too. One thing I remember from hanging out, he talked about how creepy it was when he would meet a beautiful woman who was into him and at some point in the night she would be like I grew up watching you as a little girl and I had the biggest crush. Pauly Shaw, trash, edit, cause it deserves a little more, in his heyday, he had a heyday, people from his entourage, would go into the audience at the end of the show, find hot women, and ask do you want to meet Pauly, you'll have to blow him, naturally most of the women would be like fuck you, and the guys would be very polite oh, sorry, didn't mean to offend you, have a good night. They didn't have to try to talk anyone into it, because just by asking it directly like that they would still find so many willing women there would be a line outside his tour bus, each one thought she would wow him so much he'd take notice. One club owner I know, said she would never book him again, because she was tired of dealing with the sobbing women in her parking lot screaming take me with you poorly, as the bus pulled away. Famous people have a weird faking allure for some folks. Dave Attle, seemed nice kept to himself. He had stopped drinking when I worked with him so between shows he was just sat backstage with a notebook working on new material. Dustin Diamond Screech, an ass, but one I felt sorry for. He was so emotionally fragile and insecure, and a huge cokehead. His girlfriend was Lady Macbeth, making demands, threatening that they would walk if the club didn't do this or that, generally a prima donna. I say I feel sorry for him because we talked a bit and I realized that for most of his life people treated him like a walking, talking muppet. Can't imagine how much that must have warped him. Ron White, blue collar comedy tour, what you see is what you get, just a solid, straightforward guy. And the only person I ever met who could pass a frisbee while also smoking and holding a drink. Sinbad, mix of arrogant and incredibly nice. You got the impression he thought he was a little above everyone else, but at the same time he took care of everyone, personally gave all the employees an extra tip at the end of the weekend to thank them for their hard work. Years after I left comedy I worked at a restaurant in Dayton, Ohio and Dave Chappelle was a regular, quiet, always seemed a little awkward not rude at all or demanding, just aloof, but seems like it's more in a shy way than a rude way, got everything for free and never tipped. One night he came in after hours with Cat Williams. Cat Williams was great. Every time they would bring him a drink he was oh, this is good. Did you make this? Then peel off $100 bill for you. 